Top Elf by Caleb Zane Huet. Chapter 1 Negative 29 degrees Fahrenheit is the best temperature in the world. I know this for a fact because negative 29 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature on the most perfect day in the world, Christmas, at the most perfect place in the world, the North Pole. That's where I live, at 11 Piper's Pipping Drive. It's also where I work, in the games and puzzle department of the workshop. And it's where I eat my dad's homemade ice cream sundaes. He's an ice cream designer, so I try a lot of experimental flavors. Say yes to pine nut, no to pine soul, and probably don't try pinning for a lost love. It tastes like chocolate, but also like tissues. I've got brown hair and a little red and blue eyes with a little bit of green, so my parents say I've always had a little bit of Christmas in me. My skin would maybe be as white as snow if I didn't have so many freckles. Oh, and I'm an elf. Elves comes in different shapes and sizes and colors because elves come from everywhere. Yes, we're a little shorter than humans. Okay, about two feet shorter. Fine. Why are you so worried about how tall I am? But we're just as good at most things and better at some. The only reason we seem like we can't get things off the shelves is because human beings build their shelves too high. We can get everything off to the shelves we make, and you don't see us bumping our heads against the ceiling all the time. Most people don't know this, but Christmas really starts on July 2nd, the middlest day of the year. On that day, the current Santa Claus gives a speech to all the elves and clauses living at the North Pole. Before the speech, everyone spends their time inventing and planning. Santa Claus designs new suits and sleighs, maps out new Christmas routes to make sure he gets all of the new babies, and updates our naughty slash night database. Mrs. Claus does the business planning and keeps the whole town running by doing maintenance and repairs on the wish generator. The elves, okay, I'm just going to say this out of the way. Some elves are dentists. Of course they are. Everybody plays means a dentist. At the North Pole, that job, like the most jobs, fall to us. We cook all the food. We build all the houses. We even test all the video games. It's work, really. The only humans that even know about the North Pole are members of the Claus family. I have lived here since I was born. Like most elves from around here, I learned Maponotics, Theology, List Literature, and Santa Studies in the workshop from an early age. This year, when I turned 11, I started working in Games and Puzzles, or GP as we like to call it. I'm still learning very day, but it's about the things I want to learn about, like how much the glitter makes a fairy doll's wings sparkle just right two handfuls and then a third handful to put on your own hair. At GP, I spend the first half of the year coming up with ideas and submitting them for approval. The only reason you don't have a catapult that launches sprinkles is because the health council said we got grumpy letters from parents, even though I told them that was exactly the point. At July 2nd, I work with my friends in the department to build our best ideas in time for delivery on Christmas. On this particular July 2nd, as we waited for Santa's first big speech to begin, everything seemed normal. Everyone at the North Pole crammed into the Peppermint Square just like they did. Claus Castle's balcony was decorated with its usual bright colored flags and a candy strip carpet just for the occasion. There was only one big difference this year. Santa was late. I was pretty sure this was a huge problem. Santa's never late. I panicked to my best friend Celia. Something's wrong. You're just being paranoid, Celia told me. This isn't Christmas Day, Ollie. He's still about to be late. Celia's the best inventor at GP, even though she's my age. 
One time we were stuck in a house with nothing but a pad of paper and a pencil, and in just two hours, she came up with five different board game ideas that got made into presents that year. There was Ditto, where you could sat in a circle with your friends and yelled words at each other until two people yelled the same word and won. There was M4Z3M3NT, where somebody played as a computer that tried to trap players in an endless puzzle maze. This was Cecilia's favorite because she never lost. My own favorite was For Goodness Sake, which had to team up with your friends on a quest around the board doing good deeds until a unicorn in the center of the board decided you were worthy and opened its mouth to blow confetti all over you. While Celia was coming up with all these games, I drew a really great picture of a reindeer on a surfboard wearing sunglasses that ended up on my mom's fridge, so I don't think I did too bad myself. Celia was usually on top of any game, but this wasn't any game. This was serious Christmas business. What if Santa fell asleep at the computer and switched all the naughty and nice kids? I asked her. What if his beard got stuck in the door? What if every nice kid is on the naughty list and his beard is stuck on the door. Sia looked at me like a noggin full of eggnog. Maybe he overslept. She reached up and adjusted her safety goggles, which was often holding her big cloud of curly black hair away from her brown forehead. You always get nervous about the first speech. I'm only nervous because I love Christmas so much. How can you not be nervous? Because it's my job. Christmas always happens the same way every year. She yelled so I could hear her over everyone talking at once. There's nothing wrong or worry about. It'll be just like this always. I tried to believe her and bounced on my toes while I stared at the balcony. It was hard, the believing part. I'm one of the top three bouncers of all the time. Easy. Saying Christmas is always the same is like saying chocolate tastes the same way every time, I protested. Or that puppies are always cute. Or that rocket ships are always awesome. Or that dinosaurs are always a little bit too scary for me. All those things are true, Celia pointed out. Yeah, but it doesn't make them less perfect. I crossed my arms and looked down, my nose at her. Well, she's a little taller than me, so I looked up, my nose at her. She poked my nose with her finger, and I sneezed. Bless you, an old wealth woman yelled over the noise, I said thanks, and went on. You know how exciting it is. You've been seeing it in your whole life. We're gonna get more letters from kids. We're gonna get to sing carols. And we're gonna be busy all the time. I know you love making stuff too. Celia grinned. I do love making stuff. I pointed to the balcony. Look! I felt like I was about to blow into a million pieces of confetti, and then all those pieces were flying into the wind and spelled out, I love Santa. You know, that first second of warmth right after your body has been cold for head to toe? Seeing Santa feels like that. He feels better than a rock star, better than getting out of school early, and the best part was that I got to see him like this every year. Two elves in formal clothes, reds, greens, little bells on the end of their shoes and hats, marched out in the balcony of Claus Castle and played trumpets to signal the arrival of Clausus. I love this part of the tradition, when we got to see our whole family waving to us from the castle, starting with the children and ending with Mrs. Claus and Santa. Claus came first. He was fourteen, the oldest of the Claus's four children. We all knew he would inherit the title of Santa one day. He always dressed in red and white suits to make sure we never forgot. He seemed always harsh when you first met him and didn't take much time for fun because he was busy working as hard as he could, although in case his work involved making demands, not toys. A lot of people said he walked around like he was wearing peppermint underpants. And then there was his name, which even ordinary and nice people laugh at. I mean, Claus Claus. He never had a hair out of place or a wrinkle in his suits, though, which I found very impressive. Sally Claus was next in line. She was a year younger than Claus and walked on to the balcony castle without looking up from her book. Will you marry me? 
An introduction to cheer theory. I knew Sally a little better than I knew the other kids, or the kids, because she was always making and sneaking over to GNP to tinker with toys and grapple with gift wrap. Klaus didn't like to get his hands literally, but Sally wasn't afraid to have a little tinsel under her fingernails. She always wore really big, goofy glasses, even though she probably didn't have to. Kurt, the third of the clauses, was a year younger than Sally, only a year older than me, and you could always recognize him because he always had the end of a candy cane dangling off his mouth. He wore a leather jacket on top of his two or three regular ones, it was super cold, and snowboarded everywhere he could, including now, onto the castle stage. We couldn't help but laugh at the entrance, and he acknowledged our laughter with a tiny bow. Almost everything he did was a joke, although I wasn't sure that Santa and Mrs. Claus found him as funny as I did. Our Claus, as Kurt, strutted into place, cool as an ice sculpture, Claus's glare was up to the headmaster standards. If being a Claus was a career for Claus, it was the most extra of extracurricular activities for Kurt. Most of the older elves had nicknamed him the Escape Claus. Bertrand was the youngest of all the Clauses, two years younger than me. He had a tendency to get lost in snowdrifts and to sneeze in the worst possible times, like when he was wrapping kids' presents, which could make unwrapping them really messy, but he had a great attitude and an awesome brain he usually stayed happy, even when his big brothers were picking on him, and was good at finding clever ways around problems. I once saw him make shoes with retraceable platforms that extended so he could reach a cookie jar on the top shelf. Plus, he always wore little butterscotch bow ties, so I couldn't help him but like him. After the Claus kids were assembled on the castle balcony, they split into pairs. Claus had to guide Sally to her spot, since she refused to look up from her book until the chapter was completed. Kurt kept stealing Bertrand's hat and holding it too high for him to reach, but Bertrand was laughing and having fun jumping for it. Not long after they found their places on either side of the balcony, Santa and Mrs. Claus came out to a louder blare of trumpets. Mrs. Claus was thin and covered in suit. She had just come from the working in the wish generator and hadn't even changed at her yellow jumpsuit. Her hair was tied back in netting to keep it from falling everywhere, but she smiled really big, like she didn't even notice she was dirty. She always seemed more at home that way. Santa just looked like everyone I think he does. Big white beard, long white hair, huge red suits, and white trim. The hat resting on his head was sleepy and perfect tilted just so. His cheeks were cheery and red, his smile was wide, and you could feel his jolly all the way across Peppermint Square. Ho ho ho! A microphone and one of Santa's buttons boomed across the square. All the elves went dead silent, waiting for what to come next. Merry Christmas! The whole square rubbed into cheers and applause. Celia and I started chanting, Santa! 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 And soon, the whole crowd was chanting too. Santa made a motion with his hands to bring the volume down, and everyone got quiet again. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I know you're excited for this year. I've got a little feeling this is going to be the best Christmas ever. We all cheered again. He said this very year, and it never stopped being true. But today, I've got a special announcement. His face changed to something more serious and Mrs. Claus patted him on the back, still smiling. The children looked surprised. They were glancing at each other and shrugging. Sally even looked up from her book. I wonder what this is about, Celia whispered to me, scrunching up her eyebrows and frowning. Maybe you're right about to be nervous. That was not what I was going to hear. My heart started to beat louder than reindeer hooves and metal rod. I don't want to be right, I told her. I looked forward again, and couldn't believe my eyes. There was a faint hiss, and the front of Santa's suit split open from the side, swinging around until it was two half-suits holding hands with each other. 
Inside was a mess of wires, blinking lights, toys sticking out of the pockets, and a skinny man in a red and white pinstripe suit. I had never seen Santa out of the Santa suit before. Based on the gasps of the elves around me, they hadn't either. Without his big red suit on, he didn't look nearly as jolly. Underneath was a business suit, all crisp lines and sharp angles. His puffy cheeks and gentle smile looked out of place on top of the thin body, making him quick, nervous gestures. Celia looked at me with wide eyes, and I returned them with a look on even wider mouth. Santa reached around and popped the microphone button off the front of the big red suit. He held it up to his mouth.、Uh, is this working? The speakers made a loud screeching noise, and everyone cringed and covered their ears. He shifted the way he was holding it, and the noise went away.、Uh, how about now? Is that better? Some of the elves in the front row gave a thumbs up. Well, as you all know, this is my twentieth Christmas as Santa. Some of the adult elves around mumbled about how surprised they were. It had been long. Adults were always surprised that they're old, and the older they are, the more surprised they seem to get. Before that, it was my father before me, and his father before him, all the way back to the original Kris Kringle Claus, who gave us this. From his pocket, he pulled out a glowing blue snow globe without a base, or at least I thought it was a snow globe. The gasps were even louder this time. That's the quantum Kringle, Celia whispered to me. The engine for a sleigh. She handed me her binocular so I could see a closer look. It was a spear, just like a snow globe, but the snow inside was swirling on its own in the shape of a beautiful white galaxy. Even far away, through the binoculars, I almost felt like I could fall into it. It was so beautiful, so big, but held safety. In something so tiny. I don't know. It was really real. I whispered. No one but the Santas had ever seen it, as far as I knew. Not even his family knew he where he kept it on the 364 days that were in Christmas. It was the North Pole's most guarded secret. Hubbub and shock rippled through the crowd, and suddenly, serious Santa went on with a super surprised speech. With this magical device. My ancestors have delivered presents to children all around the world. It can push a sleigh faster than any other engine ever intended, and to this day, we don't know how to make another one. It's a lot of power for one person to hold. Santa juggled it back and forth in his hands. One hand slipped, and he made a face as it fell toward the ground. Then he caught it smoothly and grinned at us. It was a joke. Celia laughed, nervous. I was having palpitations. I wasn't sure how much of this my elf-sized heart could take. Why is he showing this to us? I asked Celia. Celia shrugged.、Well, I don't know, but it's got to be a good reason. Santa continued. My wife and I have decided that keeping this power in our family is unfair to you, unfair to the world, and unfair to Christmas. The crowd's mumbling grew louder. The Claus children continued to seem as surprised as the rest of us, and Claus looked especially distressed. So this year, we will have a competition. You are all invited to participate. The winner will be trained personally by me, and will inherit the Kringle when I retire. What? I didn't mean to say it out loud, and clapped my hand over my mouth right after saying it. The crowd had suddenly gone very quiet. So my one word traveled pretty far. I saw some people shake their heads in amazement. Claus was angry. He ran back inside the castle, shoving one of the trumpet elves away. Kurt had the opposite direction, laughing out loud as if this was suddenly the best day of his life. Sally looked terrified, but Tran was hard to read because I could only see his eyebrows over the banister. Mrs. Claus gathered the three remaining Claus children together. To listen until the end, Santa, meanwhile, smiled down at us. It was his delivering presents face, so it was like he was delivering us a present. I wasn't sure it was a present. Could anyone be Santa? It seemed crazy, but Santa was saying it, and he didn't look crazy. He looked calm, 
like he had thought for us for a while. I wasn't sure what to think, but I trusted him. Sign up will be allowed and assigned in the workshop, he announced. Any elf or member of the Claus family may enter from anywhere in the world. Those brave enough will undergo a series of rigorous, dangerous, and 100% Christmassy challenges until we narrow down a single winner to inherit the Quantum Quingle. He raised it above his head again with a flourish. You must be 16 years or younger to enter. Terms and conditions may apply. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Santa turned to walk away and his suit closed and walked itself inside of him. After a moment, his family shoveled in too. The moment Santa was out of sight, all the elves were bonkers. Nobody, I mean nobody, could believe it. What next? Is he going to move Christmas to February? One elf grumped. I'm not good at tests, another cried. This is so unfair. I'll bet it's rigged so his kid will win, a third elf complained. How's an elf supposed to fight in a sleigh? They could make another sleigh, an elf-sized one, Celia said to her. The elf scoffed. But then, where would you put all the presents? I pulled Celia away before she could get into a fight about how Santa's bag worked. Elves were shouting for answers. A dozen elves climbed into each other's shoulders to try to reach the balcony. The chorus of old elves were sang after the July 2nd speech started yelling carols, nervous and off-key. Someone bumped the elf handling the fireworks, so they started to go off in the shape of snowmen and tree angels too close above the ground. Some hats were set on fire and quickly put out of snowballs. As a crowd started pushing out of the square, Celia and I had to grab hands to stay together. Why is this happening now? I yelled to her over the noise of the crowd. She kept her eyes forward, dodging through the green and red sea, pulling me along. I don't know, she yelled back. The sound of bells jingling on toes and hats were deafening. Let's get back in the workshop, I agreed. I thought that going back to the workshop would bring back at least a little piece of normal. Instead, I found the world had gone all topsy-turvy there too. Chapter 2 The workshop towers above the North Pole even more than the Claus Castle. The older elves tell stories their parents told them about when the workshop was just one little building where a few elves and Santa worked together to make presents for the few nice children who knew to ask for them. That's hard to imagine now, though, because it's become the heart of all elven life. There are toy factories, sure, but there are also basketball courts and restaurants and cobblers. If you need a quick eggnog to get you through the day, you go to nog your head in the workshop. If you need a place to hold a meeting to discuss the extra paper needed to review some 900-page fantasy novels for kids who read them, you reserve a conference room in the workshop. And if you're not sure about the instructions you've written on how to assemble a smelligator, a toy that's half alligator and half trash can, you go to the instructionarium so the proof elves can make sure you have the right steps in the right order. Really. Anything you can ever seed, you can do at the workshop. Most adult elves live in the apartments there too. As Celia and I got closer to the workshop, we saw a crowd forming at its front. What are all these people doing? I asked. Celia lifted her binoculars and reported. Look, it looks like they are already put up the sign sheet for Santa Contest. Klaus, Sally, and Bertrand have already signed it, along with a couple of elves. Who? I asked. Celia shook her head. You're not gonna like it. Tell me, I insisted. Buzz, for once. I grimaced. Buzz was the only elf in the whole North Pole I didn't like. He was bigger than everybody and thought he could do whatever he wanted, and mostly what he wanted to do was pick on everyone else. When he felt like working at all, the toys he assigned were too dangerous. Last Christmas, we caught him sneaking a bunch of swords into presents for little babies. Luckily, we found them all. 
if he being Santa, we'd all be in trouble. Well, other than Buzz, it looks like Gadzooks, the triblets, and some out outlaw owners who must have already called in, Celia continued. No, Kurt, though, I wouldn't be surprised if he skips it. I got distracted by a crowd of snow spraying up the hill nearby. I think that's him. Let's go, Sec. I tugged Celia along behind me. Kurt didn't show down as he approached the crowd, so they parted to let him slide in the snowboards. He shifted his weight again for a hard stop, spraying snow all over the elves in the crowd. The board unclipped from his feet on his own, and he flicked a piece of candy cane from his mouth and crunched it into powder with his toe. Then he pulled another candy cane from a small box, folded into his sleeve, stuck it into his mouth, and held out his hand to one of the elves nearby. The elf, a little girl with black hair twisted into braids, placed a pen in his palm. He winked at her, then whipped around the sign and signed Kurt on the sheet and added a little skull with two candy canes across beneath it. He tossed the pen back to the girl, who stared at it with wide eyes. Excuse me, Kurt! Kurt Claus! An adult elf was long, wavy hair, and a microphone came up to him, a camera woman from NPNN close behind. I'm Maria Duendi, North Pole News Report. I mean, network. You've stated on several occasions, quote, Who would even want to be Santa anyway? What a dumb job. As if I ever wanted it, not in a million years. What's made you change your mind? Kurt snorted and moved the candy stick to the other side of his mouth. I don't want Claus to win. Duh. He jumped up into the air and slammed both feet down the snowboard, where they clicked into place. A vibrating sound rose from the board. Suddenly, two little rocket jets turned on, whooshing him back up the hill. We were all covered in snow he left behind. But I didn't mind. Kurt is so cool. You heard it here, folks. Maria Duende came to this camera. The Claus family rivalries have already begun. Celia rolled his eyes. She was not the biggest Maria Duende fan. I knew this because Cecilia's game, avoid the reporter whatever you do, no, seriously, she's the worst, was one of our top sellers, especially within the Duende family. Can you believe that? Celia said to me now. What a jerk. Maria Duende? No, Kurt. Well, I don't know, I said. I think it's kind of funny. Celia looked at me like I had four arms, so I added, What? I do? She shrugged and started walking toward one of the workshop's side entrance. I jogged to catch up to her and asked, Don't you want to try out? Of course I don't. I like working in GNP. She replied, holding the door open so we could both slip inside. I punched a button to call an elevator. Celia continued, And I don't want to compete with anybody. Did you see how all those helves were coming and climbing over each other to sign their names after Kurtz? This is going to be a total pylon, and I don't want to be there when the pylon topples over and everyone gets bruised. The elevator opened. We climbed in and hit three buttons so the elevator would know how far up, sideways, and forward to go. The elevator dinned, and the door started to close, until a bright piece of metal was shoved between them. The elevator dinged again, and the doors opened back up. Hey, pipe squeaks! A huge elf, bigger than me and Celia combined, pulling his enormous axe behind between the doors and propped it up his shoulders. Axes aren't allowed in the workshop, Buzz. Celia held out her hand to stop from entering. She opened a sign in the hallway. It was a picture of an axe and a red X over it that said, No weapons. It's not an axe. It's a toy. The edge of the blade was so sharp, I could feel it from a feet away. A toy, Celia challenged. For what kind of kid? A cool one. Buzz ignored Celia and walked in pushing past her without even acknowledging she was in the way. He ran his hand all through the buttons, lighting them up a bit. I groaned, then I leaned my head back at the ceiling. At the ceiling. Come on! Woofs! 
Buzz was smiling, but it was a rude smile. A mean one. Let's just get the nice elevator, Celia told me. We tried to move around, Buzz, but he blocked the door. Seriously? Celia said. Buzz, just let us let you what? He said in a perfectly innocent voice. I'm not going to do anything. Get out of the way. I tried to push him, but he's too strong. He didn't budge even little. All of you sign up for Santa trials, he said. That surprised me. Why? I asked. We didn't want to be Santa. Even as I said it, I wasn't sure it was true. Well, I don't care any of you, Dolly. But I'm afraid and tired of everyone acting like Celia's the best thing since cookies and milk. I want a chance to show them who's really number one. Celia raised an eyebrow. That doesn't sound like my problem, Buzz shrugged. Then I guess we'll stay in this elevator forever. Celia clenched her teeth and blew air out of her nose. Fine, she spat the word, and then moved with such purpose that even Buzz shifted off her way. We'll see in the competition, Buzz. He started to follow us, but she snapped her head around to glare at him, and he froze in place. Have fun in the elevator. The elevator dinged and closed. We could hear the quiet rumble as it started moving. Are you really going to sign up? I asked. No, I just want him to leave us alone. She pushed the button to call another elevator. I frowned. If this Santa test had anything to do with brute strength and brute thinking, then Buzz actually had a chance of winning. And if Buzz became Santa, I'd had to do something really drastic, like move to Florida. Have you ever tried to build a decent snowman in Florida? Which meant I had to get Cecilia to join the competition. If anyone could wrangle the crinkle out of Buzz's hands, it was her. I think you can do it, I told her. I think we could at least make sure Buzz doesn't win. He's not going to win. She said this like Buzz had as much of a chance as a snowman without making it a whole day in Florida. I was very worried about this. You don't know, no, you don't know that, I argued. We have no idea what the test is like. What if it's axe battles? It's not axe battles. But what if it is? Then we'd lose anyway. I crossed my arms and shook my head. Celia was my best friend, but she could be so frustrating sometimes. I knew I couldn't change her mind. But I could feel my own mind changing. Did I want to stop Buzz? Yes. Did I think I could? No. What if it was a really big snowman? No. Even if it survives the Florida heat, an alligator would probably eat it. Stop being so worried about this. Did I want to be Santa? No. Or maybe? Maybe sort of yes? Mostly maybe with a strong hint of yes? Sure, me, but consider this. How about definitely yes? Alright, yes it is. I had some stupid decisions in life. I tasted my dad's booger flavored ice cream and stuck my tongue to the North Pole, the actual hole, in the center of town. I'd even tried once to be friends with that huge jerk, Buzz. But more than those, this could have been my stupidest decision ever. And yet, I found myself saying to Cecilia, You don't have to sign up, but I'm gonna. Without looking back, I walked all the way around the building to the front, where a crowd around the sign sheet had thinned significantly. I pulled a pen out of my pocket and added my name to the bottom of the list. Oli Gnome. Another pen slipped around me and signed out her name in tight cursive. Celia Pixie. I turned around and grinned at her. She narrowed her eyes at me. I just want to make sure Buzz doesn't kill you in the axe battle, she said. I hugged her all the way around my arms. I knew you would, I squeezed. She laughed. Or maybe I can kill you with an axe battle. I laughed too, but I couldn't shake a little nervous warm in my brain. What if it is an axe battles? What if it's way worse? Chapter 3 over the next month, I could feel the whole town waiting for Santa to announce the first challenge. Members of the extended Claus family 
flew in from all over the country to enter the competition and were all living together in the workshop's Ho Hotel. I'd never seen the North Pole so busy and full this early. According to the gossip, Claus had begged Santa and Mrs. Claus to take back their decision, but they weren't budging. Now, he was spending all of his free time in the library studying the techniques and skills of past Santas. The three other Claus children didn't put much energy into preparation. Bertrand maintained machinery around town with Mrs. Claus, Sally worked on the signs with us in the workshop, and Kurt was, well, somewhere. He had a habit of disappearing. When the sign and sheet was finally taken down, there weren't as many elves on it as I thought there might be. A lot of kids didn't want to be Santa, or their parents thought it would be dangerous or they didn't believe an elf could run the North Pole. My parents didn't seem to worry about it. If that's what you want to do, then I guess you should do it. My mom said through the pins she held between her teeth. My mom is workshop top designer. She always has pins and wires in her teeth and hair. Can I go now? My little sister, Polly, whined. She was always having to model for her mom's kid clothes. Ow, you poked me. I didn't poke you. My mom winked at me. Polly was always making things up to get out of her doing a job. Just be careful, Lolly, okay? I nodded. Okay. My dad stuck his head out from the kitchen, and ice cream dripped out of his red hair into a puddle on the floor. Looks like competition's pretty fierce, Ollie Pop. You sure you're all ready? I'm sure, I said, even though I wasn't. Celia's coming with me. He brightened. Oh, you'll be fine then. I hope he was right. The letter inviting us to the first challenge told us to wear armor. Looks like there will be axe battles. I moaned to Celia. In the list of the top 200 things I was able to do, I didn't think you'd find either the word axe or the word battle, and definitely not the two of them together. Maybe slam poetry battle, if I was given a lot of time to prepare. Or if axe was used in a pun, like relaxation. I could maybe win a relaxation. Plus, I don't own any armor. It doesn't say armor, it says protective clothing, Celia corrected. We were in a personal office in the workshop. While I read the letter out loud, she was tweaking the code for a rocking horse that gave advice while you wrote it. Protective clothing probably means like, I don't know, uh, Goggles and long shelves or sleeves? How are goggles and long sleeves are going to stop an axe? The contest is the mailroom, not a coliseum. So they want to make sure we don't get paper cuts? Well, maybe. Didn't you work out in the mailroom for a while? Just for a class project. It was pretty boring. Cooped up all day with a thousand of letters. A thought struck me. Actually, Klaus was in the mailroom the same year I was. I think they were all sent to start there. Celia nodded. That's what I was thinking. We'll probably be sorting. She was interrupted by a beep. A horse a day keeps a doctor away! The rocking horse whined. I laughed. Celia did not look pleased. I'm still working on that. She said while tightening the bolts and holding down the horse's silver mane. Well, I thought it was funny, I told her. You think everything is funny. I frowned. That's not true. For example, I didn't think going axe versus axe against Buzz was funny at all. The horse peeped again. The journey to a thousand horses begins with a single horse. I couldn't help it. I laughed more. See? Celia said. I guess I saw. It's supposed to listen to your conversation and give good advice, but it just speaks up whenever it wants. Plus, there's this bug where it keeps adding the word horse to everything. I think I'm going to wipe it out and start over. I gasped and hugged it around its neck. You can't! I looked at Celia with my best puppy dog eyes. That's not a bug. That's her personality. Celia frowned at me, her finger hovering before the controls. It doesn't have a personality. It's a messed up robot. Beep. Horse is not measured by the horses you take, but by the horses that you the horse said the horse a horse. Celia and I stared at each other, trying to keep a stare face. 
After a second, her lip trembled, and we both burst out laughing. Now it's my turn to say. See? She's not a messed up robot. Her name is Horace, and she's perfect. Okay, fine, you win. If you think kids will like her, I'll submit her as a prototype. She unplugged the horse, who powered down with a soft and grateful neigh. I should be working on my games anyway. She's just... something I've been messing with my spare time. That's why you'd be a good Santa, I pointed out. You've got so many ideas about everything. Celia shook her head. Well, I almost gave up. You saw that she could be lovable. You'd made her a better Santa than I would. I'm not sure that lovability is something that you need to practice on gear for. I told her, which is my way of saying that even though I was laughing, I was still freaking out. You're going to stop grating goggles, Celia replied, which was her way of saying stop freaking out. Aw, shucks. I helped her carry a horse to the side of the room. I guess we're just going to have to win. Her face lit up just as she remembered something. I just remembered something, she cried. Told you. We've got some reject bodysuits from when we made those impenetrable superhero costumes. They got printed with the wrong pictures, but they should protect us from anything. They were built to withstand fire, ice, gum and hair, and natural disasters. Celia thought for a second, then pressed a few buttons on a keypad on the wall. A clunky noise climbed up from the floor, and a panel on the wall switched aside revealing a cardboard box and a cubbyhole. She pulled the box. How did you know which storage unit they were in? I was amazed. Celia shrugged. I've got a really good memory. She paused. Oh, wow. What? I asked. She held up one of the suits, and my mouth fell open. Oh, wow. That's what I'm saying. She sighed. It's the best we've got, though. We had the mail room long before our usual wake-up time the next morning. I braced myself for her laughter as we walked toward the small crowd of contestants gathered around the doors, but it was so dark no one could see our suits from far away. The doors were still locked, apparently, so the other Santa hopefuls were doing last-minute stretches or taking nervously to warn themselves. On the outside, the mail room warehouse was pretty boring, a huge gray rectangle. On the inside, it would be an ocean of stamps and children's handwriting. Nice outfits. Kurt, leaning against a candy-stripped streetlight away from the crowd, was the first to see us. He was wearing a full-body brown jumpsuit under a new leather jacket, a bright red one with Christmas criminal stitched in the back. He laughed, or at least I thought it was a laugh, whether you'd call a noise released through a sneer. Thanks, Kurt, I yelled too loud. I was determined to stay positive. Bright lights came on around the entrance of the mailroom. Kurt ran a comb through his coffied black hair and kicked off the pole. Guess it's time to go, he mumbled. He took the piece of candy cane out of its mouth and rubbed the saliva off his palm with his hands. Then he tucked the cane into the box in his breast pocket. You coming, kittens? I followed him. Celia's eyes were staring hard at the ground. If she stayed longer, I'm pretty sure her glare would have melted snow. She hurried up to catch up to us. As we approached the crowd, more than a few people turned and snickered at us. Under the powerful lights in the front of the mailroom, our outfits were uncomfortably obvious. I was wearing a skin-tight superhero suit covered in pieces of babies cuddling with puppies, and Celia's was covered with kittens wearing brows on their heads. And then, of course, we both had big goggles on our foreheads. Check out the super dorks! Buzz called from somewhere in the middle of the crowd. Laughter bubbled up from the elves. Stay positive. Stay positive. Stay positive. Pardon me thought. I am positive that I want to destroy Buzz and turn him into a death glitter. The other part taught me. What color is death glitter? A third part was wondering. Probably like red black and a dark purple, the first part suggested. I ended up shouting, at least we're prepared. The big elf shrugged. He was wearing a denim vest and shorts. That was it. He was ignoring the letter's advice on purpose, of course. I also saw he was wearing a belt with two big holsters, and on either side, 
but I couldn't make out what was in them. I looked around the crowd while they blinked and rubbed their eyes under the light. Claus, Sally, and Bertrand were off to the side, away from the crowd, in matching outfits that looked like the sort of thing you'd wear at a wood camp. Bertrand's was too big, and the long sleeves hung over his hands. Sally was reading the Merry Mailroom Manual, her eyes flitting quickly across the last few pages before she ran out of time. Claus paced and lectured the other two about strategy. The mailroom was a key part of the Christmas process, Claus explained. The wish generator only picks up verbal wishes, so the mailroom helps us get more power for wishes even though the other kids are embarrassed to say out loud. Sally waved the book with him. I know. I read. And Bertrand knows more about the wish generator than you do, Claus. Bertrand nodded. I've input thousands of letters into myself. Yes, but I'm the one of us who has worked in the mailroom before, which means I'll be the leader. It's more difficult than you think. For example, it's not actually, or actually, in perfectly alphabetic order. And I moved away and stopped listening. Several other humans stuck out above the crowds of elves, all extended Klaus family. I had seen some of them around town the past few days, but Maria Duende was flitting around and asking them to identify themselves like they had just arrived. She showed right past us. The camera woman really knocked us off, and stuck her microphone in the face of, well, definitely the strangest 16-year-old I've ever seen. Ah, yes, I'm Ram Kloss, this very strange human explained. He stroked a long white beard that reached down to his knees. His back was stooped over with a hunch. He had a very big baggy pants sagging slightly off his hips, and when he shifted his legs, they looked very very skinny. On top of his head, a dark black toupee rested awkwardly behind his ears. He was also wearing sunglasses even though it was hardly bright out. Nice to meet you, Ramp. Maria Duende had on her highest and biggest, biggest reporterish smile. The contest rules state that you must be 16 or younger to enter. How old are you? Ramp leaned in the microphone and cleared his throat. <clears throat> I'm, hmm, well, I'm 16. There was no hint of a joke on his face. Just had my birthday last week. The reporter smiled farther for a second. Then, she returned, bright as ever. That's a very long white beard for a, a 16 year old. It runs in the Claus family, you know. As luck would have it, I've got my birth certificate right here. He pulled a rolled up piece of parchment out of his pocket and handed it to Maria Duende. She opened it. And also an extensive illustrated family tree that explains exactly how I'm related to the Claus family. He pulled out another, larger scroll and handed it to her. And moreover, I had numerous anecdotes about how well I know the family. Why, one time that won't be necessary. She glanced over his favorite work. This does seem to be in order. Do you mind if I ask? Why the sunglasses? Ramp grinned. He was missing several teeth. Why? Because they are hip and cool. I'm always fly, as the kids, uh, as we say. You know, just like kids like me. Just like me. A kid. In fact, just the other day, someone pointed right at me and said, Look at that kid! Celia raised her eyebrows at me. Can you believe this guy? She whispered. I wasn't sure what to say. He definitely didn't look like a kid to me. But then again, if he was a kid, you had to feel sorry for him, looking like that. And also, I squinted at his face. Something about him looked... familiar. Maria Duende has said his first certificate looked so real, so... I trailed off. Celia shrugged. The front door is opened and a tall, broad reindeer sauntered in with a sour expression in his eyes and a tired tilt of his anklers. He wore a military-style hat covered in medals that signifies his service in many, many Christmases. He also had a red nose. 
As we all hushed and watched, Rudolph snorted, and the reindeer language translated around his neck piped a monotone robotic voice across the crowd. What a sorry bunch of Santa wannabes, the voice droned. I've seen all sorts of Santas in my time, and they all looked more capable than the day they were born than any of you lot. Why is he being so mean? I whispered to Celia, and then immediately I knew I shouldn't have. Rudolph's ears swiveled toward me before his head did. Did I sound like I was talking to a wannabe? He shouted by raising the volume level of his voice. Otherwise, it stayed monotone. I shook my head vigorously. His hooves started clopping toward me, and the crowd parted so he could bring his snout right up to my face. Well, did I? Uh, no, n no, sir. No, Rudolph, sir. His nostrils flared, and his nose grew bright. What's your name, wannabe? The robot voice got quieter as he approached, which actually made it scarier. Ollie, sir. Uh, Ollie Gnome. Gnome, I see. He turned his body around, a slow process of an old creature with four legs, and the volume of his voice rose again. Well, thanks to Gnome, you're all running a lap around the mailroom. Now. Claus, who was standing at the front of the crowd with Sally and Bertrand, bristled. Before the test, he protested. That's almost two miles. Rudolph bobbed his head in a nod. Thank you, Claus, for reminding me. He shifted his head, a gleam in his eye. Make that two laps. Now, everybody, move! We all took off running. Several other competitors pushed me, mumbling something about running their morning. Celia patted me on the back. Don't worry about it, she said. He would have made us do this no matter what. I wasn't sure anyone else thought, though. An elf in a light-up vest ran ahead of me, and the lights in the back spelled out, Thanks for nothing, jerk. He was even shorter than I was, and the vest was tiny, so it took a while for the words to scroll past. Afterward, he turned around and read backwards. Did you see what it said? He asked. I sighed. Yes, Luther, I saw it. I meant it. He stuck his little tongue out at me and then ran ahead. Luther's kind of rude, but he's mostly harmless. I thought about saying something back, but a snowball smacked me in the head inside. Nice one, Dolly, Buzz cheered. I pushed the head out of him, but he caught up easily and tripped me with his foot. I stumbled into Ramp, who pushed me back and up. Ram shook his head as I regained my balance. Bunch of whiners, if you ask me, he said. In my day, I had to run all the way to and from the candy store, full of sacks of candy on my back, uphill both ways. Never broke a sweat. Celia narrowed his eyes at him. When was your day? she asked. Wednesday, he responded immediately. My day was last Wednesday. I'm in the best shape of my young life. Bring on the running, I say. Don't worry about upsetting the nosed beast, kiddo. Uh, thanks, I said. I think? We weren't the quickest. We were competing against humans whose legs were, you know, longer. And we weren't the slowest. We were running against and competing against humans who spend more time thinking about running than actually running. But we slowed down when we realized Ramp was falling way behind. Are you okay? Celia was able to walk alongside his jog. He was wheezing pretty badly. Never better. He barely finished the words before he was coughing. Celia and I exchanged the look, then set ourselves up on either side of him, giving him some support. It made us a lot slower, but made him a lot faster. We carried most of his weight around the rest of the way, and ended up the very last three to cross the end. Thank you, Ramp mumbled between ragged breaths while we turned the final corner. You're the, the best of uh, friends a 16-year-old boy could, could hope for. Rudolph shot us a look that made it clear we had taken too long. Well, the reindeer said, it looks like we have our last team. Team? I looked around. Other contestants had sorted themselves into groups of three. You three 
are all that's left. You'll be braving the mailroom together. Gather around. The team slightened up into a circle around Rudolph. As he spoke, he paced around inside the circle. As you may know, all Santas start in the mailroom. Normally, you have several years working here to prove you can handle the pressure. But since Santa has decided to throw everything out of the whack this year, we've had to find ways to speed up the process. While he explained the challenge to us, I glanced around to the other teams. Klaus, Sally, and Bertrand had joined together. One of the older two had probably carried Bertrand. Buzz was on the team with Kurt and one of the Klaus cousins, a very pale girl with short red hair and freckles. I recognized also a team of three elves who had been working in the mailroom since before I got there, Goldie, Frank, and Meryl. They were triplets, two boys and a girl, and always wore the same clothes, so you could never tell who was who. Today, they were wearing the typical mailroom uniform, a light blue jumpsuit. An older elf was walking around the outside of the circle with a huge stocking, handing out hands that looked like Santa's. Another was passing out something small to each thing. Rudolph went on. Once you're in there, your goal is to sort as much mail as possible. To aid in keeping score, you each have a different stamp to label the letters you sort. I tested the stamp on my hand. It was a picture of Santa on a beach, longing and lounging under an umbrella and drinking something cold through a straw. Celia whispered to me. The mailroom uses traditional devices and stamps with a wooden handle, but there's a mechanism inside releasing ink to make sure it never dries out. I did some research when I found out we were coming here. I understand a few of you have worked the mailroom before, Rudolf acknowledged. Klaus looked especially smug at this. The triplets smiled, glancing at each other. Well, you can forget what you thought you knew. This mailroom is nothing like what you're used to, so don't get too comfortable. Klaus's face fell. I honestly feel bad for him. It must have been rough to suddenly be competing for a title you thought you'd already won. And that's not all. The door opened again. A big wheel squeaked across the floor inside, then scrunched the snow as it rolled out in front of us. Atop the wheel was a giant human child, or at least something that was maybe trying to look like a human child. It had the one big wheel instead of legs, thin metal arms, and hands that looked like one of those grabber claw toys. It had a huge steel head with a bright, smiling face painted on it. Its mouth was flat and opened like a ventriloquist dummy. Everyone looked immediately creeped out by this monster, except for Rudolph. He continued, In the field, Santa has to be able to avoid detection at all costs. Even a brief encounter with a human child can throw off his finely turned delivery schedule. The elf that had been passing out hats changed into a big yellow suit that covered his whole body. He placed the sand hat on top of his head over the suit and the child bot instantly noticed him. Is that you, Santa? It asked, without moving its mouth. Its voice was quiet and sweet, like a little girl's. Santa, it is you! The child bot mouth dropped open and flames poured out of it, enveloping the elf. After a moment, the child bot stopped. Instead of a hat, there was a small pile of suit on top of the elf's suit. The elf unzipped it, stepped out, and gave a thumbs up. He was sweaty, but fine. I was suddenly very glad we had worn the super suits. As long as he didn't get blasted in the head, we'd be okay. I glanced at Buzz. He didn't look nervous at all, a jerk. Kurt, too, was smirking. They were the only ones in the whole crowd who didn't look surprised. Even their third teammate looked uncomfortable. That's the game, Rudolph finished. Stamp it, sort it, and don't get caught. Only half of you will make it forward according to how much mail you sort. You can leave at any time 
but you have to leave in two hours. Starting in three, two, he paused. All the teams got even tenser than they did before. I almost forgot. Lose your hat, and you're out. Even if your team wins. Hats on! There was a quiet shuffling as everyone put on their hand hats. One. Chapter Four The door scraped against the ground as they swung open. We were one of the last teams to rush inside since Ram couldn't really move at much more than a hobble. Sorting mail? Ram croaked as we neared the door. Why, if that's all it takes to be Santa, I'll be holding the Kringle in no time. Celia and I exchanged a look. He had no idea what the mailroom was like. The mailroom was way bigger than I started, but Celia cut me off with a look that said, Let him see for himself. When we stopped through the door, he did. And we all did. The mailroom was dark. Very dark. This was the first immediate difference from normal. From what we saw, there was an overhead light hanging from the ceiling at equal intervals all the way up down in the warehouse that left big patches of darkness between spots that were very barely lit. Brightly lit. We could hear the squeak of the child bot's wheels moving around, but none of those awful machines were visible to us at the entrance. We couldn't see very far into the room because there were thick walls, probably about 15 feet tall, forming three different paths into the mail room. To our left and right were mountains of mails, with mail bags lying in heap between them. Some teams were still scooping mail into their bags, lagging between each other's who had already run to the mains. I checked the perimeter walls. The mail slots were already there, so at least that was normal. There were slots up and down in the mailroom's tall walls all the way back. Each was connected to a tube that sucked out the letters on the ground and then redistributed them to the power departments at the workshop, wish generator, or Claus castle. On the far wall of the mailroom were slots for every individual citizen of the North Pole as well. The tubes would take mail directly to our homes and apartments. There was a lot of mail here. A lot of mail. And not a lot of time. Celia took charge. We we'll had to open the letters and figure out where they go as quickly as possible. Ollie, you shouldn't do that, since you've done it before. I studied the mail slot organization last night, so I can make sure we get to the right departments quickly. Celia kept her voice down to avoid attracting child bots. She looked at Ramp, who was scooping letters into a bag. Ramp, we have the key from getting burned, so you're on child watch. I mean, what? Ramp couldn't hear her, and he spoke so loud they both jumped. Shh, child watch! He still couldn't understand. I can't hear you, what? I glanced around nervous. Child watch! Celia yelled. We need you to make sure the children don't find us. There's a faint squeak from the path on the far right. Is that you, Santa? A sickly sweet voice called. The only other team that was still by the entrance took off running. You shouldn't yell, Celia. Ram chastised, as if her yelling hadn't been his fault in the first place. We're supposed to be sneaking around those automatons. Celia looked like she was about to start yelling at him, but I grabbed her hands before she had the chance and pulled us down the middle path. Santa, that is you! I heard the children's voice as we slipped between the maze's walls, followed by the crackling sound of fire. I hoped the robot hadn't set the whole pile of the mail ablaze. We found a quiet spot that there were a few sharp turns in the maze. We passed several more piles of mails, so at least we'd be able to fill our bags on the go. I opened their bag and pulled out a letter from Elliot McAvey. Dear Santa, This Christmas, what I want more than anything is for a dinosaur toy with yellow workshop, animal division. I stamped it and passed it to Celia, who looked around and orient herself. Ram peeked around the corner, keeping a lookout for more child bots. I hope this eyesight was good enough to be helpful. Animals back up by the entrance. She grabbed the letter and took off running. We followed after her 
and I opened another letter while we ran, from Nora Carter. Dear Santa, this year I want only one thing for Christmas. My sister to stop stealing my hairbrush and getting her gross hair all over that's one's workshop beauty. I figured getting a hairbrush for a sister was probably the best solution. Watch out! Ramp yelled. I reached out and grabbed the back of Celia's suit, tugging her back from a corner as flames shot out from the other side. Santa, where did you go? The girl's voice echoed around us. We hid against the wall in the dark, while the child bot rolled around the corner. This one had its face, and hit its face on something, leaving the paint scraped off of his eyes should have been. The mangled little baby doll face rotted around the hallway while we held our breath. Santa, I miss you! We pressed our bodies against the wall and pulled each other slowly around the corner. We sighed with relief when the bot moved out of sight, which was nice because I had probably forgotten about breathing. Celia led us back to the entrance of the mail room and then right back into the maze on the far left. Sure enough, before the first turn, there was a slot in the wall that said WS Animals. She brought the letter close, and the pipes sucked in way. Peanut brittle, she swore. What's wrong? Beauty is right next to it, but the maze is in the way. She was right. Since the departments were in alphabetic order, Beauty would be just a little bit farther down the hall. Unfortunately, because of the shape of the maze, we'd have to turn and go deeper into the center to find our way back. Open another one and see what's closer. I found one from Abraham Danton. Dear Santa Claus, my favorite color is pink. For Christmas, I would like something pink. I don't like purple, so it can't be purple at all. And my mom says I can't ask for anything too big because our apartment is not very big. I also do not want anything that is an animal because for the last few years, all my toys have been animals. I don't want to sound ungrateful because I like animals, but what's taking so long? Ramp was sweating, and it made his whole body smell like mothballs. I heard the whoosh of fire and someone screaming deeper in the maze. Abraham Danton won't get his point. Sierra read her temples. Let's just send it to GNP. I'll find something for him later. I nodded and went to stamp it, but suddenly, it was knocked out of my hands. Sorry, super dorks. Looks like I got that one first. Buzz holstered the stamp gun back on his belt and sauntered over to us. He picked the letter off the ground. It was stamped with a piece and a picture of Santa Claus playing for the marimba. That's not fair, Buzz. See your friend at him. How did he know to bring a stamp gun? How did he know to make a stamp gun? The letter was ours. And now it's mine. You said GNP, right? Thanks for reading it for me. Buzz took off running, but stopped suddenly at an intersection. He counted with his fingers. Three, two, one. And a child bot rolled past the corner. He waited for it to pass and ran down the hall where it had come from. How did he know it was going to be there? What a jerk. I split over another letter. This one from Mindy Ratchford. Dear Mr. Claus, I wish for a cannon for Christmas so that I can wish generator. We aren't supposed to make weapons, but her wish could at least provide a bit of energy for the city. She wants a cannon. Ramp shook his head. Kids these days. All violent. He looked dangerously on the verge of a much longer complaint. It's those video games, I tell you, turning their, uh, our brains to mush. Because I love those video games. Mush my brain right up, I say. He did a motion with his hands, like he was squishing brain between them. Celia and I stared at him, and Celia said, Okay, well, the wish generator slot is in the back of the room on the other side. I guess we're going to have to get through the maze. I said, I heard this thing where if you put your hand on the left side of the wall and follow it, you'll eventually get everywhere in life. I don't have time for this. Ram cut me off and leaned over to pull off his shoes. I held my nose. His pants were so baggy and low that I couldn't see his feet, but he looked very relieved and wobbled back and forth for a second. Give me the letter. I handed him morally. Ram tilted his head to look up from the top of the wall like he was measuring a distance. 
He bent his knees a little, then suddenly sprang up from the floor and landed on the top, balancing perfectly. Celia and I gasped, startled. I'll be right back, he said, and took off running along the tops of the walls, bounding across the mains. Within a few seconds, he was back standing above us. How did he do that? I examined his shoes to see if they had any special tricks inside them. They seemed perfectly normal. We didn't have the time for stupid questions. What's the next one? I ripped another one. I want to be Bigfoot, and said. Workshop, costumes. See, I thought for a moment and told him where to go, and he bounded off in that direction again. We must not have been the only team to have this idea. I saw the triplets tossing each other across the walls above us while you were waiting for him. Our plan seemed to be going pretty well. I figured out where the letter should go, Celia remembered where the slot was, and Ramp jumped over the walls to get there. We had to keep moving faster, almost constantly, to avoid the child bots, but it was still way faster than anything or doing anything as a group. We only ran to a team of Claus children once. Claus was barking orders to Sally and Bertrand the whole time. Bertrand had a little mechanical penguin on his shoulder, scanning the sorting letters quickly, and Sally made a toy that threw her voice and distracted the child bots. I saw Kurt a few more times. He and the red-headed girl were roller skating through the maze like they'd done it a hundred times before. Buzz wasn't with them, probably because he was off stealing letters on his own. I saw one team get in a fight over which one of them were being lazier, and all three yanked off each other's hats and threw them right into the child bot's mouth. It quickly grabbed them in the pincer hands and dragged them outside while they kicked and screamed. Luther got caught because his vest glitched and stuck on a maximum brightness. He shone the work, jerk, like a beacon for the child bots, but at least he was so sure that the fire didn't even hit his body, just burnt the hat right off his head. So he was out. When a ten minute warning sounded, Rudolph's translated voice blaring across the whole warehouse, Celia, Ramp, and I were all exhausted. Ramp landed on the ground next to us, and I handed him his shoes, which he took a long time to put back on. I think he stuffed them up with something in his pockets, as he was bending over to trying them. I started to panic. Oh, uh, guys, um, I stammered. Celia and Ramp both looked at me while I danced back and forth on my feet and pointed at Ram's head. I've never been very good at getting my words on high-pressure situations. His, the, um... I pointed to my own head and jumped up and down. What elf spit it out? Ram grumbled. I stopped dancing. I'm tired. I'm tired enough without seeing you put on your shameless display. Oh no. Sigurd's eyes widened as she realized what I was trying to say. Your hat! You lost your hat somewhere! Ram reached up and patted the top of his toupee. His hat was definitely gone. Peppermint bark! He swore. I must have dropped it while I was delivering letters. We only had ten minutes to search the whole maze, and before we could even try, one of the child bot's voice rose from the crowd in the corner. Celia's eyes widened. Holy jingle bells! She started off yelling, then pulled her voice back toward a whisper. Suddenly, a huge smile broke out of her face. I get it! Get what? I asked. Celia pulled us back in the shadows while the child bot passed by. Did you eat your milk and cookies, Santa? It asked. The voice sounded scarier and scarier every time. The pattern. They're following the same paths over and over, Celia said. I thought about Buzz and how he knew to wait for one of the child bots to pass by. Ramp. I know you had your hat when you sent that letter to the jawbreaker department because you said it was ugly and annoying and no one with any sense would ever wear it. Do you ever remember anything after that? Ram thought for a second. Oh yeah! I took the hat off and threw it on the ground because I hated it so much while I was delivering the personal letter for Gary Goblin. You what? Celia yelled. Personal letter! I tried to keep us forward. That means... The back of the maze, right? As far back as we could possibly go. Celia nodded. Follow me. Ramp groaned. I can't keep doing this, I'm too tired. I patted him on the shoulder. That's okay, you have us today. I tried to give him my best and biggest, most supportive smile, 
even though inside I was kind of upset with him too. If you want, we can get it and I'll meet you back in the entrance. You'd better. He started walking away with us and without us as much as a thank you. I'm not losing this chance because you can't find the hat. He kept grumbling as he got farther away. Celia frowned. We wouldn't even have a chance of winning without him. I reminded her. Plus he's old, I think. Yeah, what's up with that? I shrugged. So Celia shrugged. And then we both shrugged at each other again and laughed. Focus, you goofball! She chided. You're the goofball! I replied. She stuck out her tongue at me, then signaled which way to go at her head, and started running toward the maze. I followed as close behind as her as I could and paused when they signaled. The difference was amazing. Now that she had figured out the pattern, we hardly had ever even seen the chatbot. We also didn't see anyone else, so I guess most people had found their way out by then. I kept my eyes on the ground, but never saw the hat. I was starting to give up hope. Maybe someone had grabbed Ram's hat because their own had been burnt when I heard a quiet flapping noise. We were all the way up against the black wall and the ball of Ram Santa hat was stuck and with a male slot, Goblin Gary, just like he'd said. The pipe was too small to suck out the, bl the hat all the way in so the air current was making it flap up and down. Celia and I grabbed it together and yanked it free. Suddenly, a siren started playing. Rudolph's voice came over the loudspeaker. Five minutes left, wannabes! And I got a surprise for you punks, who think it's a good idea to cut out its clothes. Celia put her hands in her face. I don't know. I don't want to know, she groaned. We were as far as from the front door as was possible. The siren stopped, and the squeaking of wheels we had been hearing for the past two hours doubled in speed. Set high hat, yo! Even the voice of the child bot had sped up and turned high in unnatural. It whipped around the corner at lightning speed, barreling toward us on its one wheel with terrifying purpose. It was the bot with the missing eye. Back for vengeance! Run! I yelled. Celia and I bolted back into the maze, the child bot on her tail. Every once in a while, it would shoot flames at our heels, just to remind us it was there. About a quarter in its way, another bot spotted us and joined in. A few turns later, a third and a fourth. Silent it's to you! It screeched in chorus. I saw Celia's foot get caught in the blast of flame, but other than a cinch in the face of a kitten, the suit protected her. We borrowed to the front door where Ram was huddled in the corner. I don't like these automatons, he babbled as I threw him this hat. He tugged it on, and Celia shoved open the door for him to run through. Not one bit! I let Celia go ahead of me, then glanced back. A one-eyed giant child face was inches away from her face. I was staring directly into its scary, painted-on mouth. The flames there was hatch fell open. Did you eat your mega cocky Santa? I leapt backwards out the door and stunted behind me. I fell on my butt while flames licked out the cracks on the floor. Celia was bent over, hands on her knees panting. Ramp was looking grumpier than ever. Well, Ramp looked around at a tired, sweaty cloud of a sour expression. I suppose we didn't do terribly. I saw Goldie, one of the triplets, roll his eyes. You hear that, Frank? He yelled with his sister in the ribs. Frank punched him on the shoulder. Yeah, Goldie, I hear that. You hear that, Miro? She smacked her brother in the back. Meryl hit her stomach. I heard him. They think they did good. What a bunch of twerps. All three of the triplets laughed in exactly the same way. Celia and I pretended not to hear them. Rudolph trotted through the crowd to a group of elves with clipboards sifted through to the mark which contestants lost their hats. He passed Kurt, Buzz, and the red-headed girl who all still had theirs. The Klaus sibling team was safe too, and Klaus looked confident. He always looked confident though. Maybe that's just his face. When Rudolph arrived to our team, he lit his nose up as bright as I'd ever seen it. We couldn't look directly at him. Everything, especially the snow, was bright red. You got lucky this time, wannabes. 
Looks like enough hats got burnt that you're barely scraping through. Celia and I beamed at each other. We made it. I saw the triplet shrug in the corner of my eye. Rudolph turned back to the group, and his nose blinked on and off like a strobe light. You'd better watch out, he called over all of us. You'd better not cry. You'd better not pout. Why? An elf in pigtails interrupted. Rudolph glared down at her and snorted. I'm telling you why. He returned his focus back toward the crowd. Falling snow gently piled on his antlers. His nose stopped blinking, and he tapped the hoof on the ground twice, roughly. The Santa trials have only just begun. Chapter 5 The next month went by really slowly. It felt strange to go back to my regular games and puzzles work after so much deadly excitement. Santa never gave us a clue about what the next trial would start, so the only choice was to keep moving. The workshop wasn't boring. There's nothing boring about Christmas, but it felt like when you cry during a really great movie and then realize, when you walk out into the sun, that everyone else was just having a regular day. The contestants in the Santa trials had been through a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but we still had to make sandwiches and go to the bathroom. Celia said she was relieved for a break from the excitement, but I'd never seen her working harder. How many new blueprints have you turned in today? I asked as she slipped another rolled up piece of paper into the air tube on her office wall. She counted in her head. Eight. And no nine. Wait, are you counting today as starting at midnight or business hours? Because at 2 a.m., I sent in plans for a trash can that sings when you throw things away. I think it already exists. I was programming the paint in a dollhouse to change colors when no one was looking and had already coded the furniture to move around when everyone left the room. It was actually one of Sally's designs, a truly haunted doll mansion. Celia shrugged. Well, I made a better one. I got the hint that she didn't feel like talking. When I was through painting, I powered my papers down waved goodbye, and slipped out of our office in the hallway. Hallways in the workshops were busier than streets, especially around lunchtime, so I let the flow of the crowd pull me across and along the grand staircase. An elf woman with blonde hair and a big, neat tower on top of her head was leading two children along by the hand so quickly their feet were coming to the ground. Oh yeah, we brought the whole family to watch the rest of the trials this is history, you know? These guys. She lifted her kids high off the ground and waved to them in front of her friends. Are a little too young to compete, but the memories will last a lifetime. Won't they, boys? Yes, ma'am. The kids chimed together. They looked a little overwhelmed. Their mother's friend, a skinny man in a long, fuzzy robe, nodded. I feel bad for his son, Claus. The man spread his arms out wide and shrugged. He's a hard worker who deserves to be Santa. This must have come as a terrible surprise. I think an elf could win. Wouldn't that be a nice change? The woman apparently grew tired of leading the kids by hand and set one of them on each other of muscular shoulders. They held on each of her hair tower to keep from falling off. I missed the man's response before they turned off down toward the hallway and I was pushed ahead across the staircase. I had to quickly slip around the other elves to get to the edge of the crowd and almost stripped down the stairs when I finally pushed free of the current. I clung to the handrail and looked down. The grand staircase was the most beautiful part of the workshop. Two intertwined spirals wrapped around each other in a double helix like DNA with a slide along the edge of both staircases that you could ride all the way down from the top to bottom. Most people didn't because it was very fast and very scary. The spirals had thin, flat bridges connecting them to every floor across the wide open space between the hallways and the stairs. Huge decorations and giant glowing Christmas ornaments hung suspended in the air all the way down and it was easy to get distracted staring at them since they were redesigned and replaced every month. Today, I didn't have a chance to get distracted. 
the workshop was even more crowded than usual because of all the visitors here to see the trials, and the crowd was pushing me down the stairs so fast I would have fallen if we hadn't been packed together so tightly. When I got to the cafeteria, I slipped around the crowds to get in line for my favorite restaurant. Oh, bring us some other than figgy pudding, and started scanning through the menu even though I already knew I was going to buy the reindeer nuggets. Chicken nuggets shaped like reindeers, not made of reindeers, obviously. Somebody shoved me forward into the human in front of me, but I caught myself on their back and pushed back up. They pretended not to notice, of course, and when I turned around, I realized it was Buzz's crew. Of course. I'm pretty much the reason we got first place. Buzz was bragging to the group of elves who were always tagging along after him. I couldn't believe he was still talking about the first trial. I convinced Kurt to sneak in early with me, and we scooped on the mailroom. We got lucky and even saw them testing the robots, figured it all out before even the trial even started. His crew laughed in a gross, meaning way, and my face turned bright red. They cheated. Not that I should be surprised. I ordered my food from an elf with an eye patch and a bionic hand that could change into a kitchen utensil. He worked in the cafeteria so long that everyone called him chef. I'll have the reindeer nuggets, I said. He nodded. Good choice, kid. But be careful. They're spicy. That's what he always said. Everyone was kid, and everything was always spicy, even when it wasn't. Just how I liked them, I said. He giggled his high, tiny laugh and pushed on some nuggets with a spatula hand. The slats widened, shifting the spatula to form a little grill. The bars grew bright red to cook the nuggets on top too. There weren't any open tables near the edge, so I wandered deep into the center. You don't understand, Sally. I heard Klaus grumble. I jerked my head around and realized I was only a few feet from their table. I quickly lowered my head. I knew I shouldn't be eavesdropping, but I found a seat very close so I could hear the conversation. You three were never going to be Santa. Dad did this because he doesn't think I can handle it. Klaus doesn't sound sad like expected. He sounded excited. These contests are the best way and a perfect way to prove that I can. And I will, obviously. I took a bite of my reindeer nugget. It wasn't spicy. I don't know what obviously, Sally replied. I heard her book slam shut, but she only did when she was irritated. I've never seen Kurt be bad at anything he actually tries to do well. Yeah, but when was the last time you saw him try? He's only competing for some sort of stupid joke. He'll get bored eventually. Maybe. Or maybe the joke is that he's going to win. Either way, Bertrand is better at mechanic than any of us. Klaus paused. Yeah, I guess Bertrand has a shot too, he said, but he didn't sound like he believed in it. I heard a small voice groan. You're only saying that because you don't want to hurt my feelings. I hadn't realized Bertrand was at their table, but his voice was unmistakable. I have just as much as a chance of any of you. That's what I said. Klaus sounded like he was talking to a little kid, which just made Bertrand angrier. You didn't mean that. I do. There was a moment of tense silence because everyone knew he didn't. Fine, Bertrand said. I treat me like a baby if you want. I'm not helping you in any of your challenges. Even in their air teams. <laughs> That's stupid. Klaus was still dismissing him. We know each other best. It makes you sense to stick together when you can. No. You only know yourself best. I heard Bertrand push angry air up his nose. And I don't care. If you want to be Santa, you can do it on your own. I'm going to prove that I'm better Santa than all of you. I heard Bertrand's heavy footsteps as he walked away. He was stomping, and the pages of Sally's book flipping back open in the silence that followed. What about you? Klaus asked after a while. What about me? You think Kurt and Bertrand could beat me? What about you? There's a short pause before Sally answered. When she spoke, she sounded like she was closing her words and choosing her words carefully. I'm not worried about winning. You don't want to be Santa. I didn't say that. But Bertrand's right. 
It's better if we don't team up anymore. I heard the dishes in Claus's tray clatter as he jerked it on the table. Great. Glad you both want to abandon me. We're not abandoning you, Drama King. And if we were, it would be because you act like this. I was already trying not to cry and was relieved when I heard Claus breathe heavy out of his nose. I guess it was a Claus thing, and walk away. I hated seeing them angry with each other. They were the Clauses. They were supposed to represent joy for the Christmas of all of us. I stood up and stepped over to the table where Sally was reading by herself. I set my tray down next to her and looked at her with big eyes. I didn't see her glance away from her book, but she pushed up her glasses and frowned. Are you gonna cry? she asked. No, I said, but in a shaky way that really meant probably yes. She smiled a little. Good. Don't. You should be happy. Klaus needs to learn what to do when there's no one to boss around. She looked up at me for a second. It's Ollie, right? I nodded. Can I tell you a secret? I nodded again. You had to promise not to cry. Okay? I don't want to be Santa. But I can't tell anyone else, obviously. A Klaus dropping out of the competition is just another story for the news. Sally flipped in the next page of her book. How is she reading and talking at the same time, I wondered. And my dad keeps telling me how amazing he thinks I would be at the job. I think he wants to try even more than Klaus. It would break his heart. One little tear rolled out of my cheek. You promised! She flipped the page in her book and smiled. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying very hard not to cry, I mean it. I started smiling even before I finished. I think it was a leftover tear from earlier. Thanks for listening. I gotta go. Do you want my extra reindeer nuggets? Sally pushed her tray over to me and I grabbed the ones that were left. See you late. But before she could finish, everyone in the cafeteria started yelling and pointing at their phones. The next competition was announced. Chapter 6 You have one week to build the best sleigh you can using any materials available at the workshop. Celia read out loud from her official female. Ramp, who had come to her office without asking, was listening with his eyes and closed, and maybe, definitely, snoring just a little bit. This includes, of course, assembling a team of reindeer, Celia continued. Uh-oh. That means we have to convince them to join us, doesn't it? I can make a sleigh, sure, but... Talking to those snooty snouts is going to be a disaster. What's so hard with grabbing some reindeer? Ramp snapped without opening her eyes. I guess he wasn't sleeping. They're just animals. Celia laughed. Yeah, and so are we. To them. Don't you know what reindeer ramp? I asked. Aren't you a Claus? Ramp shook his head. I haven't taken animal husbandry yet. Since I am 16 and am only in... He looked at me like I was going to tell him and paused for too long. Fourth grade? High school, I said. I think you mean high school. Ah, uh, yes, I have completed every one of the low schools. Well, here's what they didn't teach you. Celia flipped over a nearby whiteboard and pulled the cap of a red marker and started with a satisfying pop. She drew a simple picture of Santa Claus, but young with a red beard. He was holding a single a little blue snow globe, the whiteboard hummed a little as it turned on and the little Santa drawing yawned and stretched. Chris Kringle Claus was the greatest Christmas scientist in history. He made the quantum Kringle, ah yes, tell me more about that, Graham interrupted. For example, where does the current Santa keep it? Asking for a friend. Celia paused and looked at him with suspicion. You already know what it does and nobody knows where he keeps it. That's not part of the story. Ram scribbled down some notes in a piece of paper. Nobody knows where he keeps it. Okay, got it. Thanks. But he also raised unique reindeer who can completely ignore gravity. She doodled a few reindeer they obviously flipped and twirled around the board. He started with just a few. Eight, obviously. And they passed it onto their kids, who pass it on to their kids, 
and now all the reindeer in this part of the world can fly. It also means, it also sometimes leads to other genetic mutations like Rudolph's glowing nose and exceptionally long lifespan. A little doodle Rudolph, hat and all, grumpily corralled the whirling reindeer into two lines. The Santa Doodle connected them to a sleigh and then placed the quantum Kringle into the center console. They help the sleigh get off the ground, but also keep it from running into things while it's going to high speed. That's why you need at least eight of them for a sleigh with a Kringle. It's impossible for a human to think they fast alone. Since we're just making regular engines, we'll probably only need three max. Each? I asked. Celia nodded. The letter says this is a solo contest. We each have to make our own sleighs. Graham frowned. I still don't understand you. And why are you guys worried? Well, the thing is, they know they're special. Celia powered down the whiteboard and all the drawings froze in place. And they know we need them, so they demand a lot. Plus, they don't really like flying, I added. So it can be hard to get them to sit and stay listen. I would like flying too, you know? So I get it. Yeah, yeah, we are all like flying. Ramp grumbled. He stood up slowly and started shuffling out of the office. I guess I'd better get started. All by myself. Just me. Alone. Okay, bye. Celia was already sketching a sleigh in a blueprint. Ramp sighed heavily, and I huffed out air to tell Celia that she should look back up at me. She did. I mouthed. I feel bad. She mouthed. About what? I pointed at Ramp. She looked at him, then looked back at me. You can help him if you want, she mouthed. But should we help him? I started mouthing words faster so I could finish before Ramp got to the door. He doesn't seem like he's necessarily a nice guy. Plus, I'm pretty sure he's not 16 at all. If we don't help him, though, are we jerks? I don't want to be a jerk. He's all by himself, you know? Where, Where is he even going to build a sleigh if he can't use our office? His hotel room? I bet his hotel room is too small to build a sleigh. He'd have to get rid of his bed. If he is really an old man, he has got to have a bed, Celia. What are we going to do? Celia stared at me for a second. What? She mouthed. I threw my hands up in the air. A ramp! I called out to him, interrupting the slow motion lift of his hands to the doorknob. Mm, yeah? What? Ramp turned around, suddenly but very quick. You can build your sleigh in front of us if you want. I smiled at him. He kept frowning, but nodded. Only if you promise to clean up this mess. He said, jogging over to us in a tenth of the time it took for him to get to the door. He looked over Celia's shoulder at the blueprint she was working on. Where do we start? I'm not making your sleigh for you. Celia didn't look off from her drawing, so don't even try. Ram looked up at me expectantly. I tried to avoid eye contact. I guess, well, I guess you saw the engine. And I guess I'm going to have to walk you through the whole challenge again. Great! Ram clapped his hands together and grinned. It was the first smile I had seen him for a while, which made all the work I had coming feel worth it. Let's get to work. I woke up the next morning in a plush seat with a wrench in my hand. I rubbed my eyes and looked around, slowly realizing I'd fallen asleep while working on my sleigh. Celia was already awake and had already showered and changed clothes. She had a welder's mask on and was welding around the spokes of her wheels. I heard a growl from under me and leapt out of my seat. Celia's torch clicked off. She lifted her mask up and wiped the sweat off her face, flicking it to the ground. The next growl was even louder with the fire buzzing in the torch. It's Ramp, she said laughing a little at the scarred face I was making. He's snoring under your sleigh. I peeked under the sleigh's body, currently held by a singer blocks. There he was curled up into a tiny ball. His toupee was sliding off the center a little, but something was holding it in place. I glanced down at the baggy jeans and big shoes 
and remembered how he jumped during the first challenge. There's gotta be something with his legs, I thought. Now's my chance to find out. I flattened myself down the floor and slowly dragged myself under the sleigh as quietly as I could. I stretched my hand out and closed my fingers around a bit of his jeans thin at ankle and started lifting it up. What are you doing? Ram snapped. I let go immediately and moved my pinched fingers to the ground. Uh, aha! I said too loudly and lit a hair I found on the ground. I was wondering where this went. You were looking for hair? I, indeed I was. Well, look quieter. He turned over and went back to sleep. I pulled myself out from under the car where Celia was working and looking at me with a look that said, What was all that about? I tried to look back at her way that would explain what I wanted to do, but I couldn't think of one, so I just wrinkled my eyebrows up and down. I have an idea, Celia said quietly, setting down her welding gear. She fluffed out her dark curls that had just squished by the helmet. I'll help both of you with your sleighs, and Ollie can help us with the reindeer. You're way more patient than them, and I can build the sleighs twice as fast. Twice as fast? I frowned. I don't know about that. I'm actually very... She gestured to her sleigh. Its body was basically finished, and basically perfect. I'm not saying you can do it, Ollie. It just might be better use of her time. I nodded. She was right. Still, it meant I'd have to wrangle some reindeer. Alone. The stable was really more a palace than a stable. A huge glass dome rivaling the size of a mailroom shone sparkling and beautiful even with the light dust of the snow. I could see plants inside, but the snow kept me from really making out them. Four clear glass towers spiraled up into the sky on every side with large open windows on top of the fly reindeer. It was big, extravagant, beautiful, and it had no doors. Not one door. Anyone who could fly had to climb up a very old rope ladder hanging from one of the tower windows. I took a deep breath, grabbed the first rung, and started the climb. After two minutes, I was totally scared. The wind got stronger as I climbed, and the rope ladder began swinging just enough to feel like it was going to snap. I wasn't even a quarter of the way up yet, and was ready to give up and go back down. Get some peppermint tea. Try again later. The rope ladder swung around the tower, suspended me in the air for a second, and then swung back into the tower, slapping me against the glass. Actually, you know, maybe I shouldn't be in this competition after all. Who needs the kind of responsibility anyway? I'll just let Buzz be Santa. Oh really, you're just going to let Buzz be Santa? I argued back with myself. And we'll all just walk around with axes for hands for the rest of our lives. He's not going to make our hands with axes. I'm pretty positive about that, and I'm surprised you'd be worried about something so silly, I responded. I shook my head and climbed up another rung. Either way, we can't let him win. One foot in front of the other, right? About halfway up, something big and brown slammed through the window next to me, then scrabbled its hooves against the window and kicked back at me, floating behind me with a dazed look on its face. A reindeer. She was young, only a little bigger than me, with little stubby horns. Strapped around her head was big flight goggles. They looked adorable. Hi! The reindeer voice box chirped. She was using a more modern box than Rudolph's, with an actual voice that could express things with exclamation points. What you doing? Climbing, I said, and kept climbing. She turned her body sideways and rested her hooves in a tower. With a clop, 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 she trotted alongside me like it was the ground. Looks boring, she said. I shook my head. Not boring. Scary. After a few minutes of her watching me struggle, she tilted her head and observed. You sure aren't talking much? Very scary. Oh, well here. She kicked off the tower and did a loop-de-loop. -loop. I found her bumped against my legs. I'll take you the rest of the way, no sweat. Really? Thanks. I carefully swung one leg around and gently sat down her back. I also saw how far I was from the ground and almost threw up. Let me just... 
Oh, okay. I guess we're going. Why are we going so fast when you're talking to me? Where are you taking me? I yelled as she rocketed away from the tower at full speed. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you. She craned her neck down to yell at me over the sound of the wind. My name's Crasher. Maybe you should look where you're going, I yelled. I mean, you know more about flying than I do, I guess. Crasher laughed with her real voice instead of her voice box. Have you ever heard a reindeer laugh before? It's mostly a string of loud snorts. She did a rather loop-de-loop -loop and left me dangling from her neck. I was maximum scared. Fun, right? She snorted and laughed again. Woohoo! She sped toward the tower so fast, I thought we would slam into it. Right at the last second, when I could see myself reflected in the glass, she pulled up. When we got to the top, she braked suddenly and whipped us into the opening. I flew off her back and into the tower, landed on some wooden planks, and rode to a stop. She tumbled in, not long after, snorting and rolling. So, what you doing in the stable? she asked, prodding my arm with one of her hooves. I didn't move from my face down position. Nothing. Ever. Again. I said. I'm done doing things. I've done all the things I need to do, I think. My heart was still beating so fast I could feel it in my fingernails. Crasher pushed me with a snout. I rolled over and narrowed my eyes at her. You scared me on purpose. Well, yeah, she said. Duh. Her big lies and eyes lit up. Oh, are you competing the sand thing? You need a team, right? Uh, well, I try to find a way of saying yes. Sweet! Then I'll be on your team. She rubbed her head against a peg sticking out of the wall and popped the goggles off. I'm fast, even faster than most adults. I'm not as good as landing, so I guess it's pretty good that landing's not important. I think maybe that the landings are very important from a certain perspective? I tried to argue, but she wasn't listening. Great! You gotta go see Dreamer to get the rest of your team. I can take you if you want. She was right. I did have to take permission from Dreamer. And I wasn't just here for my team, I was here for Celia's and Ramp's team too. Having her on my side was at least better than navigating the stable on my own. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Ollie. I stucked on my head to shake and then realized that was silly. Crasher wasn't bothered though and stuck off her hoof. We shook. Nice to meet ya. Dreamer will be in the grove. She started trotting down the tight spiral staircase and I followed. Did you bring any gifts? Uh, I... Uh, no. Is it bad that I didn't? Don't worry too much, Crasher said, lifting up the ground and looking at me while she floated down the stairs. He's probably not going to like you anyway. He has to like me, I insisted. I need nine reindeer. Eight, she corrected. Eight, I guess, if you're not totally sure you want to help me. I'm sure. Eight. These stairs sure did take a while. Did you know dreamers never touch the ground? Crasher flicked one ear and spun around, landing gingerly back into the stables and the steps. He even sleeps in the air, and he doesn't leave the stable anymore. Not at all. Why is he in charge anyway? I asked. If he never leaves, and he's so hard to talk to. Big as antlers. Seriously? Crasher rolled her shoulders in a way that might have been a shrug. It's an old school ranger thing. Some stuff just never changes. We finally reached the bottom of the stairs, and my wobbly legs were thankful. Crasher reared up on his hind legs and pulled and pushed on two double doors that opened out a lush, warm garden. I took a deep breath, and even the air felt greener. And there were so many reindeers, all with different antlers and coats and heights from the ground. Reindeer splash in a stream or flew in the tops of trees to pick fruit. They rolled around in the ground and the flowers, or dwelled antler to antler in the air. Crasher hopped around me in a circle. Welcome to the stable, she said. I can tell it's your first time. It's so beautiful, I whispered. And warm. She laughed with a barrage of snorts. I took off one of my coats and wrapped it with my arm. Come on. Crasher grabbed my sleeve between her teeth and tugged. I let her pull me deeper into the dome. We passed in a miniature forest where a reindeer was pruning a hedge into the shape of a reindeer wearing a wig 
and posing dramatically on a boat. He was surrounded by a bunch of little hedges, elves and humans, all huddled up and rowing. That sniper. He's been doing famous painting this year. I think that one's George Washington, Crasher said. I nodded, even though I didn't know what a George Washington was. <laughs> a few of reindeer glanced at me in a way that didn't feel very welcoming, but no one came close enough to bother us until I, distracted by a butterfly, walked directly into a human and fell over backwards. The human, of course, was fine. When I got my bearings, I recognized the red-haired girl from the first challenge. She grinned and jingled a whole handful of dog tags in front of me. You're here to the team. To build one. Two? She reached a hand down and helped me up. I nodded and brushed myself off. Crasher was sniffing at an empty burlap sack she was holding with the other hand. What's that? I asked. She glanced down at the sack. Oh, I live on an apple orchard back home. I figure we'd have to do something like this, so I brought some apples you can find around here. Dreamer loved them. Didn't you bring a gift? I shook my head. Yikes. She must have seen my face fall because she knelt down and put a hand on my shoulder. Here's a secret. I heard he likes corny jokes, so if you can think of any. She patted my shoulder a few times and shot up. I'm Ollie, I exclaimed. I just realized I don't know your name, and you're being so nice to me. There was a look on her face for a brief flash where she seemed uncomfortable, like maybe a big butt bitter or something. She smiled. Andrea, good luck. Andrea waved two fingers in this little salute and tossed her red hair over her shoulder as she walked away. I looked at Crasher, who had been unusually quiet for the whole time. Are you okay? I asked. Crasher turned to me with a dreamy look in her eyes. Just think about apples. A few feet ahead was an archway of branches, the only opening in a thicket of trees. I stepped into the shade. Is this it? I asked. Crasher nodded, but didn't step forward. I'm not going in there, though. I gotta go get my tag for you. What? You have to go with me? I don't know what to do on my own. I'm not scared, if that's what you're asking. Uh, I didn't say you were scared, but I'm pretty sure I am. You'll be fine, maybe. Good luck, see you later, bye! I turned and headed deeper into the tree tunnel. The entrance had been entirely normal trees, but as I got deeper, they started looking stranger. Some trees had glowing leaves, some had dark barks that shone like metal, and others were growing fruit that looked like Christmas ornaments right from the branch. I heard a soft, repeating crunch, like someone marching on glass. I creeped slowly to the end of the tunnel and caught a glimpse of a snout above huge reindeer teeth chowing down on one of the ornament fruits. Inside it was juicy and green, but the skin made a sound of like glass. I hoped it didn't feel like glass. As I turned in the corner, Dreamer's huge green eyes swiveled around and stared at me. Another? Already? A gentle calm voice came from all sides. I whipped around, surprised, and saw speakers hanging from the branches among the ornaments fruits. Dreamer must not like to wear a voice box. And an elf, no less. Dreamer's voice remained quiet and smooth, but I got the impression he wasn't happy. I turned around and looked him over for real. The first thing I noticed was antlers. He had huge antlers, bigger and spread than his body, jutting out from his head and forming a great web. The antlers were decorated with several pieces of hanging ornament fruit, but beautiful red birds tweeted from a nest among them. The reindeer's body was slender and small for a reindeer, and his thin legs ended in unusually little hooves. His coat was shiny, flawless, and gold, all this framed by perfect sunlight streaming into the grove through a skylight in the trees. He lost interest in looking at me and floated around, occasionally twirling upside down his ornaments remained hanging in place, aligned with its individual gravity. Well. His voice projected, and then the speaker yawned, even though his body didn't. What have you wrought for me? Okay, Andrea said he liked jokes, 
Gotta give him a good joke. What kind of cameras does Santa have? You came here to ask me this? A North Polaroid! I faked a big smile and shook my hands festively. Excuse me? Dreamer scratched his back against the tree. The joke must not have been that good. What's Santa's favorite garden tool? Why are you asking questions to which you already know the answer? Oh ho ho ho! I think I sounded more frantic than funny. Dreamer hovered forward and stared at me again, confused, but he wasn't still laughing. I took a deep breath. What do gingerbread go swear? I was sweating hard. Must I ask you to leave? Cookie sheets! I punched the air with every syllable and then spread my arms wide and wiggled my fingers. Dreamer began herding me with his antlers back to the archway. I am unsure why you have come here to act like a fool, he went on, but I have no more patience for this. Goodbye. Wait, please! I fell down on my knees and stopped backing away from his antlers. He froze too, maybe because he didn't want to touch me. I didn't bring anything, I'm sorry. Someone told me like jokes, so I was trying to be funny. So those were jokes. Dreamer turned his eyes toward the sky and looked thoughtful. I hated them. This someone gave you an accurate information. She must have been confused. I don't think she meant to lie to me or uh, waste your time, uh, your, your highness? At that, Dreamer laughed lightly from the speakers. Uh, fine. He floated up and did a little twirl in the air. I'll take your shoes then. Wait, my shoes? I looked down at them, my warm red boots. I don't think you're a size four. I didn't ask for your thoughts. I asked for your shoes. I took them off and set them neatly beside each other on the edge of the tree line. Dreamer rolled his neck around, stretching. With little stuffing, it is easy for hooves to fit into your two leg shoes. And I look best in red. I decided not to waste more time. I'm Molly, sir. An elf competing in the trials. No, no. He interrupted. No? Here, we are named for what we do, not who we think we are. He pushed off a tree and floated over to the other side of the grove, where he pushed off a different tree. And right now, you are beggar. Well, okay, but I need a team of reindeer for me and my two friends. No, no. Still no? Introduce yourself again. I resisted the urge to groan and thought for a second. I'm a... I guess I'm a... Beggar? Very good. And I'm competing in the Santa Trials. I'm supposed to ask you to assign reindeer to me and my friends. And who are these friends? Celia Pixie and Ram Claus. No, no. Dreamer sounded frustrated. This time I caught up faster. Uh, I mean, thinker. And complainer. Why did they not come before me? We thought it would be better this way, so we wouldn't waste your time, your... Your Highness? They seemed to make him happy again. How many? Uh, eight. Three for each of them, and two for me. Only two? You believe we are less necessary? No, of course not. I love you all of you. Rangers are amazing and perfect, and I wish I had been born one instead of an elf, probably. But Crasher already said she'd help me. You dare to seek my reindeer without my approval? She didn't really give me a choice. I see. Dreamer floated up to a tree in the back of the grove with dog tags hanging off every branch. He used the branch of his right antler to pull a chag from the tree. He circled around the tree a few times, inspecting tags and choosing specific ones. Eventually, he dumped eight on the ground in front of me. I picked the perfect reindeer for you. His voice sounded very pleased, maybe even excited. I was so glad we were ending on good terms. They'll meet you when the competition starts, like all the others. Bring these tags to claim them. I nodded and put them all around my neck so I wouldn't lose them. Dreamer snorted and kicked his sled of legs, floating away and spinning like a wheel. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dreamer, sir. Farewell, beggar. Break a leg, as they say. I looked down at my socks and wriggled my toes. Thanks. He called you what? Celia started yelling as soon as I finished my story. 
I should have gone. I would have knocked those anthers right off his stuck-up head. That's exactly why I had to go. I finished my piece of protein peanut brittle. Because he totally would have. And then, he'd have no antlers, and we'd have no reindeer to team. Her frown cracked into a smile. Well, true. Then her smile grew into a wide grin. Do you want to see what I made? Is it our slays? I asked, even though I knew the answer. It is absolutely our slays. We high-fived, low-fived, and then back behind, back five. I glanced down at my hands, and they were all covered in black grease. Oh, sorry. Celia handed me a towel. I forgot to clean up. Engines, you know? Where's Ramp? I asked as I dried my fingers. Is he asleep again? I think he's at the cafeteria. Speaking of which, she tossed the tarp off at the first of three sleighs with a flourish that looked very cool. The sleigh was black and red, with a bunch of computer screens in front of the plush seat. I was planning to not try very hard in his, but it turns out I can only make things that are super awesome to curse. I laughed and looked around the sleigh while she explained it. So I focus on the fact that he's totally super old. Celia paused. He's 1000% super old, right? Well, for sure. Yeah, so I put all these big screens in front that will tell him everything he needs to know while he's driving in big letters so he can read them. The whole sleigh pretty much drives itself, but the autopilot takes so much power that I couldn't make it very fast. If he gets into a really dangerous situation, he can push that red button. I sat in the seat and pushed the red button, a green bubble wrapped all the way around the sleigh, lifting it off the ground. Right as the bubble started to roll sideways, I hit the button again and the sleigh thunked back to the ground. The engines don't work at all when the force field is on, but he can press it on and off to remain momentum and protect himself. There's an automatic setting for when you think multiple projectiles are about to hit, especially since this tech doesn't leave room for a strong engine. She saw me inching sideways over the next tarp. That one's yours. I gotta take the tarp off, though. I made a pouty face. We can do it together, she offered. Okay, but only if I get to wear it like a cape afterward. I grabbed hold of one corner, she grabbed the other, and we counted down from three and whipped off the tarp. It rippled in the air so beautifully, I forgot to look at the sleigh. That looks very silly, she said as I tied the tarp around my neck like a cape, and I wish it had been my idea. Tell me about the sleigh, I commanded, feeling like a king. She rolled her eyes and stepped up to it. My sleigh was mint green with shiny metal trim, cute, but compared to Ram's, it looked pretty simple. For yours, I focused on making everything really good. She ran her hand along the top. Comfy seats, sleek design. I made it out of very light material so it can propel itself pretty quickly. Here up front, there's a monitor that can show you everything that's happening in all directions, thanks to the cameras I hid in the sides. Plus, there's a headset to keep you connected with your reindeer at any slings you want to talk to, like mine. Hopefully the reindeer can handle most of the steering, but if you need it, there's a pretty effective manual option. And the best part, she clicked the button and a hatch opened on the front of the sleigh. A metal horse head slid out of the front and clicked into place. Its eyes stood up green and rotated around to look at me. Hello, Ollie. A pleasure to horse your acquaintance. No way! I put my hands on either side of the horse's neck and head and kissed her on the nose. I miss you, horse. Actually, now, she's H-O-R-S-E, Celia said. She's completely connected to every part of the sleigh and can answer any questions you have while you're flying. She's got protocols to protect you if things get really dangerous. There are a few other features too, which you probably won't even have to use. She'll tell you about it when you come up. I am programmed for over horse million potential high pressure situations. H-O-R-S-E, wind. Celia leaned against her sleigh, tugging on the tarp a little. I suddenly realized her sleigh looked a lot bigger than mine, like twice the size. The engine's the best part. You said horse was the best part. I lied. 
She whipped the tarp off her sleigh, before I got a chance to argue, and tied it around her neck like a cape. I'm the engine. Her sleigh was the opposite of mine in every way. Instead of small, sleek, and cute, it was huge and unpainted with pipes and gears sticking out in all places. The seat in front was barely a seat, and there was an opening where an elf could crawl directly into the sleigh and mess with the engine from the inside. Your sleigh has slots on the side I can hook my sleigh into. Yours has its own engine, of course, but most of your energy is devoted to being a good command center. My reindeer and I will probably connect to you at all time, but I'll mostly be doing active maintenance on this absolutely nusto and bonkers engine I built. It's very powerful and very awesome, but unstable. Well, that sounds dangerous. Why use it? Because it's crazy amazing and the coolest thing I ever made. No contest. You'll see when it's running. Are they gonna let us link it up there? Like that? Nothing in the letter said that two racers who happened to have parts that link up couldn't accidentally become one perfect sleigh. The letter also doesn't go on saying we can't have all the reindeer on one radio channel just in case something crazy and impossible happens. Crazy and impossible. That sounded about right. Chapter 7 Please speak into the microphone. Maria Duende had her smile plastered on big, and it looked even bigger on big screen. They can't hear you if you don't speak into the microphone. The camera switched over to Buzz, who was standing in front of a sleigh and trying to figure out what to do with his hands. For now, he had settled for putting one on his hip and one behind his head, like he was posing for a magazine. Is that, uh, is that this thing they put on my shirt? Buzz glanced between Maria and the camera, obviously uncomfortable. Yes, Maria had very white teeth. I think her smile actually gets bigger when she's unhappy, Celia whispered to me. When we realized Maria was looking for interviews, we decided to hide in the crowd to watch them on the big screen instead of being forced to talk about ourselves. A kid in a beige sweater turned around to hush hush us. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place from where. I'm a Buzz Brownie. Buzz was now forcing his chin down into a weird position to try to talk as directly into the microphone as possible. Is this better? Maria gave one quick, sharp laugh. It isn't worse. Tell us about your sleigh. Sure thing. The camera panned out to show that he was standing in front of a big metal machine at least twice his height. Buzz took a hand from behind his head and reached back to touch the sleigh, but was farther away from it than he realized and tripped. He caught himself in the sleigh and patted it twice like it was what he meant to do. My baby's got a 15 reindeer power engine, carbon fiber interior, suspension for days. You know about suspension? I know, please explain. It's super important, and I have a lot of it. I thought I saw Maria's eyes twitch. And could you tell me about these? She gestured to four huge wheels under her sleigh. These are circular treads of my own design, so it can cover more ground. And here in the back, the camera followed him as he ran his hand along the side to four big rocket boosters on the back. These will gather you off the ground in seconds. You've never seen a sleigh like this one, I can promise you that. I'm gonna win this competition, and none of those dorks are gonna stand in my way. He winked at the camera. That's great! Could you introduce us to your reindeer? Buzz frowned, breaking the pose he had been holding. Oh, I thought we were done. You'll know we're done when the red light turns off. Maria was already leading the camera to the front of the sleigh. A few members of the crowd laughed. I've got two reindeer. Buzz pointed to the front of his car, where two big reindeer dummies with painted on smiles were being held above the ground by wires connected to its grill. Their names are, uh, Paul, or, uh, uh, and, uh, Slayer. Slayer? Yep, Puller and Slayer, you've got it. He patted one in the head, and it bounced up and down its wire limply. Good strong names for a strong reindeer. I'm gonna win this competition, and none of those dorks are gonna stand in my way. He winked the camera again. It's still not done, Miss Brownie. I'm going to cut right to the chase. 
Maria made the face she always did when she was about to crack a story wide open. Celia groaned because she hates that face. How do you respond to comments that your sleigh is, in fact, a car? Buzz stared at her blankly. I don't understand. An anonymous expert recently said, and quote, It's got four wheels, a steering wheel, its own gas-powered engine, and the reindeer are fake. It even looks a lot like a jeep. How do you respond? I don't have anything to say, because it's a lie. They're not wheels, they're circular sleigh treads. One of the reindeer's ears split in the seam. Some stuffing fell out. See? You hurt Slayer's feelings. Buzz pushed at the camera that had come in really close to his face. I'm here to win, not to answer dumb questions. He ripped his microphone off and threw it on the ground. Maria quickly started saying something to the camera, but Buzz pushed her away and grabbed her microphone. Red light out! He winked again at the camera, which didn't stop rolling for another few seconds. These identify your starting positions. When we arrive at a corner specified in our emails, most of the other contestants were already huddled around a table. Mrs. Claus was speaking very quietly, like always, to force anyone listening into complete silence. You will bring your sleighs from the warehouse to the spot and wait for the starting signal. Your reindeer are already waiting. Santa will wait. Starting signal? Is this a race? It was Andrea, the girl who told me that Dreamer liked jokes. I need to warn her that whoever told her, she lied. I thought we were just being judged on our sleigh design. I didn't prepare for a race. Mrs. Claus gently smiled at her without opening her mouth, somehow looking very sweet, and also definitely telling her she wouldn't have interrupted. If your design is sound, it shouldn't be a problem. Speaking of design, it's time to talk about your next challenge. She raised her voice and turned her head to the side. Bring the car around, please. A limousine pulled up on the road behind us, and all the doors opened at once. Ten elves in very stylish suits and sunglasses stepped out and lined up in a neat row. Mrs. Claus parted the crowd and walked in front of them. These are the top ten ranking clothes designers in North Pole. Only the top 10 of you will continue past this competition, and each will be designed based on your place. That designer will help you with your next challenge, making your own big red suit. Yes! I yelled loudly, and I was the only one. Celia stifled a giggle, and everyone else turned and looked at me. Uh, sorry, I, uh... The more they stared at me, the more nervous I got. I ran out of words and just finished with a very quiet <sighs> Celia leaned over and whispered well now we have to go in because she was the only one who understood why I got so excited the designer at the end of the line pushed down her sunglasses and winked at me I recognized those eyes I recognized the suit I knew that pin she had been wearing to her teeth the North Pole's number one clothing designer or as I like to call her Mom. My nerves calmed down a lot even though my heart was pounding. We're gonna win now, I thought. It's meant to be. Mrs. Claus dismissed us, and the crowd started spreading. I left Celia for a second to catch up to Andrea. Hey, Andrea. She turned around and smiled at me. Oddy, right? Hi. A close. I did a little fake laugh, but was too nervous and focused to correct her. Hi, I just, uh, want to tell you... Someone lied to you about the jokes. Dreamer hated them. He almost made me leave right away. I put both hands on my cheeks to show how surprised I was then. She put both hands on her cheeks to show how surprised she was even right now. Oh my gosh. She knelt down and pulled me a big hug. I patted her on the back a couple of times because I wasn't sure what to do. I am so sorry. I didn't know. I, I can't believe that they... This is a huge surprise that I could never have protected, but it is my fault, and I am sorry. Uh, this is not much of a big deal, but thank you. No, no, it's a huge deal. I can't believe it. I could never forgive myself if I didn't make it up to you. Here. Andrea took her backpack off her shoulder and stuck her hand in with the pockets. 
A second later, she was clipping a button onto my shirt. It was bright yellow with a smiley face on it. This is for good luck in the race. My grandma back to an apple orchard always tell me, best way to make sure you have good luck in a race is to wear a button someone else gave you. So this is definitely makes up for it, right? I was confused. I've never heard that saying before. I don't think it's very real. And I probably shouldn't have given to you because now you're going to win. She zipped up her backpack and put it back on. Before I could say anything else, she was jogging away. See you later, Audi. It was great talking to you. Don't take that button off no matter what. I walked over to Celia, who was having a very energetic conversation with Bertrand. But how is that possible? She was asking him. The wish generator works as well as it does before because it's stuck in one place. How would wishes even know where to go? It actually works the other way around. As long as you know, in general, where the wishes are coming from, you can tune the sensor to pick up that area. Chris Kringle just found a way to have it find the wishes on its own. Bertrand looked very proud of himself. Celia obviously couldn't believe what he was saying. I still couldn't understand it. Bertrand nodded at me and adjusted his bow tie. Hello, Ollie. I was just telling Celia about the engine I built for the sleigh. He replicated the wish generator, Ollie, and made it portable. Celia was bubbling over excitement. As long as the driver is consistently making wishes, it should move at a pretty good speed. Bertrand fidgeted with his hands, which made him look unsure. But I thought this would be more bu about building and racing. It's a prototype, you see, and who cares about winning? Celia yelled loud enough that others in the crowd looked up. She lowered her voice back down. You've done something no one else has ever done, Bertrand. You reverse engineered a crinkle device. Your family has been working to make this happen for centuries. Well, they can keep trying. This is mine. And you walked away. Celia laid down on the concrete. If it was my choice, he'd win Santa right now. That's amazing. It's not your choice, though, and we should go and get ready. I grabbed her hand to pull her up, but she acted like dead weight. I can't. I'm too... Science! I hooked my arms beneath the arms and heaved her up. We have a race to win. I started pulling her in the direction we were headed, dragging her heels along the ground. Five minutes later, she said, I can't even believe how science I am right now. But I didn't need her to be science. I needed her to drive. Celia and I split into our assignment, staring positions, and made a plan to meet up on the track as soon as possible. I could see Buzz to my right, taking a nap while loud music blared out of his not sleigh, and Bertrand to my left, scribbling on a notepad. I couldn't see Celia at all, which made me nervous, but since our sleighs were linked by radio, I knew I'd be able to find her. I was trying to decide which direction Celia was in when I was hit in the chest by antlers. How's it going, Ollie? Crasher's voice piped out of the reindeer's voice box. She sniffed in my shirt. I already told him about how I'm going to get in charge of the team. So you don't have to worry. I'm the fastest, I told him. And they said, that's right. Well, Snoozer just snored, but he snored in a way that meant, that's right. <laughs> snoozer? I asked. Crasher nodded. That's Snoozer, and that's Truther. She pointed her antlers at the two reindeer already hitched up to my sleigh, one of whom was definitely asleep on his feet. The other had a hat made of tinfoil stuck in between her antlers. Christmas was invented by aliens, her voice box chimed. I figured this was Truther. Snoozer, wake up! Crasher yelled. Snoozer flew a few inches into the air and snorted loudly. Telephones are a lie. Truther didn't seem to be talking to anyone in particular, but she was staring directly at me without blinking. I definitely hadn't expected Crasher to be the reindeer I was least nervous about. The perfect reindeer, Dreamer had said. Maybe he did have a sense of humor. I took a deep breath and looked at the track. As far as I could see, the blinking red lights that lit up the snow and pointed at the path kept me separate from Betran and Buzz. It was just a straight line forward until it hit a hole in a huge block of ice 
jutting out from the ground. There was a hole for every contestant, from what I could tell, with no sign of what happened after you got inside. Hey Ollie, can you hear me? Celia's voice came to my earpiece. Loud and clear, I thought, then remembered I needed to talk out loud. Loud and clear! Great. Hopefully the track will let us in and link up after we get through whatever's going on with the iceberg. Do you remember that ever being there before? No, and I feel like we would have noticed an ice mountain. It's never been there before, Crasher interjected on her headset. Must have been set up last night. Right. Let's be careful. Do you see my sleigh popping up in your map? I look at my screens, but didn't see Celia's sleigh anywhere. No, I don't think my screens are working. Your screens aren't working? Celia, I don't think my screens are working and the sleigh broken. What do I do? Try turning the sleigh off and turning it back on. I was very embarrassed. Oh, uh, but that would be hard. Why? Because I haven't turned it on yet. I pushed the power button, and the screen started glowing. The map screen blinked with an O for Ollie, and a little horse, and a little ways away from that, a C for Celia. The hatch in the front opened the H-O-R-S-E, popped her head out. Horse morning, she said, as she powered up. Horse morning, I replied, grinning. Horse morning, a loud bang came over Celia's microphone. Cinnamon sticks! she swore. We gotta fix this. The countdown could start any second, so make sure you know how to use the sleigh. Horse can help you if you have any questions. Trumpets blared loud all around us. Snoozer flew awake again and slammed the truther, who pushed them back and mumbled something about how cats were going to take over the world. The trumpets stopped, and Santa's voice boomed around us. Contestants ready? I panicked. I hadn't really realized it would be this soon. Celia probably hadn't either. Could she hear him? Was her sleigh ready? Set! Okay, that's the steering wheel, and that's the gas pedal, and that's the... What is that? Horse! What is this thing? That is the horse. I suddenly realized a fatal flaw in her design. Wait. Horse! I need a helmet! The seat next to me flung itself open to reveal the helmet inside. I stuck it on and started tightening the strap. Go! Chapter 8 Slaves started flying forward, but I couldn't get the helmet strapped to click. Uh, Captain, I think we should- Safety first, Crasher! No one is safe, said Truther, not helping. I finally clicked the strap into place and slammed the gas. Crasher yelled out loud and flew ahead, tilting left and right to keep us steady between the blinking lights. My steering wheel could suggest movement, but the reindeer had the last call. I got started late! I yelled over my headset over the wind. I heard Celia laugh on the other end. That's okay, she said. I got started early. They held me back for a second. She sounded incredibly pumped up. The engine she was working on started whistling. I gotta fix this. Do you mind steering my sleigh? What? I looked up at Crasher, who was pulling us along the ice mountain. Horse neighed and turned to point her glowing eyes at me. Would you like the horse your steering wheel to steal your horse? How do I know? How do I know what to do? I can't see her sleigh! Suddenly, one of my screens that had been blank blinked on. I could see snow rushing by, an ice mountain up ahead, and three reindeer that I couldn't recognize. The leader had lightning bolts shaved over all of her fur, and her antlers were two more huge lightning bolts jutting out of her head. The other two had dyed their fur a bright red and a bright blue. Uh, Celia's reindeer, can you hear me? The lightning bolt reindeer flicked us here. Loud and clear! Her voice sounded tough and like she needed really to cough. She also had apparently chosen an English accent. What's your name? You sure this is the time? I feel bad for telling you what to do if I don't know your name. My name's Rocker. It's a slammer and jammer and we're about to get off the rails. See how you butted in. The engine's too powerful for them to steer on their own, Ollie. You can rotate the jets themselves to keep us focused forward. The jets? Nobody had said anything about jets. I'm so excited for you to see this thing. There was a harsh crack. If we make it that long, 
Gotta go! I told Horse to hook my steering wheel up to Celia's sleigh and told Crasher to keep us heading toward the ice wall. She yelled at Snoozer to wake up and Truther babbled something that I 1% ignored and I am not sorry about it. I grabbed the steering wheel with both hands and the screen shifted around on their own so that Celia's camera was right in front of me. It's just like a video game. It is basically exactly like a video game. Except for where we could get really hurt if we mess up. Don't focus on that, I yelled in my mind, as a part of me that was being negative. Don't you dare focus on that. You are too busy winning this video game. I could tell the sleigh was shifting too far to the right, so I steered to the left and jerked the sleigh so hard the reindeer got yanked by their harnesses. Watch it! All three reindeers yelled in unison. The other two had English accents too. Sorry! I made a mental note that the engine was way too powerful than I expected it to be. I could only safely use gentle movements. We're cutting up of the mountain, Captain! Crasher yelled. I glanced up from the screen and saw that her sleigh was much closer than Celia's somehow. I set hers to as close to straight as I could and asked Horse to shift my steering wheel back to me. Can you see anything, Captain? Crasher yelled. I squinted at the hole, but it was totally dark inside. Ugh, I tried to say, but I realized I had hit too nervous to call. This was the most high pressure of high pressure situations. Captain, she yelled again. I swallowed in a heavy lump in my throat. And suddenly, we were coming up on the hole in the ice mountain. And suddenly, we were in total dark, with only the screens lighting up my face. And suddenly, Celia was coming up on the hole in the ice mountain. Captain! I can't see! Crasher yelled. Should we slow down? Celia was in total dark, and her camera couldn't show me anything. Boss? Rocco rasped me. I swallowed, fighting the heavy lump again. Would you like the horse the lights on? Horse whined. Ollie, it's me! Celia came over the intercom, speaking quietly. You can do this. Both of our slaves have headlights. He just had to tell a horse to turn them on. I wanted to say, why did you do it? I wanted to say, you picked the wrong job for me. I can't talk when I'm nervous, and you know that. Why did you do this when you know that? Why didn't I mention this before I got out of control? I looked at the map, which is now covered in a big bunch of useless question marks and a note that said, where did this ice mountain come from? No data on this ice mountain, obviously, because there's no reason it should be here. Bet it's dark in there, huh? Sorry about that, wish I could help. Should have told me your map about this ice mountain. Maybe you'll think about that next time. Captain, if we hit a turn like this, we're going to crash. And not the good kind of crash. Headlights! I yelled. Horse's head whipped around, and her glowing eyes grew incredibly bright, illuminating an ice cave ahead of us. The screen that showed me Celia's reindeer lit up too. She had caught up, even gotten a little ahead of me, and we were both heading for a sharp turn. Celia steering! I yelled, graduating two words. Horse winning ascent, and I yanked the steering wheel, gripping and whipping her giant sleigh around the same time as the reindeer curved against the corner, scraping the side of her sleigh against the ice. Something cracked. Don't worry, I can fix that! Celia said over the headset, and I could hear the smile in her voice. She was right. I could do this. Crasher, watch out! I yelled, pushing three whole words over my lump in my throat. Steering to my sleigh! I called to the horse, beating my personal record and getting to four. I helped Crasher slide us around the corner. Both sleighs broke around the turn into a huge chasm of nothingness. In the distance, I saw two blinking red and green lights. I checked Celia's screen and saw the same thing in a slightly different place. I gave instruction to both teams. We had to fly. Aim for the lights. Rocker and Crasher both snorted at me. I blushed red because they were already flying. Horse had even automatically kicked us both into flight mode. I heard several loud clangs from Celia's microphone. I dropped my wrench. Don't worry. I brought an extra and it's even better, she said. I started with the worst wrench just in case the exact thing happened. I wasn't sure what made the wrench better or worse, but I figured this wasn't the time. As we flew through the dark space, 
I looked to my left and right and saw lots of slings flying all throughout the same expanse, lights blinking all the way down. Several blinked out, crossing through the opening on the other side. Some had probably made it through. Celia and I were behind almost all of them. No regrets, I thought. You put safety first. As we approached the blinking lights, our slates illuminated a big hole in between them. We landed hard on the ground inside, and for a brief moment, I was surprised and suspended in the air above my seat before crashing down and probably getting a bruise in my butt. I can see a light, I said, squinting at the end of the tunnel. I had to adjust our steering to keep us from hitting the walls and realize why the hole seemed so small. The walls are closing in, be careful! The reindeers all grunted and tightened their formations. The walls were rapidly closing in, and I asked Horse to change the volume buttons on the radio to let me switch between side controls, making it easier for me to adjust both. Your sleigh is so much bigger than mine, I said to Celia. How are you not already stuck? A rock fell from the ceiling and I slowed us down just enough that it would hit the ground before we got there. Maybe those holes were made for us. They could be different sizes. There were several loud pops and scrapes, and Celia yelped into the microphone. I caught something that fell off, but it is hot, hot, so ouch! Jeez! Okay, got it, Ollie. I don't think my sleigh is stable enough to get out of here. The engine keeps jumping all over places. These walls are already breaking apart around us. Several rocks fell past the camera. I have an idea, I said. Celia, when I ask you, can you cut the engine totally off? Would that stop the jumping? I see what you're saying, but for that to work, we'd have to be aligned perfectly before I did, and I'd have to rip something out to stop it that fast. We'll have to risk it. You hear that, Roger? Aye. What? Yes, means yes. Oh, perfect. Get ready. I don't think there's a lot more room for error. I worked together with Rocker to tilt the sleigh as best as we could toward the door. The clanging coming through the headset was getting deafening. Alignment at 96 horse and accuracy. Horse neighed. Not good enough. Sia's voice vibrated. They were bouncing a lot. 97 horse and... I shifted the steering ever so tightly and slightly and the reindeers lifted off the ground to pull in the direct center. 98 horse and... My ears were hurting in the noise. Crashers seemed to have my sleigh under control. This day is crazy. See, it was barely understandable. The thing wouldn't survive much longer. Ninety-nine horse and that had to do. See ya, go. I heard her growl as she tugged something out of the place, and suddenly the noise stopped. There was a steady screech as some part of the sleigh slid along the rock. I closed my fingers and toes and tongue. My sleigh slipped smoothly off the cliff, face, with no fanfare into a blinding white world of snow. Celia's broke through, but it tore a chunk of the cliff off when it fall. And then, it was falling. Horace automatically switched my sleigh into flight mode, and Crasher started pulling us along the line made by light suspended on little servo balloons. She couldn't access Celia's sleigh, though. Uh, Celia? I don't know if you can see this, but you're falling. Ollie, I know I'm falling. I can definitely feel it, and I'm trying to fix it. Okay, I know you're probably scared, but you really don't have to scream at me. I didn't even want to do this. It was Rocker this time, who was being pulled down by the sleigh. She pushed down and put a hoof on either side of the camera to look at me directly in the eye. And if we die right now, for some reason, I will haunt you so hard, you will never be able to believe it, mate. Mate? I giggled a little. What a weird word. Ollie! It was Celia again. I appreciate that you have learned to relax in stressful moments, but it seems like maybe, currently, you are too relaxed, if that makes sense, for this stressful moment. How can I help? You can't. I'm fixing it. But it would be nice if you would also yell, or panic, or something, so that I don't have to. I nodded, even though she couldn't see me, and cleared my throat. Ah, I said. Um, I am scared. Please help, Celia. I am very, uh, scared. 
I have a feeling that you can't do better than that. She was right. I needed to get into the mood. I imagined myself stuck inside the engine, surrounded by wires and metal and grease and trying to put something back after totally having pulled it. I imagined plummeting toward the ground. I imagined reindeer around yelling, yelling for help. I imagined that I was maybe going to hit the ground very, very hard. If we didn't do something right then, oh gee, Celia, we had to do something. What if we all get hurt? What if I don't make it? There was a click and a bang, and when a whirr, a Celia's engine kicked back on. I realized I had been screaming for several seconds. Oh, wow. Celia let out a deep breath and then started laughing. That was pretty nuts, huh? Yeah, pretty mixed nuts, I grinned and wiped off the sweat of my face. Nah, I don't think it was that bad. Probably some cashews. Okay, well, I don't understand what any of that meant, Rocker said as he tilted the sleigh to follow the downpour slope of the lights. But I decided I'm going to haunt the both of you no matter how I die now. Celia and I laughed. I looked at Crasher, who was focused really hard on guiding the sleigh. Thank you so much, Crasher. I thought, you know, with your name, well, I thought this would be a lot harder. Crasher glanced at me. Well, that's nice of you to say, Captain, but I was named for my landings. And speaking of which, we were coming up on the ground at a much steeper angle than I thought it would be. Ahead of us was a vast, wide track that all the paths were rooted to, the real race. I looked behind us and saw a few sleighs stuck at their holes, but ahead were several sleighs, some already so far ahead I could barely see them. Right. I took over steering so Crasher didn't have to handle it. Let's slow down and link up with Celia. You can take your time and be careful. Whatever you do, don't, uh, crash. Yeah, right. Rocker snorted over the headset. That's like saying Jammer not to be so sick on the drums. Ain't happening. I'll show you, Crasher yelled. I'm gonna be so careful you won't even know what to do about it. We all jostled and bumped our way into the ground. Crasher tripped over her own feet when we landed, but the other two reindeer squeezed in on either side to lift her back up. I guided both our sleighs gently toward the center, and Horace did the rest of the work. Celia's sleigh extended two metal rods that hooked into the side of mine and drew them close together so that they were tightly attached. The two cockpits even lined up perfectly with our doors sliding out of the way and connecting to one command center. Celia poked her head out from inside a giant. She grinned. Easy part's over. Now we just had to win. Win? We're really far behind. This engine hasn't even gotten started. Horse chimed in and whined. Coming up on a sleigh and two hundred horses! I glanced up and saw she was right. Up ahead was a shiny chrome sleigh, sleek and designed like it was from a movie about the future. Bertrand's sleigh. As we got closer, Horse connected my headset to Bertrand's using Sweet Tooth technology. Bertrand was out of breath and his voice sounded tired. For a giant rhinoceros with a second face on its nose, I wished for a dragon except it's nice. Not one of the mean ones I wished for. Ava Trend. I wish I could talk, Ollie, but if I don't stop wishing, then the sleigh will stop. I wish the sleigh wouldn't stop. In between every wish, the sleigh would work slow down until you finished saying the next one. It looked like hard work. I wish he didn't have to wish so much, I said. His sleigh put in a big burst of speed, jumped ahead of us, and then slowly fell back. Thanks, Ollie, but Trent sounded defeated as we swerved around him and started moving away. I wish you the best. Did you hear that, Celia? I asked, when we disconnected from him. The wish generator is powerful by wishes from all over. It makes sense that he, by himself, wouldn't be able to keep it up forever, especially since wishes are stronger when you really mean it. Horse wind. Horse twelve place! The map lipped up, showing elven dots ahead of me and with labels next to them with their names. The next one ahead of us was Sally, and I saw a brightly colored splotch in the distance, kicking up a cloud of snow. She's kind of far ahead. A piece of the engine popped off and hit me in the head. 
I caught it and tossed it to Celia, who stuck her hand out to grab it. Don't you need to put that back where it fell? Celia made a menung noise, which is a noise she makes when she shrugs. We do the best we can with the science we have. Do you have any, uh, nitro or anything? Nitro? No, Ollie, don't be silly. This isn't the movie. We have auxiliary gravity dampening ionic hyperspace vacuum thrusters. Right, of course. Celia kicked the AG-DIHVTs into gear and we all slammed forward by the force of four big green jets of flame shooting out from the back. If the reins didn't tightly and comfortably hold the reindeer up a heavy sleigh, we would have slammed right into them. We came up on Sally at a ridiculous speed, made record time, and the right as we were about to pass her, the jets popped off the back. Fire shot out and melted the snow, leaving a big, warm hole behind us. Celia poked her head out through an opening where one of the jet was, and we watched it die down together. Then I turned around and saw Sally Slay. The outside was painted in bright colors, like blocks, and had a covering shaped like a train with square wheels. The wheels were rotating a few inches above the treads, creating a cute, ornamental effect. Sally had her feet up on the dashboard and was flipping through a book. Just as our sleigh was about to creep past Sally's, steam chugged out at the top of a train and a loud horn blew. It put out a burst of speed and stayed just ahead. She flipped another page in the book, and her feet never left the dashboard. How are you doing that? I asked Horace, connected my headset to hers. Our sleigh caught up again, and our train did the same thing. The reindeer up from front looked bored. I got it set to my eleven pace, Sally replied. Eleven pace? Celia wiped some grease off her hands, but onto her face. Why? She doesn't want to win, I explained. I just want to make toys and cute things and fun stuff. Sally closed the book and put her hair up in a ponytail with a hair tie she had around her wrist. This way, it looks like I, ju I just tried, but just didn't make it to the next round. Dad will be disappointed, but he'll still have Kirk and Claus competing. Okay, well, you wanna win. Seeing I punched some buttons on the sleigh, cutting off my screen and adding more speed. You had to let us pass you. The train kept pace perfectly without Sally ever having to touch anything. Then you're going to have to help me get past two more people. I glanced at the map and saw three dots in the triangle ahead of us, Goldie, Frank, and Merrill. The triplets are next, I said. If we pass all three, then I'll be in the top ten, which can't happen. Sally patted a harpoon gun attached to the side of the train. I don't want to ruin your chances, but... I need to be in 11th place. If you push ahead past all three of them, I'll have to put you back. If you can figure out a way to separate two, I'll have to let you go. The three of us stuck together and powered forward, where the triplets were in the sleighs with legs? Thin metal legs. And their sleighs were gold, red, and brown pods. Each triplet had a reindeer sitting inside with them. The legs moved all three forward in unison with a repetitive leap that we slowly caught up to. The speed of Celia's sleigh was really amazing, especially when stabilized by mine. As long as we didn't get physically knocked out, it seemed likely we could catch up to the front of the pack. Horse tried to connect the triplets to my headset, but they denied us. Immediately, the three pods moved closer together and sealed over into perfect glass spears. The two on either side connected onto the middle one and rolled up to click together, creating an upside-down triangle. The orbs rotated individually so the top two triplets were facing us, and their leg pairs slid together to form two big robot arms. The hands clanged loudly as they snapped open and closed. I like the lock of this, Captain, Crasher said. That makes a pause for a second to count how many reindeer Sally had. Fourteen of us. I think it's pretty cool, Celia said. Okay, so thirteen. Yeah, I mean, it's scary, but I definitely would say that I like it, said Sally. Twelve, then. Slammer and Jammer said at the same time, Where can we get one of those? Okay, you know what? It doesn't really matter 
how many of us don't like the look of this? A tiny sling sped through behind and tried to slip us around. Sally's train started to react, but before it could, the triplets plucked the sleigh off the ground and whirled it around like a baseball, launching it back down the track from where it came from. A little elf I didn't recognize yelled and pushed the button to inflate a protective rubber bubble around the sleigh and its one little reindeer as they blasted off in the distance. We all stared at the triplets' machine. You can add me back on the list, Celia said. We slowed down enough to maintain a solid distance between us and the robot, which kept opening and closing its hands hungrily. Sally had picked up her book back up like it was the most boring thing in the world. What if we used your harpoon to pull one of them away from the others? I asked. Sally shook her head. I can only use it once, and I need it for emergencies. Emergencies like keeping us from getting ahead of you. Yeah, just like those. How'd you know? She flipped another page. I covered my eyes with my hands so I could focus, and also so that maybe Sally would feel bad for me since I looked sad. She didn't say anything and probably wasn't looking, but I did come up with a plan. Rocker, is it okay if I ride on your back? I asked. Celia looked at me like I was crazy because I was. Celia, you and Crasher will have to keep us moving. Sally, you go right, we'll go left. We might get ahead of them for a second. Go, go and easy on the harpoon, okay? Rocker said, aye, and I had horse disconnect her from the sleigh. She flew around to the side, and I climbed onto her back awkwardly. What's the plan, boss? Rocker asked. Celia steered our sleighs to the left, and Sally's train veered off to the right. The triplets orbed circles to look at them, and the arms reached out to grab them. Pulling against each other, though, they couldn't quite reach each other took a deep breath. Head straight for the middle. Go between the legs. You sure? I'm sure. Rocker leaned her head forward and kicked off in the air, propelling herself toward the triplet's machine. Lightning bolts first. I maneuvered my feet under me, so I was crouching on her back and clinging for dear life to her neck. The two triplets that had always been facing us were distracted by Celia and Sally, so no one noticed us when we slipped between the robot legs. As soon as Rocker and I got in from behind the engine, I jumped up and grabbed hold of the middle orb, grabbing and scrabbling to find something to hold on. Crikey! Rocker yelled. There wasn't really anything to grab, but the forward momentum and my constant wriggling kept me attached enough. Merrill was inside in overalls. He looked at me at my smushed up face and frowned. His reindeer, who was wearing a nose ring, stuck his tongue out at me. I saw Meryl push a lever back and forth, and the oar twisted and flew right quickly. I held on tight, making sure he totally blocked Meryl's view. He spun all the way around twice, which made me feel sick, but didn't throw me off. I've hacked to this map, Celia said into my earpiece. Inside, Meryl's screen had several question marks all around. It was messaged before me. Maybe next time you'll install a better firewall for me, huh? Perfect. Now he'll have no idea which she's facing. I could feel the robot wobbling around, trying to figure out which direction to go. The glass covering on the orb cracked open a bit, so I could hear Miriel yell, Get off of me, twerp! I'm sorry, I yelled back, but we are trying to win! I felt something grab my foot, hard, and start peeling me away from the machine. Rocker, hurry! Hit the legs! My hands made a loud squeaking noise as they slid down toward the glass. I was lifted into the air by the foot, my shirt falling over my smiley face button. Andrea gave me hitting gave me hitting me in the face. I pushed my shirt, trying to see, as soon as I got out of my way, I saw Rocker headbutt one of the knees, then whirl her back legs around and kick the other knee sideways. I guess the legs were flimsier than I look. Or Rocker was very strong because they buckled in two totally different directions and Meryl's orb came plummeting down. The two triplets disconnected and rolled their legs onto the ground, running they would never learned before. Meryl's orb was left behind, cracked and broken in the middle of the track. The hand that was holding me started to let go, so it moved into my leg. 
and I took the opportunity to grab it and start climbing toward the knee. I closed my eyes and held my breath while I rotated all the way around so I wouldn't throw up, then figured out which direction I was facing and climbed to the knee. I looked for a screw or something to pull out, but couldn't find anything that wasn't wielding together. I pulled myself up higher, very proud of my climbing skills, and got to where it attached the orb. There's a small little crack in the orb where the legs connected so they'd be able to move back and forth, which would be perfect to jam something into. I patted my left pockets. Nothing. I patted my right pockets. Nothing. I looked down my clothes and saw the button. Pulling a button off without ripping the shirt is already hard on its own, much less than with clinging to a swinging metal rod 30 feet in the air. I eventually got it unclipped, though, and waited until the leg was stretched out all the way forward. I jammed the button to the gap between the leg and yanked my finger away as possible. The leg swung back around, crushing the button. The button was just supposed to jam the leg, but when it crushed, it released an electric energy that shone bright blue. I felt a tingle running through my body, and the legs both shook and stopped moving altogether. The orb tipped forward, and it pushed off to the leg in the air. Help! 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 I yelled. Help! 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 The wind was knocked out of me when I landed, stomach first, across Rocky's back. I heard a crash, the second triplet fell. That was brutal, Rocker said. I tried not to worry about it because if I thought so much, I would feel bad. Also, I would feel bonkers for even trying that. <laughs> what did you do to the second one? I don't know, I said. I think that was my button. See you later, Celia. Ollie, catch! Sally yelled and threw something high up in the air. Rocker swooped over so I could catch it. It was a felt bag filled with beads. They're marbles, and there are a lot of them. They don't do much at the size, but get really big when you sing jingle bells. Thanks, Sally, Celia said. Rocker dropped me off at her sleigh and connected back to the formation. Good luck. Go east and my brothers. Celia grinned. No promises. I heard Sally laugh. Fair. Without arms to grab us, the other triplet was pretty easy to dodge around and push past. The lights along the side of the track started lifting off the ground, and we kicked into the flight mode before the ground dropped out. Horst, eighth place! Celia gasped. Whoa, Ollie, look down! I looked down and reeled back, scooting as far away from the edge as possible. That's a huge chasm, and it's thousands of deep feet, and we could fall and die, and why did you tell me to look down? People always say don't look down. I want it to be more interesting. When I stopped feeling my heartbeat trying to pop out of my eyes, I stood up and looked behind us. Frank, the remaining triplet, had moved the legs up above them where they were rotating like helicopter propellers and bobbing on her along the air. Horst, seventh place! Horst whined. Celia and I looked at each other confused. How do we do that? I asked. I don't know. I didn't see anyone. Celia was already climbing back into the engine to fix something else. Ramp's sleigh was next up, and we were going to fly past them pretty easily, but Horse automatically connected to the sleigh, and he yelled out, Now you wait! You wait for your best friend Ramp! I sighed and slowed the sleigh down, so we were flying right next to him. He was holding on his trophy with his hand and steering with the other. Uh, hi, Ramp. I'm hungry. I didn't, uh, I don't think we bought any. You built this thing. Where are the snacks? Well, I actually didn't find. I guess you don't have to help out your poor, hungry best friend, Ramp. I sighed. Do we have any snacks? Horse wind, and a compartment popped open. Powerful, happy organ chords came at the speaker as two big, delicious caramel covered popcorn balls were revealed. I was saving for those when you won, Celia said, but I guess you can have him. I took up one out, even though it didn't super, didn't want to through it, want to ramp, who caught it immediately, started tearing into it, sticky crumbs falling over his beard. Okay, we're uh, gonna go ramp, 
didn't stop eating long enough to make sense, so I turned up the space and be pushed away on the mast. Horst, sixth place! The next sleigh was most of an upside down top hat held aloft by a small army of birds tied to the brim. Two big ones, albatrosses, and then a wide variety of colors and shapes and in between them. The three reindeer at the front had huge animatric wings attached to their backs that were flapping as well. The elf inside, who, from what I could tell, was wearing a snazzy suit, tipped the top hat on her head to me. Ollie, what a delight! I hope your day has been as marvelous as mine. Gatsuks! Is that you? I didn't see you in the first challenge. That's me, Gatsuks Gremlin, at your service. She bowed as far as she could, which wasn't very far since the giant hat went up to her shoulders. Gatsuks wasn't really her name, but that's what she started calling herself when she decided she wanted to be a musician. Her father, Richard Gremlin, was in charge of Abiary. There are lots of Christmas birds, but everyone knows that partridges, turtle doves, French hens, you name it, Gadzooks learned how to make birds disappear, and the one thing led to another, and now she talks like a character from a fancy old movie, even though she's my age. I slowed down as we approached her hat. Do you have any scary tricks to keep us away? I asked. Like, are your birds going to peck out your eyes? Gadzooks and I were friends, but it wouldn't hurt to check just in case. It was a competition. Why no? I couldn't possibly imagine causing any hijinx. Here, have a candy bar. She tossed the candy bar over my sleigh, which I caught. Go on, take a bite. I knew exactly what it was going. There's a bird in here. Isn't there? A bird? How could you accuse me of such tomfoolery? I would never. Okay, but basically every time you hand me anything, there's a bird in it. Look at the candy bar. Look at the front and the back and the sides. Could that possibly fit a bird? I spun it around my hands. It looked like a perfectly normal candy bar, except the label on the front said it was from Not A Bird Incorporate, and the slogan under it said this is for sure not a bird. I opened the wrapper, and it was a real chocolate bar. Well, this is refreshing. I took a bite. It was delicious. Gadzooks started cackling. You fool! You fall from my trap once again, Sir Gnome. Bested once more by your friend and compatriot, good old Gadzooks. Huh? I took another bite of the chocolate. How did you beat me? You thought I was a bird, didn't you? And it wasn't. Not a single bird to be found. I don't feel bested, though. Now I've got chocolate. Tell me, how'd you feel after you looked under your hat? You mean my helmet? I reached my hand up and patted the top of my helmet where a top hat rested that wasn't there before. Oh. I lifted up a hat, and there was a dove underneath it. It flew around in a circle and it flew back to me and snuggled in my shirt. You've been bamboozled, Gadzooks cackled again. The dove cooed and nestled in to get warm. I looked back at my hand, and the hat had disappeared. If that's all, I think we are going to have to move on again. Absolutely. Keep your wits about you. The birds and I have stayed here because the vehicle up ahead is simply frightful. We'd come out nothing but feathers. She shook her head, looking very dramatic and sad. See you, Gadzooks. I bet your Santa suit would be amazing. Same to you, Ollie. Oh, and one last thing. She leaned over and whispered into my ear so it wouldn't go over the radio. When you get the chance, tell Celia to look behind her ear. Gadzooks winked at me and patted my sleigh as permission for us to go ahead. I cranked up our speed to push across the chasm. Horse fifth place, Horse announced. At the same time, Celia yelled, A wild turkey? How a wild turkey got behind my ear? The wild turkey attempted to explain with a series of loud gobbles as it glided away from the sleigh. I was starting to get exhausted and my arms hurt from climbing the triplet's roof. But I knew I couldn't slow down yet. 
We had to win, or at least we buzz. Chapter 9 The path had been curving back toward town ever since we started flying over the chasm, and it looked like we were going to be landing back on the ground soon. Up ahead was the biggest sleigh I'd ever seen, maybe even bigger than Buzz's. It was painted a dark green and had big, rotating cylinders attached to the front and the back that were covered in spikes. As we got closer, I saw the words, THE HARVESTER, spray-painted in big, angry letters. On my map screen, the sleigh was labeled Andrea. Up from eleven reindeer, all focused forward with serious expressions on their faces, but that might have been because they were scared of getting chomped up in the harvester's spikes. The width of the sleigh alone blocked off the track, and the squad of reindeer made it look even more difficult to get past her. She's nice though, right? I thought. She won't crush us to little bitty pieces. Rrrrg, the harvester said. It touched down on the snowy road and churned up a huge cloud of snow, completely obscuring itself and spraying a cold onslaught all over us. I kicked the sleigh into flight mode. Crasher flew us up pretty high and pushed into the cloud of snow. I couldn't even see the steering wheel in front of me. The harvester's noise was deafening. Crasher jerked the sleigh to the left, hard, and I grabbed onto the screen to keep me from falling. It wasn't the smartest idea, but it worked. One of those crunchy spiking things is waving up around here, Captain! Crasher swerved right, and a spinning spike cut through the cloud of smoke just in front of my nose. Crasher pulled us into a barrel road maneuver, which almost tossed me totally out of the sleigh. What's going on, Ollie? Celia yelled over the engine. This sleigh isn't supposed to go upside down! Andrea's voice came over my headset. I can't even tell you how sorry I am, Ollie, she said, sounding like she was talking about spilling something on the crouch and not almost killing us. I just need to find that button. Crasher pulled up to avoid the snarling spikes rolling by. Oh wait, here, I found it! Andrea must have pushed some kind of button because the noise got quieter and farther away. Crasher powered us forward, and I cranked the engine up as high as it could go. As soon as we broke into the noise cloud, we landed back down the ground. Thanks, Andrea, I said. Good luck on the rest of the race. There was another brief silence. Then she said, Hey, Crowley. There is no way she is not doing that on purpose, right? My name is, to be honest, I'm sure about, I'm sorry about that. A click and a beep from the other side of the mic. But nothing happened. What? I click again, and then the beep again. And then another click and a beep. Click, beep, click, beep, click, beep, click, beep. Why isn't it working? Her voice sounded a lot harsher than it usually did. Meaner. What do you mean? I asked. Are you not wearing the button? And suddenly, everything made sense. The jokes were a lie. The apology was a lie. The thing the button did to Goldie was supposed to happen to me. I was too mad to even think very hard about what I did next. I slowed down her sleigh to let her get right up on her tail so I could see the first of her reindeer. I pulled out Sally's bag of marbles and flung them all at once, hundreds of marbles slipping under the reindeer's feet and passed them into the spining spikes met the ground, and I sang jingle bells. The marbles, which were basically invisible before, all jumped up into regular-sized marbles. Jingle bells. What are you doing? Andrea sounded suspicious, and I ignored her. The marbles even grew bigger, like tennis balls. I saw a couple of reindeer stumble over them away. Jingle all the way. Beach balls now. I saw the first of them meet the spikers of the sleigh, and could hear the whirr get louder as it tried to push over them. Celia, who must have looked out to see what's going on, started singing with me. Slammer and Jammer made instrument sounds with their voice boxes, and Rocker started imp improvising vocals on the top. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse! Open! Slay! It took Rocker an extra few seconds to finish because she made a riff at the end. By then... Andrea's sleigh had been totally gummed up by marbles of different sizes, since I guess some of them didn't hear us as well. 
The biggest were two or three times my size, and they were heavy. They blocked the track, they broke her spikes, and they tripped her reindeer. Nobody was hurt, but she was totally stuck. When we sped away, My name is Ollie! I yelled, but we were already too far for her to hear. Horst, fourth place! Nice! Celia cheered. Shoot for the horse! Horse wind helpfully. Even if you miss, you'll land among the horse! I looked up at the map. Up next, it said Kurt, and very close behind Buzz and Klaus, tied for the first. Before I could ask Celia about strategy, we were coming up on mostly normal sleigh, led by five reindeer, with interesting haircuts and fox leather jackets. The back of their jackets and Kurt's, and treason for the season, with a picture of a reindeer in heavy makeup sticking out its tongue. Blimey! Rocker exclaimed over the chime of horse connecting to Kurt. Don't tell me he joined a terrible band. Just a big fan, Kurt said over the headset. Rocker looked down at the ground embarrassed. Especially their first album, obviously. The ranger didn't say anything. One of them flipped hair out of its eyes. Kurt took a candy stick out of its dashboard and stuck it into his mouth. Now they were riding alongside him. I saw that his sleigh was totally covered in stickers. A big one close to me said, Honk if you're jolly. Honk, I said cheerfully. Kurt looked at me blankly. You some kind of goose? I was immediately very embarrassed. You know, the sticker, I don't think we have an actual horn. He snorted and smirked. Oh right, I forgot. There are a lot of stickers. They were. While trying to look everywhere but at him, I noticed a big yellow triangle that said Baby New Year on board. He wasn't going very fast, and we could easily outpace him. Why wasn't he trying to catch up to Buzz and Klaus? You see that? He must have figured out I was wondering. He pointed at Buzz's sleigh, car, and Klaus's sleigh, which looked straight out of a Kris Kringle storybook. They were neck and neck and kept bumping into each other. They could have teared themselves apart. And we're all hitting top ten at this point. Why get in the middle of it? Because you're so close to winning, I said. Don't you want to beat them? Kurt shrugged. Nah, this is good enough. He reached over and patted down a sticker that was starting to peel off. My other car is a sleigh. Let's go, Ollie. Celia sounded exasperated. The finish line is coming up any second. Have fun! Kurt chomped down on his candy stick as I started speeding up our sleigh. See you at the race, Kurt, I said, still hoping that one day we'd be friends. He did a little two-finger wave as our radius disconnected. Horse third place! Claus and Buzz were already too close for comfort, and in the not-so-distant distance was a checkered finish banner stretched across the whole track. Seeing this, Celia pushed the speed lever all the way to the front, launching us like a rocket, as the two big sleighs. Celia, they're still slamming into each other, I shouted. I don't think they realize we're coming. They'll have to. The engine popped and banged. Or we'll all blow up, I guess. I stared at her, alarmed. I think I'm going to warn them we're coming. Don't. If you do that, they'll have time to. Horace connected me to their sleighs. Buzz, Klaus, we're coming straight you for you very, very fast. Please. Get out of the way, or Celia says we'll explode into a million tiny pieces, and then nobody will be Santa. Celia put her head in her hands. Now we don't have the element of surprise, and they're going to... The big sleigh split apart, away from the center, giving us lots of room to power through. We kept up our speed and barreled in between them. Nothing was between us and the finish line now. I took a deep breath. Celia stuck something back into the engine. Claw slammed to our left slide, and Buzz slammed to our right. I was knocked to the floor of the sleigh, then grabbed onto the screens and pulled myself up. Buzz looked out of his window and grinned down at me. Nice move, Dolly. We're gonna tear your sleigh apart. Celia frantically tried to catch pieces as they flew in the giant engine. Claus, meanwhile, didn't say anything to us. His eyes focused forward, and his foot taped on the floor of a sleigh like the whole world was moving slowly toward him. He pressed into Celia's side of the sleigh, and more pieces flew off the engine that she couldn't catch. Faster! He yelled as reindeer. My father didn't hand select you for me to lose! 
Can't you go any faster? Yikes, Crasher said. Double yikes. What are we going to do? I turned to my side, reached my arms up to the sedge of Buzz's window, and pulled myself into head first. He didn't push me out immediately, I think was confused about what I was going to do, and I flipped around to sit in the seat. Buzz is big, but I'm pretty tiny. It was easy to sit down next to him inside the car. I leaned my head against his arm, closed my eyes, and hummed. What? What are you doing, Dolly? I took a deep breath, enjoying his windshield blocking the wind from blasting in my face for a minute. I just figured I should get out of my sleigh if you're going to tear it to pieces, I said. And I also wanted to ask why you're so mean. Seiya's voice came over to my headset. I hope you know what you're doing, Ollie, because I sort of have my hands full over here. I took my earpiece out and moved my head from Buzz and rested it on the dashboard. Mean? He asked. What do you, uh, mean? I tried to be friends with you, but you're always ignoring the rules of the shop and bullying me and Celia and everybody with your mean crew. And you cheated in the first challenge. If I win this challenge, I get to do the next challenge with my actual, for real mom. But if you win the challenge and then win the trials, I'm going to have to move to Florida. After a second, he said, why? Because you'll make the whole North Pole a mean place, and I don't want to live in a mean place. Even a mean place where I was born, and my family lives, and my best friend lives. The North Pole should be for everybody, not just you and your squad of rude jerks. Buzz opened his glove box and handed me tissues wrapped up in the plastic. I used one to wipe off my eyes, another to blow my nose. Get out, he said, and reached over me and pushed open his door. I looked down with my puffy eyes and saw Celia working extra hard to keep the engine going. Claus is still gonna tear you to pieces, he added, looking away from me and fidgeting uncomfortably. So it doesn't really matter. Besides, if I won, I'd have to work for my mom. That's super lame. And also, she'd probably make my suit blow up or whatever. I laughed. She's too proud of her work to do that. But she might use a really itchy fabric. Yeah, see? And I've got sensitive skin, so... He looked up at the ceiling, and then at the chair next to him, and then at the window. Everywhere but at me. He tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. Get out, please. I put my headset back in. Would really like an update on what's going on, best friend, best buddy, best pal. Thanks, Buzz. This isn't over, Dolly. Maybe you can be nice. Okay, I didn't mean that. This part, right now, is over. So if you could, I swung out of the car and landed on the floor of my sleigh with a thud. Buzz moved out of the way and fell back a little to give us some breathing room. I steered us away from Klaus to stop scraping around but he kept pushing. It wouldn't work for long eventually. We'd run off the track. The finish line was close though. Horst, second place! Can you make it horse? Calculating! Calculating! Zero percent! Horse of success! She whinnied, then pulled up a helpful little animation of what would happen if we kept pushing forward. Either her engine would blow up completely, or we'd run off the track. Come on! Klaus yelled at his reindeer again. We should have one by now. This is ridiculous. I had an idea. Horse, do Claus's reindeer have headsets? Horse neighed affirmatively. Can you connect me to their leader, but not Claus? Instead of answering, she did it. I heard a chime as we were connected, and then heavy reindeer breathing. Uh, hi, this is Ollie, your race neighbor. What's your name? Prancer. The answer came quick. No nonsense. What do you want? Oh wow, a direct descendant of the original reindeer. They were usually reserved for sand slays. I just wanted to see how you're doing, I said. It seems like he's working you pretty hard. It's our job, Prancer said. Okay, but did you know that he's already qualified to make it to the next round? I asked. He Right now, he's basically only pushing you this hard for bragging rights. Klaus pulled the sleigh away briefly, then standed back into ours, 
jostling us and knocking a huge chunk of the engine. He's our commander. It's up to him. Yeah, sure, but if you were to keep him from blowing us up and he got second place, it wouldn't be a big deal. Santa is his father. I want to be on a sleigh team someday. I can't disobey a direct order. Faster! Klaus yelled, and I winced. Okay, then how about this? Celia and I are trying to be Santa too. If you don't disobey orders, but maybe act a little more tired than you are, we'll promise to put you on our sleigh team one day too. You can make it look like you're doing your best, and then you'll have tripled your chance to be on the sleigh team. I held my breath. Let this work. Let this work. Please let this work. A moment later, Klaus's sleigh started lagging behind us just a little. I took the opportunity to swerve us away from him. As we pulled ahead, I got a look at the reindeer. They were gorgeous. Tall, long-anthered, and strong. A traditional nine reindeer team with Prancer at the front. They even had bells attached to their reins, jingling and jangling. What? Klaus yelled. I heard Prancer respond to him. We're trying, Commander, but we're exhausted. We're doing our best, but you've had us flying full speed since the beginning. Thank you, I said and disconnected us. Our engine was crumbling to nothing, so Celia jumped onto my sleigh and slammed down on some buttons to shift all six reindeers to my sleigh. She disconnected hers, letting it tumble off it behind us. It burst into flames, and you both winced and looked away. What did you do? she asked. Talked. Our existing momentum kept us going, and the engine of my sleigh alone kept us from falling behind. Crasher pushed through the yellow tape of the finish line, and suddenly, we were in the center of an enormous cheering crowd. We won. Chapter 10 There was another month before the next challenge. We got another email explaining that we needed our suits to be prepared for anything, so we had until the beginning of November. We went to work. Part of work was being on TV. Celia didn't really enjoy it, so most of the time, I did interviews and events for both of us. We weren't the only ones either. Everybody was trying to convince the North Pole they should be Santa. Klaus even hired a whole campaign team. I never thought I'd get tired of seeing my own face on TV. Before this, the only time my face had been anywhere on screen was when the camera crews around big Christmas events would pan over the crowds. Actually, that's not true. I was also on the John Borton once during the Reindeer Games because I had painted my face with the colors of my favorite team, the Abominable Throwmen, when they were competing in the big game against the Grim Reavers. Now, Maria Duende had my face on the news every hour when she did her contestant countdown. She made all of us film catchphrases while a big computer animated banner with her name and rank flew by in the background. Ollie Gnome, number one. I'm here to make friends. I don't think of anything in a moment. Celia Pixie, number one. Here is actually just 15 seconds of uninterrupted glaring in the camera. Klaus, 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 number two. Wait, you're going to let Kurt plug his merchandise in the air? He's not even taking this seriously. I refuse to participate in something so ridiculous. And furthermore, Buzz Brownie, number three. I'm gonna win this competition and none of those dorks are gonna stand in my way. His heart didn't sound like it wasn't more, though. Klaus, Klaus, number four. Buy my shirt, if you like it. They said I don't care who wins on the font and Kurt for Santa on the back. Frank Fay, number six. My brother will be avenged. He didn't die or anything. She was just being dramatic. Gadzooks Gremlin, number seven. I'll make your chances disappear. Ram Claus, number eight. Is the light on? Am I supposed to talk now? Andre Claus, number nine. I came all the way to the big city to win, and I'm gonna do anything it takes. Tell me about it. In the big surprise, Sally Claus, number ten. You guys still have a chance, I guess. I never caught number five when it came on. I wasn't even sure who it was. Celia and I tied for first, 
which was awesome, but because we worked together, they punished us by giving both of us only one tailor, my mom. That freed up the number 10 spot, which pushed Sally, who had successfully stayed at number 11, into the running again. She was definitely not happy about it. The worst thing, though, was that Celia's feud with Maria apparently extended into the reporter's professional decisions. There was an entire segment analyzing whether or not we cheated in the race, and lots of live interviews with the Claus Claus fan club. Somehow, Maria had recorded a clip of Celia talking to Bertrand before the race, and instead of drawing attention to his invention, which would have been the nicest thing to do, she took the opportunity to call and to play Celia yelling, Who cares about winning? over and over with that context. Why do you think Celia Pixie would say such a thing and then go on and win the trial? Maria asked a man on the street with very shiny teeth and no eyebrows. I think, and this is just in my opinion, the man said, his teeth so bright they caused a lens flare, that she acted like she didn't care so everybody else wouldn't try as hard. That's not true! I yelled at the TV, but Maria Duende was nodding seriously. She said, I think you speak for most of us for that one, sir. Uh, well, it's just my opinion, but you heard it here first. Maria interrupted. Did Celia Pixie knowingly trick the competition, including our Santa's own beloved Betrand? Use the hashtag below to cast your vote. At the bottom of the screen, hashtag Tricky Pixie flashed on and and off on the bright letters. Celia clicked off the TV from behind me. I'm tired of hearing her voice. My mom called over from the other side of her office, through teeth clamped around bobbin pins. We need to focus anyway. Bring your sister over here so we can use her head. I picked up Polly, who had been waiting and watching for TV for me, and walked her to my mom. Why do you... I always had to be a model, she whined. Because you've got a big head, I teased. She stuck her tongue out at me. Let's talk about clothes. My mom spread out some sketches and designs on a table in front of us, along with a pile of blank sheets of grid paper. Ollie already knows a lot of this. The sign is one of his strong suits. Celia groaned at the pun. I giggled. As you know, there are two major parts of fashion. Form, which is basically looks, and function, which is what the outfit can do. My mom gestured to Celia's clothes, a lab coat and goggles over a green shirt tugged into cargo pants that were a slightly different green. Celia needs help with the form, while Ollie, she turned to me. I was wearing striped tights and shiny wooden shoes under a long blue tunic. It was very adorable. Ollie doesn't even have any pockets, I blushed. Plus, those shoes will hurt his feet if he's not careful. He's got a blister, Polly added. He told me. I put my hand over her mouth until she licked it to let me go. Why does it matter how our suits look? Celia asked. It's just like all this wasted time on TV. We just need to win the challenges. Why should we care what anyone thinks of us? Mom explained. People want to feel included. Nobody is forced to listen to Santa. They do their jobs because they believe. Talking to them, showing them who you are, helps them believe in you. Celia gestured to her outfit. This is who I am. Dressing like Ollie would be lying. Mom shook her head. You won't be like Ollie. I'm not trying to change you. Just bring out the best version of you. Celia frowned, but didn't have an immediate comeback. I was already distracted looking through the sketches Mom had drawn up. I'm thinking something with golden leaf. I began. I have to be a gentle with it so it doesn't crack, obviously. But, or, ooh! What about a suit that changes colors based on my mood? Teaching it to recognize emotions would take a lot of time, but it would be so dramatic. Or what if it had huge feathered wings on the back, like twice my size? That would be impressive. This is why it's lucky you're working together. My mom handed back us pencils and blank sheets of gridded paper. I'm going to help you design each other's suits. Celia and I looked at each other and thought of this. 
I had to admit, this is a good idea. Celia frowns. It's a very good idea. That's why I'm the best. Mom tapped her fingernails on the paper. Get to work. I started scribbling furiously. Making something for my friend was a lot more exciting than making something for myself, but it was a much more difficult challenge. I had to consider what Celia would like, but also something that showed my strengths too. But mom, Celia is a scientist, a genius scientist. I was having lots of ideas, but none of them seemed good enough. How am I to make something for her that's any better than what she can make for herself? She ruffled my hair and pulled up a chair next to me. She shuffled some of my papers around and pointed at the doodles. Basically a suit of armor with a Santa hat on top. That idea was stupid, it's too bulky. No idea is stupid. She ripped the picture out of the paper and said to me next to another lap of doodles I had drawn the moment of frustration. Just a laptop strapped to Celia's head like a hat. That was even worse. I drew it like a joke. Mom read that one too and set both of the designs next to a third design. I had covered an entire Santa suit in pockets like Celia's cargo shorts. It would probably just make her look like a toad though. That one's ugly and just having pockets isn't very useful. She set all three of my designs beside each other and pointed. Why did you make each of this? Uh, I made the armor because I know Celia would want something to be protective, and the reason she likes cargo shorts is so she can put her gadgets in all her pockets. One time she told me I like to have the best tool for the job so I make sure I always have every tool. That's why I made the pocket design. The computer one was really just a joke because, wait a second. I cut myself off and pulled a new sheet of paper over next to those three designs. So it needs to be tough, of course, and it needs to have places for all serious things, but that doesn't necessarily have to be pockets, right? My mom's smile grew big. What are you thinking? Armor, but not like a full-size armor, more like body-sized, with gadgets built in it. And maybe a computer that lets her use all the different tricks, like a, a superhero suit. I started sketching out the ideas. If the gadgets are part of the armor, then it doesn't need pockets, and I can just make it look 100% so very amazing. Mom clapped me on the shoulder and kissed the top of my head. You got it. Get some designs together, and let's get started. Even with the most whole month, I felt rushed. Celia and I had to make balance, making these suits, doing public appearances, and working at the games and puzzles departments. Our workload was a little smaller than normal because everyone knew we were competing, but Christmas couldn't be put on hold. But at last week, everything was running together. I accidentally made a big red suit for a superhero action figure, showed up for an interview on NPNN, half-dressed, and kept checking to make sure my mic was on when my dad asked me what I wanted for breakfast. We had to keep our design secret for each other, which was having fun. Celia in particular was very nervous about what I was making and kept trying to find excuses to sneak into my room like, I just need to borrow some of my stuffed animals. I peeked through a very slim crack in the door. Oh really? No other reason? She shrugged. I'm kind of bored sleeping with mine, and you have so many. Which one do you want? She paused. Uh, my favorite is the leopard. Or if not the leopard, then maybe the snow leopard. Great, I'll just get it out for you. I tossed the snow leopard out. It landed with a squeak and shut the door. I was nervous too, but if mom was coaching Celia as much as she was coaching me, then everything would be fine. She kept crossing out my sketches in red pen and writing things like unnecessary or cute, but you can do better. Seeing all those red lines could be tough, but I knew she was trying to help me, so I listened. When we had finally finished, Celia and I presented to the living room with my mom, dad, and Polly as our audience. I went first. For Celia's big red suit, I've gone pretty non-traditional. Other than the hat, the only thing I've kept from the original Santa design is the color scheme. I ripped the sheet off the mannequin with a flourish, presenting the red and white suit I built. The base is a very tough fabric, the same kind of thing in our suits from the first challenge, but it's bulkier because I've modified it a lot. 
There's a lot of stuff going on, but I'll focus on the major points. I took the gloves with the mannequin and put them on my hands. Everything the suit does is activated by specific hand gestures I can show you. I waved my hand like I was fanning myself, and a soft whirring noise came from my suit, like a fan. I put my hands on my shoulders, like I was shivering, and the whirring noise shifted to a low vibrating sound. It's got air conditioning, so you'll never be too hot or too cold. I pushed my palms down toward the ground like I was imitating a penguin. Super concentrated air shot at the armholes and leg holes of the suit and lifted the mannequin off the ground. I tilted my hands and the mannequin shifted forward and back, then I gently lowered the hands flat against my legs and it gently sealed, settled to the ground. Everybody clapped. And now, Polly, could you get the lights? She crossed her arms. I don't want to. Polly, why do you have to be so three all the time? My dad shook his head. You can get a light yourself, Polly. You're already standing up. But it'll have ruined the moment. I could get a light. Celia offered. No, Celia, let Ollie do it. He shouldn't order his sister around like that. I groaned and trudged all the way across the living room to flip the light switch. Then I twisted my left hand like I was screwing in a light bulb, and the whole room lit up with bright white light. The lining of the suit, all the white parts, including the gloves and the ball at the end of the hat, were lit up. I twisted my hand back and forth to show that I could dim and brighten the light however I wanted. I flicked the light switch back on. The hat you can be pulled over your head and tied in to be used in the air filter in case you get somewhere with dangerous air and it's got its own oxygen. In case you end up in underwater, you can tighten it as a seal around your neck. That's all the big stuff. Celia was already up and expecting it. There isn't any room for carrying extra stuff, though. This small pack attached to the back can build small tools for you on the fly. For example, if you need a hammer, I made the hammering motion with my left hand and reached around the back of the suit where a hammer was moving out of the hole on the top. I pushed it back and on the side then did the same thing with the screwdriver twist. It only has enough material to make one, or maybe two at a time, but it can handle most of the stuff you can carry, and need. That way, you won't have to keep track of where everything is. Celia nodded. Also, my turn! She tossed a sheet off the mannequin as well, revealing a skin-tight black bodysuit, like a diver suit, with a red belt around the middle of a hat on the top. That was it. Honestly, this one might be the best, if just show you how it works. She unclipped the belt and wrapped it around her waist. The bodysuit is there for protection, but this is the real suit. She pressed the buckle and struck a pose like she was ballroom dancing. The red fabric of the belt billed down and stretched, wrapping around her clothes like a red gown. She shifted like she was punching and the rev shifted and shrunk into a tighter fitting tank top and shorts, like for exercising. The poses help, but they aren't as technically necessary. The suit picks up on what you're visualizing and changes to look like whatever you want. It can be almost anything you can imagine, as long as the thing is connected to your body. She shifted through a few more forms. The suit could even change your shoes. It can expand to way bigger than it looks, but there's a limit, so don't go too crazy. Does everything always have to be this one shade of red? I asked, poking through the stitchy fabric. Celia grins. I knew you would ask. She furred her brow with intense focus, and a ripple of blue spread through the suit from her neck until the whole outfit had changed color. She shifted it to green then the yellow, then a cheetah print. It has light upsetting too. I saw her shed focus again, and the suit glowed with a dim light. My mouth fell open. How does it do that? Nanobots. A little receiver that interprets your thoughts. Basic function stuff. Fun fashion stuff. Oh, so now you're a big time fashion expert, huh? He shrugged. It turns out fashion is basically science. My parents both clapped, but quietly, because Polly had fallen asleep in my dad's lap. You did an amazing job. These suits are some of the best things I've ever seen, 
and I've been in the business for a long time. Your transforming outfit might put me a job. <laughs> she winked at Celia. For me now, though, it's late. I need to rest. My dad picked Polly up and gave me Celia a hug. Good luck, kiddos. Celia unclipped her belt and put it back to the mannequin. I took off my gloves and did the same. We stared at our suits with our parents went to bed. I can't believe the trial is tomorrow, Celia said finally. What do you think it is? I don't know, but I don't need to. I wiggled the mannequin's fingers and made the suit light up again. I just know we're gonna win. Chapter 11 The next trial wasn't actually just one trial. It was seven, one for every day of the week. On the first day, the eleven remaining contestants all crammed into one of the workshop's conference rooms. An elf passed out a paper with all the challenges we'd have to endure using our big red suits. The Santa Trials Christmas Marathon Spectacular. Day 1. The Amazing Chimney Race. Day 2. The Old Gingerbread House. Day 3. Cookies and milk and cookies and milk and cookies and milk and milk and cookies. Day 4. North Pole Idol. Day 5. Reindeer Rodeo. Day 6. Next Stop Nutcracker. Day 7. Head Mister and Snow Missers Around the World in 80 Minutes. This was an overwhelming amount of information. Was the cookies won an eating challenge? What would we do in the rodeo? North Pole Idol sounded fun though. And so did the one in the gingerbread houses. And the last one? What did that even mean? This is ridiculous. Klaus had his feet propped up on one of the conference tables. His suit looked the most like a traditional Kris Kringle outfit, except for the shoes, which had little heels to make him seem taller than he actually was. Singing? Dancing? What does this have to do with being Santa? What's the problem, bro? Kurt was leaning against the wall in his normal clothes, all black, with one of his I don't care who wins shirts. The back of his leather jacket said, This is my big red suit. He did a few body rolls in Claus's direction. Don't got the moves? This is not about my moves. It's about how this whole circus is ridiculous. Ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Sally crossed her arms and kicked Claus's chair so he had to quickly adjust to keep from falling on the ground. Do you hear yourself? Her big red suit looked like it was nothing more than dirty red cloth lazily stitched together. She was still lying to lose. I just don't think my moves have anything to do with the ability to lead the city. Well, I'm all for it. Ramp's grummy voice came from across the table. He looked like an old Timmy prospector with suspenders hiking his pants up to his chest and a wide-brimmed hat. A small fan dangled from his brim and blew on his face. I know all about hip-hop dances, like the Foxtrot, or the Charleston, or the Electric Slide, and I've got my eye on those cookies. A kid about my age wearing a beige sweater over his red bag suit nudged me. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place from where. How I have never seen him before. Ramp, is it really old, right, Ollie? The kid whispered to me. It seems like it's definitely really old. How does he know my name? Oh gosh, uh, I don't have any idea who he is, but I guess he's a competitor? Gotta play it cool. Oh uh, yeah, pal. I whispered back. So far so good. I think that's probably true, and I... Uh, also, I totally know your name. Mayday, mayday. That's a relief. The kid smiled and patted my shoulder. Nobody else seems to remember me. Maria said I wasn't a good enough character, whatever that means, so she didn't put me on TV at all. When he shifted in his chair, Celia leaned back over my shoulder on the other side. Who was that? I shrugged. I guess we can't keep track of everybody. The elf cleared his throat. Mm. Now, if you'll please wait here, there's someone who wishes to speak to you. He'll be here shortly. The elf left, 
and eleven of us sat in silence, looking around at each other awkwardly. Kurt broke the silence by saying something to Sally, Andrea said something to Klaus, and then Celia started talking to Buzz. Gudzooks walked over and pointed at my shirt. How gracious of you to keep track of my little friend. Gudzooks bowed his, his head. A dove wriggled out of my collar and flapped onto Gudzooks' fingers. That, that's the bird from the race. I blinked at it. That's the one that was in my shirt the whole time. Quite a long time, in fact. Gudzooks grinned at me with all her teeth. She lifted her top hat, which was covered in puffballs to match the rest of her big red suit, and the dove flew into it, disappearing completely. But it couldn't have been there. I haven't seen it for weeks. Gudzooks lifted both palms up and shook her head. I don't know what to tell you, my friend. He's been there since the race. This isn't even the same shirt! But she was already walking away. Behind her, I noticed Frank Fay in the corner with no one to talk to. It must be too hard to lose both your brothers. Hey, Frank! I started to lift out of the chair, but I pushed my feet off the wrong and just ended up spinning it around in a circle. My feet were too short to reach the floor, so I couldn't stop it and just put myself down onto the floor. I felt too embarrassed to stand up, so I rolled the rest of the way to the corner. I stared up at Frank. Hey, uh, I want to apologize for uh, knocking your brothers out of the race. Don't he'll worry about it, she said, like it was all one word. You did us a favor. I pushed up once on my arms and tilted my head. What do you mean? We wouldn't have to fight each other for the point, you know. You saved me. We're having to punch him in the butt. In the butt? Right in the butt. She punched in the air to demonstrate. Just like that. Oh. She scratched a big red rash on her neck. The suits itched me all over. You got any lotion or anything? Her suit was shiny, like it was made of plastic. But then, there was also patches that looked scratchy, like wool. Not a comfortable combination. I shook my head. Sorry. Don't even worry about it. The door to the conference room opened and Santa walked in. For the first time ever, a room with a Santa in it got quieter. Usually people cheer or he's having to walk and talk for Christmas or he's doing inspections of the workshop or something, anything. But instead, he stood in silence while everyone shifted uncomfortably and stared at him. This was the first time I'd seen him ever since the competition started and was with all the ten other competitors. Everything felt really real, really fast. We even dressed like him. This was very weird. Klaus broke the silence first. This is ridiculous. You know that, right? You look ridiculous. And you know this is ridiculous. Santa looked very tired. He smiled at Klaus anyway. Trust me, son. There's a reason for anything. Really. Please. Tell me the reason. You had to work us for weeks on suits just to make us dance like wind-up toys for the public. Sally put a hand on his shoulder. Klaus, this isn't time. He swatted her hand away and stared right at her father. No. I mean it. Is this some kind of game to you? Do you really hate me this much? Santa winced. Sally stepped forward in front of Klaus. I saw most of the other competitors pretend the floor was suddenly really interesting but I couldn't look away. Klaus, I'm serious, Sally said. This is a conversation for the family. Yeah, fine, you're right. I shouldn't have left for you. He stepped around her and got up in Santa's face. I had never seen anyone angry with Santa, and not like this. Sally doesn't even want to be here, Dad. She feels forced to do this because she doesn't want to hurt your feelings. Santa scratched his beard and looked at Sally, who was staring at the ceiling. Is this true? He asked. No, it's... His claws interrupted again. It's true. You don't know how I feel, Claus. Kurt finally stepped in. Bro, chill. He pulled the candy stick out of his pack on his sleeve and offered it to Claus. Here. Claus took it and crunched it around angrily. It didn't seem to help his mood, 
but at least he stopped interrupting Sally. She said, I just want to make things, Dad. I like toys. I like the workshop and the Alps. Santa stepped closer to her. But you'd be so good at it. Sally's eyes flipped to the ground, and she sighed like she'd heard it a million times. Yeah, maybe, but so what? She finally worked up the courage to look at Santa's eyes. I don't want to do it. Can that be enough? Santa tugged his beard and looked at her with his stern eyes. Everybody held their breath. He stepped forward, held his arms out, and pulled her into a huge hug. Something in his suit beeped, and he pushed away very quickly and reached inside. One second, his hand rummaged around until something beeped again. Smoke bombs would have ruined the moment. Sally laughed and pulled her dad in another hug. You already ruined the moment, Dad. Celia leaned over to me and whispered, Should we have put smoke bombs in our suits? I whispered, Shh, shh, I'm watching them hug. She swatted my hands. Stop biting your fingernails. I put my hands in my pockets and tried not to get all teary again. Well, what about Kurt? Klaus had finally finished his candy stick. He doesn't care either. He just doing so to bother me. Literally everything in his suit was built to counteract mine. I look at Kurt again. It didn't even look like he was wearing a suit. Kurt must have had a better designer than I realized. Is that true? Santa asked. Kurt shrugged. Yeah. Well, that's very funny. And I completely support it. What? Klaus yelled. Santa sighed. I'm kidding, son. I... He looked around all of all of us, then opened his mouth to continue. Klaus didn't let him. Again, do you hate me? Do you really think I can't do this? Santa's eyes cut down the side like he was thinking, but also a little sad. This as this is a good time to say as any, I guess. Celia and I looked at each other. Time for what? Does he really not think Klaus can do it? Every single one of you will be a great Santa, even you, Klaus. I think you're a natural leader, and you work harder than I ever have. Klaus threw up his hands. That's why Santa looked at him like a dad does, and Klaus got quiet. I didn't think on the trials because I don't think you could be Santa Claus. I did it because I shouldn't have been. That got everyone's attention. What? I'm not a good Santa. I don't even like the job. I wish you had felt comfortably telling me sooner, Sally. I, I wouldn't have forced this on you. Being Santa is tough work. You know what I love? Sleighs. I love flying and racing and working with the reindeer. The night before Christmas is amazing. But the rest of it? The planning and the meetings and all the paperwork? So much paperwork! He took off his hat and wiped some sweat off his brow. Mrs. Claus has been doing most of that, honestly. She has a knack for it. I ever had. And it's not fair to her, because she has her own things to do. He stared at the floor for a second, then looked at Claus right in the eyes. My name isn't Santa. It's just Matt. And it should have stayed Matt. Everyone was dead silent. There was nothing to say. Santa took off his little round spectacles for a moment to wipe his eyes. So that's a warning for all of you. Being Santa is tough. There's a lot of more to think. It's a heavy stocking cap for one head. He laughed a little. It needs to go to the person most qualified. Maybe that's you, Klaus. But if it isn't, and someone else in this room is better for the job, isn't it best for the North Pole, for Christmas, that they become Santa? Klaus didn't answer. He stared at Santa's, Matt's, feet. Santa walked over and hugged him around the shoulders, but Klaus didn't move. Santa cleared his throat and looked at each other in the eye, one at a time. Anyway, I came here to tell all of you that every challenge this week is going to push you to your limits. Like my letter said, be prepared for anything. Let's go, Sally. He fist bumped with Kurt, 
then walked to the door, held open for him to buy serious-looking elf man. I'm excited to see what happens, and I'm excited to meet the next Santa, whether they're Santa Claus, or Santa Gremlin, or Pixie, or Brownie, or Faye, or Gnome. I got chills when he said my last name. Celia reached over and squeezed my hand. Sally waved as the door shut behind Santa. The whole room felt like it was full of jelly that nobody wanted to move through. The boy in the beige sweater, whose name I didn't remember, and who I didn't know, was standing right next to me, said, I guess even Santa forgot my name, huh? At least her friends, Ollie. This is a horrible nightmare situation that I will never be able to fix. Yeah, totally. Klaus looked around all of us. This doesn't change anything. I'm still going to win. Buzz snorted. I'll believe it when I see it, Claus. Looking around the room made me nervous. Everyone was so smart, and so tough and talented. Santa's voice kept ringing in my ears. My name is Ollie, I thought. Is it going to stay that way? Chapter 12 Day 1 the Amazing Chimney Race The challenges were all held in the Reindeer Game Stadium and Spa Resort, all in our big red suits. The ten of us gathered on the field. Ahead of us were two straight lines of big, featureless gray boxes of chimneys of different sizes and shapes poking out of the tops. Rudolph was waiting for us when we arrived. Since Celia and I had been first in the sleigh race, he made us team captains. I'll take Buzz, Celia started. Uh, Kurt, I said. Gadzooks, Ramp, Frank, Klaus, Andrea. That leaves me, the boy in the beige sweater walked cheerfully over my team. What a good group. Klaus rolled his eyes. Kurt rolled his eyes and made a goofy face to make fun of him. Klaus started rolling his eyes again, and Kurt mimicked him again, this time rolling his whole body at the same time as his eyes. Klaus almost rolled his eyes at that, but caught himself and just grumbled. Rudolph shone his nose as bright as it would go, getting our attention. Each of you wannabes will pick one of the chimneys, Rudolph explained in a robotic drone. Each chimney has a different challenge, and at the end of the chimney is a room with a tree. Press the button under the tree, and a buzzer will sound, signalizing your next teammate to drop down theirs. One of the members of the losing team will be randomly chosen and eliminated from the competition. Understood? Randomly? Celia scrunched up her face at Rudolph, which was very brave because he was terrifying. Are you serious? That's not fair. He swiveled his dark eyes at her. Are you questioning my challenge, Pixie? Celia huffed but didn't say anything else. We all split up and picked our chimneys. Celia and I both chose the last box in our line with a simple red brick chimney on the top. The rest of our teammates took their places along the line. The start buzzer sounded. Buzz and Kurt jumped down their black metal cylinders. There was a loud clanging as they went down, and a huge cloud of soot fell over. A few more seconds of clanging, and then a steady stream of smoke started coming out of the top. Fire? I thought. Are they banging or setting on fire? Buzz's box lit up, and the buzzer sounded, sending Gadzooks down her chimney. Ramp was still waiting for Kurt, and I started to get worried as the smoke churned on the top. Buzz shimmed out of its chimney and fell on top of the gray box, gasping for breath and covered in soot. Kurt's buzzer sounded. Phew. Ramp jumped down into his chimney, a wide, clear one. There was a loud splash, and its chimney sealed close at the top. The entire gray box turned over sideways, the like guy saw had already happened on Celia's side, and the clear chimney filled up the water. Can Ramp even swim? I thought. Apparently, he could swim even better than Gadzooks. Their two boxes lit up and buzzed within seconds of each other. Frank and the boy with the beige sweater were next. Each of their boxes had two very long chimneys, they had already climbed on top of. They both jumped in, and a moment later, the boxes shook, rolled over, and stood up on their chimneys. Using the chimneys as legs, 
the boxes ran around the field in a way that didn't seem to follow any particular pattern. They even crashed into each other a few times, fell on their backs like toddlers, then wobbled back up and started running again. I looked over to Ramp and Gatsuks, who were sliding out of their clear chimneys, followed by a rush of water. They were both soaking wet, and Ramp had a little crab wearing a sea captain's hat clamped onto his nose. Off! Off! Get off, you! Ramp jumped around and finally knocked the crab off. The crab picked its hat off the ground and scurried back up the cube and into the chimney. Frank's cube buzzed and lit up. It flopped over on the ground and wiggled its chimney legs in a little dance. The other cube ran around it in a few circles for a few more laps and then buzzed and lit up. It flopped over on the ground and danced too. Klaus dropped down into his yellow chimney a few seconds after Andrea. I waited for a few seconds, but there was no sound. There was no movement. Nothing happened for the first five minutes. Or the next ten minutes. Or the next two hours. Finally, Andrea's box buzzed and she climbed out quietly. She sat down on the top of the gray box and leaned against the chimney. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Klaus still wasn't finished, but Celia didn't go down her chimney yet. What are you doing? Frank yelled at her. Get in there! Celia acted like she didn't hear him. She winked at me. We stood there for another ten minutes while Celia's team yelled for her to hurry up. She just yawned. Finally, Klaus's buzzer sounded and he climbed out of the chimney quietly, just like Andrea had. He looked very, very tired. I looked over at Celia, and she held up the three fingers. Three, two, one. We jumped into the chimney, and didn't fall. My eyes were still peeking out over the top. Celia shrugged with her eyebrows, and then I saw her head disappear, so I looked down and crouched too. The chimney became a small tunnel I had to climb through, though. Just barely big enough for my body. I taped my belt and shrunk my suit so it was more form-fitting and pushed myself forward. Shuffling on my hands and knees were slow but steady. I thought I heard something like chittering in the darkness, but I ignored it and kept moving forward. My hand felt a drop off in front of me, so I twisted around awkwardly and lowered my feet down. Even with my fingertips just barely gripping the edge, I couldn't feel the bottom, so I took a deep breath and let go. I expected to hit the ground right away but the fall was way farther than I could have planned for. I pressed my belt and focused on an image. Cushy shoes and a big cape. I grabbed the corners of the cape and tossed it over my head so it would catch some of the air as I fell forward and slowed me down. My shoes ballooned into big shoes with huge soles full of air and when I finally hit the ground, they took most of the force and deflated. The chimney took a hard turn sideways again so I crouched down and crawled some more. I heard the echo of quiet chittering coming from the chute. The metal down here felt warmer somehow, so I formed gloves over my hands to protect myself. A few more feet forward, and it felt even hotter. I thickened the gloves into open mitts and formed feet pads over my legs. Another few shuffles and the heat was unbearable. I had to get out the floor. I lifted up one hand and focused. The paw of the glove reshaped into a big suction cup, which I tried against the roof. It held. I did the same thing with my other hand and then my knees. I crawled along the ceiling, holding myself tight to the top so I wouldn't touch the bottom of the chimney, which was glowing with the heat and making me sweat. The chimney sharply turned straight back up, which I was expecting at this point. I pushed all the fabric straight to my feet, forming longer and longer stilts that raised me up the long chimney chute. I felt the corner at the top, pulled myself over, and was face to face with a squirrel. A very cute, very small squirrel with wide eyes and bushy tail that was twice as big as its body. It held both little paws out to me and chittered. Ah, oh, hey little friend. I try not to make myself have sudden movements. I kind of need to keep moving past you. The squirrel chittered and pushed its paws out closer to me. 
I don't have any nuts or anything. It cocked its head to one side, then darted forward to sniff at my fingers. I lifted my palms up to show I didn't have anything. No nuts. I explained it slower this time. I'm sorry. It flipped my head and hand over and back, then went to the other hand and flipped it too. It looked up at my face, and I swear, I saw its big eyes narrow. I'm gonna go. I started shuffling past it and tried to lift my arm gently over the squirrel so I could try moving around it. It chittered a little louder and slipped through my arms to get in front of me again. Excuse me, please! I started moving again. It crouched low to the ground and flicked its huge tail back and forth and growled. Oh, jeez. Just please calm down. I'm sorry. I tried to pull myself backward, away from it, but as soon as I moved, it leaped out and lashed onto my nose with its teeth. Ow! I reached up and grabbed it, but it slipped out of my fingers and bit my ear. I tried to spot it away, but it grabbed the back of my hand and bit my fingers too. I tried to push myself forward to get away from it, but the squirrel kept circling around my body, scratching and biting. I focused and shifted the suit to cover all my exposed skin, but the squirrel moved fast enough to get inside and start going even crazier, trapped in my clothes. I slammed against the walls of the chimney, trying to get it out, yelling for the squirrel to leave me alone. Stop! Please! Stop! Why are you doing this to me? A lit sign swung down from the ceiling and hit me in the face. I rubbed my nose and looked at it. Shh! You'll wake up the children! What? Another sign swung down and hit me on the back of my head. I rolled around and saw it. The squirrel kept struggling inside my suit. I said, shh, Santa needs to be quiet. I'm trying, but there's a, ouch, squirrel in here trying to kill me. A third, smaller sign, failed out of the first sign and poked me in the nose. I warned you. A low rumbling came from the end of the chimney. The signs folded up out of the way, but before I could worry about what was coming, I had to deal with the squirrel that was currently rolling near my armpit. I focused hard on the fabric around the space, and it separated and reformed behind the squirrel, pushing it out. I imagined the hand grasping the swirl and the fabric in my armpit stretched out five fingers that gently held onto it in the tummy. The squirrel struggled in a bit on the hand. But since it was made out of fabric, I couldn't feel it. Okay, I thought. I'm scratched and beaten it up, and I've got a hand coming out of my armpit, but at least I've still got my positive attitude. The rumbling got louder. A strong gust of wind started blowing, and I came dangerously close to losing my positive attitude. I got knocked back, but before I could fall back toward the chute, I panicked and expanded my suit cramming fabric into all four corners of the chimney with me in the middle. I braced my feet on the floor and pushed forward, fighting against the strong wind. I looked like a big red cube sliding down the hallway, a cube with three hands and an angry squirrel attached to the front. Moving through the tunnel with the wind blowing straight on me took twice as long. I couldn't see where the tunnel ended either, so I tipped over and started sliding straight down before I realized what was going on. At the bottom of this chute was a fire, and I accidentally breathed in some smoke and started coughing. I shifted away from the cube into my outfit form before, but covered up my face and the squirrel's face so we wouldn't choke on the smoke. I held out my arms and legs and dragged against the wall until I wedged tight enough that we stopped, my feet just barely above the fire. If there are any real chimneys like this, I don't think I want to be Santa. There was no way I could put out the fire with my shape-shifting suit. The fabric was heat-resistant, but not fireproof. My bodysuit underneath was fireproof, but that didn't protect my face and hands. The fire was too high for me to swing around it. You're stuck, Ollie. What are you supposed to do? I was positive Celia already had a solution. I looked at the squirrel, who had stopped fighting my armpit hand out of fear for the fire, and I decided I could at least save it. I extended my third hand down and around the edge of the flame, then let go. 
The squirrel ran away from the spitting logs, out of sight, and I closed my eyes. Maybe if I just hold myself here long enough, the fire will go away. I heard a loud clang, along with several smaller clangs. Something had been knocked over in the front of the fire, one of those things that hold the fire irons, the pokers. I focused really hard on stretching a third hand again and reached down to grab the poker. The metal was heavy and the suit couldn't pull it up by itself, so I focused on wrapping around it and used my real hands to pull it up to me like a rope. Without my hands holding me up though, my legs started slipping a bit. I was running out of time, but I grabbed the poker with both hands and started pushing the logs out of the fireplace, taking the fire with them. I hope there's nothing important in front of the fire. Once the logs were out from directly under me, I landed in the warm suit and quickly jumped over the flaming logs. A living room? I had finally reached the end of the chimney and was in a really nice looking living room that was on fire now. Oh yeah! I looked frantically around for something to go and put out the logs while the squirrel screeched loudly from the mantle. I found a pitcher of milk next to the huge plate of cookies and dumped the milk all over the fire. It didn't work as well as the water would have, but I was able to stamp the last few burning bits at my foot. I couldn't slow down. Rudolph said I had to find the button under the tree. I glanced around the room and didn't see any trees. There was a painting of a beach scene, a stressed out squirrel, some chairs, a couch, a coffee table. Wait a second. The beach painting had a big palm tree on it. Could that be? I looked at the floor below the painting and didn't see anything. I nudged the frame gently to peek behind it. There! Built into the wall was a small red button. I pushed it, and immediately a loud buzzer sounded from my box. The wallpaper below the painting split open and revealed a hatch that led directly up to the original chimney entrance. I turned my shoes into stilts again. The squirrel hitched the right of my shoulder and rolled myself out of the top. Celia met me in the middle of the, our two boxes and we started yelling over each other about what happened. The chimney just kept going around and your soup was amazing. I couldn't even believe. I used a toolbox to build a... I hope the squirrels don't have rabies. I'm pretty sure these don't at least. Her squirrel was meeting my squirrel and they were jumping around in each other to say hello. You guys tied. Buzz ran over to us. He had wiped most of the suit off his face but there was still some in his nose, so I reached up and rubbed it off. Your boxes buzzed at the same exact time. Rudolph strode over to us and glared down his nose. I suppose that means you're safe. For now. Celia crossed her arms. Good. This challenge was unfair anyway. Rudolph's nose shone red, but I saw a little twinkle in his eye. You could be right. Good work, wannabes. Chapter 13 Day 2, This Old Gingerbread House On the second day, the gray boxes were replaced with ten huge piles of gingerbread. Waiting for us that day was none other than the gingerbread woman. She was known throughout the North Pole for being exactly who you call when your gingerbread house is a fixer-upper. She was a master with the stuff and worked very fast. The competition can't catch me, her TV promo said. I'm the gingerbread woman. Today, you will be using the reclaimed gingerbread we've given you to build a full-scale house. Along with the gingerbread, you may order anything from my specialty catalog. Run, run to the deals as fast as you can. We'll be touring the houses at the end of the day to decide the best house will receive the free shopping spree from my catalog and the designer of the worst house will be eliminated from the competition. Judging is tonight. Ready, set, go! We all immediately took off running. The good thing about gingerbread was that it was soft and light. It was easy to hammer together and build a frame for the house. The worst thing was that it wasn't super sturdy. It was easy to snap if you weren't careful with it. 
I grabbed some blueprint paper and drew out my design, but a lot of my other contestants just jumped right into the building, which made me nervous. This is a challenge I can win, I thought. I'm good at making things look good. Every contestant was good at a lot of things, though. We were the final ten. My idea was maybe a little overboard. I wanted to make a scaled-down replica of the Claw's castle. The inside would look like a real house you would live in, but the outside would look exactly like the castle, except made of candy. Ramp wasn't doing so hot. He kept using marshmallow glue to stick gingerbread boards together without any kind of plan or foundation for the house. Back in the day, no one built houses, he explained when I asked how it was doing. They just sprang up on the ground like trees. Us kids today, ruining the house and gardens just like we're ruining everything else. After a few hours of work, a gingerbread woman came by to check on the progress. How's it coming? She asked surprisingly as I adjusted the butterscotch lamp. It's going well, you know. I tried to think some kind of words from her show I could use to sound smart. I'm thinking kind of an open concept ranch style dream home with a nice interior and, for the final touch, a yard with room to grow, you know, as a family. We're looking for something in our budget that isn't going to break the bank, and I really think my husband is going to love it. Something modern and chic, but also with a traditional, classic feel. And I can't stress this enough, everything is a deal breaker. She nodded seriously. It sounds like you've got this all under control. See you tonight. Nailed it, I thought. That night, the gingerbread woman led us on a tour of the contestant's house, carrying a clipboard and making no facial expressions the entire time. She would scribble notes every once in a while or make an mmm noise that could have been either positive or negative. Andrea's house was first, and while I hate to admit it, it was pretty cool. At the first glance, it just looked like a boring barn, but once we were inside, she showed us all these amazing hidden compartments and passageways that made the house feel much bigger and more mysterious than it looked on the outside. Claus built a tower with a spiral staircase in the center and Claus flags all around. He was clearly very proud of it. I got some satisfaction watching him sweat with the gingerbread woman straightened out of its cloth candy, curtains and said, Hmm. Frank made a house that looked like a submarine and was very spacious and comfortable for one person on the inside. The portholes even had screens behind them so it looked like you were really underwater. I didn't know you were so into ocean, I said. She scratched at the rash, glowing red in her neck. We're not really friends. You don't know a lot of stuff about me. Burn, I thought. But I guess that's true. Gadzooks built a giant bird cage, where the space between the cage bars would open and close whoever you wanted, giving full control of the sunlight. Inside, she had released a lot of birds that pecked around at the gingerbreads but looked cute. One of them pooped on the gingerbread woman's clipboard, though, which I was sure would lose her some points. Kurt just built a totally normal cookie-cutter two-bedroom house. It's backwards, he explained. The rest of us looked around, confused. It just looks like a house, Celia said. Yeah, I mean, it's basically a house, except it's backwards. Klaus banged his forehead against the wall, dusting the floor with crumbs. Everything you do is nonsense, Kurt. Ramp was having such a hard time making his house that I broke down and secretly helped him. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I guided him through a recreation of the traditional witch's house from Hansel and Gretel. It was classic, frosting lining the roof and walls, candy accents of variety of kinds, and I even convinced Ramp to wear a big witch hat when he gave the tour. His grumpy face really sold it. Why did the witch want to eat those kids? I wondered while hammered. A peppermint wreath on the door. She had a whole house made of candy. She had so much food to fatten them up with. Are humans really that tasty? I watched Ramp pick his wrinkly nose and then eat the booger. They don't look tasty. Buzz built a gingerbread gym. 
A jimber bread, I said, and Buzz punched me in the arms approvingly, with workout equipment and dumbbells of a variety of weights all built out for candy. I lifted the ten pound weights, and I felt very strong. Buzz lifted the hundred pound weights, and I felt very weak. Celia made a secret lab. It would be secret, I mean in real life, but obviously I had to tell you about it so you can judge for the competition. It was full of edible replicas of state-of-the-art science equipment. There were marshmallow lab rats, lab coats made out of gummy fruit candy, and even a cloning machine that would make a life-size replica of you in the candy it decided what was most like you. When I got in the machine, it just dropped a huge pile of gross-looking gummy worms. Celia laughed. I put that setting in as a joke for you. I hate gummy worms. I know. She scooped up a handful and tossed them at my face. I picked up a whole bunch of them and threw them back at her. A few hit the gingerbread woman in her glasses. Mmm, she said. I was very, very proud of my house. The outside looked just like the castle. I analyzed pictures as I built them to make sure I got it perfect down to the last detail. On the inside, it was totally different because otherwise, it would make you feel like a giant. I structured each wing of the castle as a big bedroom and turned the grand hall into a living room. For fun, I'd assigned one bedroom to be perfect for me and the other to be perfect for Celia. I made the three bedroom perfect for horse and put the prettiest and most majestic stallion stickers on the walls. The best part, though, was watching the gingerbread woman walk inside. She admired the replica, of course, made her notes and said her mmm. But when she opened the door to the living room, I had meticulously filled with the most Christmas spirity things I could find. She said her first word of the evening. Wow! My face turned bright red and I tried really hard not to cheer. Celia grinned and Buzz punched me in the arm supportively. Nice work, Ollie. Kurt whispered to me. For real. The gingerbread woman turned away from me to inspect one of the tiny portraits I had hastily drawn of an old Santa. Oh, and one last thing, I remembered. I gave a thumbs up to the squirrel, which had been following me around since the day before. I took a break from nibbling on a candy and pushed a button on the roof. The chandeliers and overhead lights in the house flickered off, and the red and green Christmas lights hidden in the wallpaper in the various places of the round living room lit up and blinked on and off in a stunning pattern. I've seen all I need to see. The gingerbread woman marched out of the house, making marks on her clipboard. It wasn't another wow, but it was something. The gingerbread woman brought the round a trophy made appropriately of gingerbread coated in edible gold leaf. She presented to me, and I broke off the pieces to share with the other contestants, except for Claus, who was too grumpy about losing to take a piece. It was delicious, because it tasted like vigory. The boy in the beige sweater lost, but the gingerbread woman didn't say his name, of course. You lose, she said while pointing at the boy in the beige sweater because your house was completely unmemorable. Come to think of it, I don't remember his house either. The boy in the beige sweater nodded. That's fair. He walked to the front of the group and waved at all of us. Thanks everybody for this opportunity. I had a really great time with all of you. And thanks especially... Oh no. To my good, please don't. Friend, this can't be. Ollie! Why am I being punished? The boy walked over and gave me a hug. I patted him on the head. He left and let out a deep sigh of relief. A few minutes later, Ram came up to me and asked, Who was that kid? Chapter 14 Day 3 Cookies and Milk and Cookies and Milk and Cookies and Milk and Cookies The nine remaining contestants sat on a long bench in front of a table piled with high with nine cookies, platters, and nine jugs of milk. All right, kids. Chef's metal hand morphed into a rolling pin, which he rolled along the table while he packed and paced, 
back and forth. Time for your eating challenge. Kids these days leave a lot of cookies and milk for Santa. A lot. He stand with his rolling pin on the table in front of Frank, who was too busy scratching her rash to pay attention. I was sitting next to Frank, and it scared me more than her. So you gotta prove you can handle it. They're some of the best damn cookies I ever made, but there's two hundred of them for each of you to get in the milk to wash them down. You don't gotta drink the milk because for some reason the high ups think that's too dangerous and would get vomit everywhere. He spat on the ground. Grant added, In my day, we drank a gallon of milk for every lunch, and we liked it. Hear, hear! Chef giggled, his tiny laughed. You have got it all day, but the last one to finish gets the boot. First gets free lunch for a year. And be careful, kids. He wrapped his rolling pin on the table. They're spicy. A loud buzzer sounded, and we dove in. Buzz crunched into his cookie and made a confused face. This isn't spicy at all. That's just the thing he says, I explained through a mouthful of crumbs. The cookies were really good. This is going to be a breeze, I thought, after the first two cookies. This is absolutely not going to be a breeze, I thought, after the fifty cookies. This is going to kill me. I looked around while I picked up a piece of macadamia nut that got wedged between my teeth. Buzz was doing better than most because he was bigger and stronger than everybody. Lucky. Celia was about as miserable as I was. Gadzooks looked like he was having the worst time, though. She was thin and long like a bird, so I wasn't surprised. Frank was... Hmm, I thought. There's something weird about Frank. Frank didn't look like she was uncomfortable at all. She was munching down on probably around her 50th cookie, too. But she looked like she was still hungry. She looked totally happy, even comfortable. Plus, her rash was gone. Where'd your rash go? I asked her. Huh? She glanced at me and took a big bite out of the double chocolate chunk. What are you talking about? Earlier, you had that big red rash from your suit. Oh, uh, she shrugged. It went away, I guess. I guess. Have you always had that mole on your cheek? I asked. She poked the mole just to left her nose. Yeah, always. Since I was born. I didn't know that. We're not really friends, she said. You don't know a lot of stuff about me. I frowned. Have we had this conversation before? She shrugged. I don't think so. Then things got even weirder when everyone was around 150 cookies a couple of hours later. I was talking to Celia about how I never wanted to eat another snickerdoodle again in my life, but I looked over and saw Frank coming back from the bathroom. Wait, where did your mole go? I asked. She caught a colorful candy that fell over her mouth. What mole? The one you've had since you were born. She stared at me blankly and shoved another cool cookie in her mouth. I struggled to nibble on mine. And is your rash still gone? I don't know what rash you're talking about. She shoved a few more cookies in her mouth. I gotta go to the bathroom. I waited until she was almost at the end of the table before getting up and sneaking after her. She walked down the steps of the eating stage and headed to the edge of where the stadium part met the spa part. The spa part had the best bathrooms. She turned to look behind her and I jumped behind a tall human with a big white bathrobe. Oh good. Are you the towel boy? The man dropped his bathrobe on top of me and stood in just a swimsuit. I need a new robe. That one fell in the mud bath. I felt the mud dripping on my face and quickly shook the robe off of me and onto the ground. I peered around the man just in time to see Frank coming out of a hole in the bathroom wall. I watched her leave the bathroom and walk back toward the cookie table. Sorry sir, I'm not the towel boy. I yelled as I ran to the hole. I hope you found one though. Attached to the edge of the hole was a rope ladder. I took a deep breath and climbed into the darkness, moving slowly since I couldn't see the rungs. The hole was only just big enough to fit my body through, so I was squished by gross damp walls on all sides 
and something smelled like a toilet. Above ten feet down, I felt the space open up and the floor under my foot, so I stood up and looked around. Even with my eyes adjusted, I couldn't see anything, so I focused and changed my suit's color to a dim light. The gentle glow revealed not only, not one, but two francs, napping in sleeping bags. I moved closer to one of them to light up of her face. A rash! I moved to the other one and lit up her face. No mole! I finally understood. I knew there was only one possibility. Goldie and Meryl were pretending to be Frank. That's why she was so calm about her brothers losing their racing challenge. Now they could cheat each other. And since they'll all work out in the mail room, they had access to the underground service tunnels at the North Pole. One of them must have snuck in and set up this little camp for the challenge. Before I could decide what to do with the information, one of the Franks blinked open their eyes and shouted, Turn that light off, Frank! I quickly turned my suit's light off, so we were in complete darkness. That's not Frank, Goldie. I'm Frank. That's Meryl. The other one turned over and faced the wall. I thought Frank just slept to go eat. Must have slept longer than I realized. And I'm Meryl. You, Goldie? No, I'm Frank. I heard a rustle as she turned back to face me. Goldie? I don't think that's Myrtle. I know that's not Myrtle. I'm Myrtle. Nah, I mean, I don't think that's Goldie or Meryl. So it's Frank. No, I'm Frank. That's something that's somebody else together. No, it isn't. I tried and said, trying to fake my voice like theirs. You think I'm some kind of twerp? I think you're Merle. He can't be Merle, you idiot. How many times I gotta tell you? I am Merle. Fine then. Tell me something only Merle would know. I cleared my throat. One of us has gotta go eat. I said. Who cares who is it? Fine, I'll go. Goldie or Merle, or maybe Frank, got up and pushed past me to the ladder. She climbed up and out, and I waited until she reached the top before I climbed up quickly, too. The new Frank was still yawning and rubbing her hands as she walked over to the benches, so she didn't notice the other Frank already sitting there. I ran up behind them and yelled, Hey, everybody, look! There's two Franks! The contestants gasped. Frank and Frank looked at each other. One of the Franks put her face in her hands. Chef crossed his arms and frowned. You bunch of idiots. One Frank advanced on the other. We had a system. You're the idiot. He just came down and told me to leave, Meryl. I'm not Meryl. I'm Goldie. Not this again. I don't care who you are. Now, none of us are going to be Santa. One Frank punched the other Frank in the arm and then the other Frank pulled the first Frank's hair. They pushed each other onto the table and sent cookies and milk flying everywhere. Chef came on stage and used his hand, now a spatula, to push them away from each other. Get all disqualified! His hands morphed into tongs as he grabbed both Franks by their collars. The rest of ya, get eaten! Lunch is at stake. At stake, I thought. I sat back down and stared at the small pile of cookies I still had left. Grandpa snoring, asleep on a pillow of uneaten cookies. Buzz was a few cookies ahead, but even as he slowed down around the 150th. Celia had used her suit to build a little chisel and was breaking the cookies into very, very small pieces before eating them. I focused on loosening the belt of my suit. I picked up a cookie and stared into its chocolate chips. Leave me alone. I imagined the chocolate chip begging. Just put me down on the plate and let me live. Buzz took another bite and groaned. I can't, I apologized. I have to keep fighting to the end. Stop talking to the cookies, Ollie. Celia shook her head at me. It only makes it harder. I figured that out <laughs> earlier. Me and Macadamia Nuts had a thing going for a while. Kurt interjected, equally loopy. But in the end, you always have to eat them. Klaus glared over his substantial plate of cookies. Are you crying? Everything crumbles. 
That's just life, man. I took another bite and felt like I was gonna throw it all back up. I never guessed the hardest thing about being Santa would be all the cookies. Speak for yourself! Buzz yelled too loudly. This is muscle fuel! He put the cookies in his mouth at once and chomped down on them. These cookies aren't gonna bring Buzz Brownie down! He caught all the big crumbs as they fell and put those in his mouth too. I looked at my plate. Only ten cookies left. I grabbed the snickerdoodle and broke it in halves and in quarters and then gently placed one quarter to my tongue. Ah! Buzz tilted his plate into the air and poured the final four cookies into his mouth. With a final burst of energy, he crunched like a lawnmower, eating up every bit left on the plate. Chef, back from kicking up the triplets, lifted Buzz's hair in the air with its tongs. We've got our champion! Congrats, Brownie! Free lunch for a whole year! I let out a sigh of relief and pushed my plate away. Buzz rolled forward and backward off the bench and curled up onto the ground. I'm never eating again. Chapter 15 Day 4 North Pole Idol This time, the eating bench was replaced with a huge lit stage complete with several instruments propped up and waiting in the back. Directly in the center and all the way in front of the microphone, a bigger surprise though was the crowd. Most of the North Pole must have shown up for this challenge. What do you think's going on? I asked. Buzz raised his eyebrow at me. Haven't you heard? Celia frowned. Heard what? Parumpa y'all! came a voice. A platform slowly raised someone up from the stage. The huge crowd behind us, barely held back by Santa's secret helpers, yelled things like, No way! and Oh, holy cow! It's LDB, I said. The LDB! I can't believe it! Why is he here? What's going on? Who's LDB? Celia asked. Where have you been? The platform finished rising all the way up, and there he was, LDB. He was a tall, bulky human with dangly earrings that looked like miniature drumsticks. Around his neck was a big, thick chain necklace with a small drum hanging in the center of his chest. He's already had his arms outstretched like he was receiving the crowd's cheers directly into his body. I couldn't help it. I screamed a little too. Celia rolled her eyes at me. I don't really listen to the top 40. She yelled over the noise. Your loss! I yelled back, and she laughed. LDB cleared his throat. <clears throat> Come through, they told me. The crowd responded. Parum pa poom poom! LDB and the North Pole music producer slash pop star he sang in, rapped in, and or produced every major track of the last year. He was best known for his beats. They were very good. I had the pleasure, he paused for a moment, relishing the sudden silence, of telling y'all about the next trial. Y'all wanna hear it? The crowd screamed again even louder. Someone yelled, I love you, LDB! And LDB yelled back, Cool, thanks! He stretched his arms out, palms down, and the crowd quieted down. The third official Santa trial is... He paused for a long time again, and you could feel everybody even lean forward a little. A grueling test of your abilities. It's... He tapped the drum on his chest with his fingers, and everybody leaned forward even farther. Gonna drive y'all crazy. In fact, it's... He leaned toward a little and the whole crowd leaned forward so far that a lot of them fell over. A singing competition. The crowd went nuts. The eight of us, however, got very quiet. This is why our suits needed to be prepared for anything? Buzz mumbled. I didn't even realize he was standing behind me. I've been prepared for this since I was born. You perform? Celia asked. Buzz blushed. Well, sort of. I've taken dance lessons since I was a kid. A realization hit me. 
You were in L.D. Beast's music video. Santa Claus is coming to the club. You were wearing a mask, but I always thought, shh. Buzz covered his mouth with his hand. Just don't make a big deal of it, all right? It's embarrassing. Maybe you can help Celia, I said. She doesn't know how to dance. Neither do you, Celia protested. Yeah, but that doesn't stop me. I waggled my fingers and shook my shoulders. I got the spirit. This isn't a dance competition anyway, Celia grumbled. It's a singing competition. LDB continued explaining. Each contestant will pick a song to perform, and you, the audience, will judge the winner using our patent cheerometer judging system. The cloud verge here, and the better they'll do. Winner gets featured on my next album, but the losers, out for good. Oh, and I almost forgot. He banged a drum in his chest, and a group of reindeer and fox layer jackets and crazy haircuts flew down from the sky. One with bright red mohawk sat at the drums and used his antlers to hit them. One with very long blue hair sat in front of a piano, the one who had somehow shaped his antlers into the outline of a mouth with a tongue sticking out went up to the microphone. Kirk was the first person to start screaming. That's treason for the season! I can't believe they're breaking their vow of silence! His sleigh team? i never seen him genuinely excited. He jumped up and down and pumped his fist. Play Christmas Criminal! He yelled. I guess because I was closest to him, he grabbed my shoulders and shook me off a foot of the ground. It's from their first album, which is amazing! They never play live anymore! He dropped me, and I tried to make Dizzily Teetering look cool and intentional. Treason for the Season started playing. Kurt immediately started jumping up and down and thrashing his arms around at the music. He's never been this sincere about anything, Celia said. I nodded. It's very weird. As Kurt started mouthing the words onto a song about snowboarding, Celia scrunched up one side of her face and shrugged her shoulders. Turns out he's just a big fanboy this whole time. They gave us some time to pick our songs, and then one by one, we went up and performed. Most of our contestants, including me, sang Christmas carols, of course. They were easy, proud pleasers, and you could maybe trick the audience into singing along and contributing to your score. Andrea sang both parts in Baby It's Cold Outside, which was even more impressive than it sounds. Even I was moved to tears by your very convincing emotional performance of both roles. She really can't stay, I explained to Celia with watery eyes. She patted me on the back. I know, Wally, I know. But it's so cold. Next, Kurt walked to the stage, and things got even more interesting. I'm going to sing Treason for the Season song, I Don't Care If You Care That I Care. He looked very terrified and his hands wouldn't stop moving. He crunched the candy stick down to nothing very quickly while the band got ready. The reindeer with a mohawk started hammering a beat at the drums. The one with blue hair started playing an intro to the piano. The singer said, One, two, three, four! I know, Kurt's voice faltered and he cleared his throat. You think that I... His voice squeaked away, and he stopped completely. After a second, the band caught on and stopped playing. Sorry guys, I'm just, well, performing with you guys is a, is a dream of mine, and I'm kind of nervous, so if we could... Can we can we start over? It's Is that okay? The reindeer with a mohawk hammered one beat again. The one with the blue hair played the same intro. The singer said, One, two, three, four! I know you think that I don't think... Kurt's voice hiked up sharply a couple of octaves, and then he kept mouthing words, but nothing seemed to be coming out. The band stopped again. Kurt's face went bright red, and he was obviously sweating. He combed his hair back with one hand and fidgeted with the other one. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Just, uh, just one more time. Hired beat. A played intro. One, two, three, four! Nothing came out of the speakers but a garbled noise like a bird trying to scream at you. Sorry, Kurt, 
LDB's voice washed over us. I can't let you start over anymore. People in the crowd said, Aww, which added a few points to his score, but he definitely lost. Whatever, he said, and put a candy stick in his mouth. Who even cares, anyway? Before I could leave the stage, the lead singer of Treason tapped on the stage twice, and the guitar rose out of the crowd. The ranger gestured to it, and Kurt stopped. Me? Kurt asked. The reindeer nodded. Are you sure? The reindeer nodded again, but Kurt still hesitated. The reindeer leaned over to the microphone. You've got the music in you, bro. Who cares about a competition? Let's rock. I yelled through the silence. You can do it! Kurt laughed and nodded, surprised out of his nerves. He picked up the guitar and whispered something to the singer. He cleared his throat. My name is Kurt Claus, and I won't be a Santa, but I will rock your world. He played a few chords to open up the real version of I don't care if you care that I care. Fireworks flew out of his jacket, and in the air spelled out, Claus still wears white socks. The crowds cheered. Was that was all in the suit? Celia asked. I kind of hope so. I couldn't take my eyes away from the performance. Kurt was out of the competition, but he didn't seem too sad about it. Andrea won. We spent the next few hours dancing and relaxing, which was nice for a change. Chapter 16 Day 5 Reindeer Rodeo A tall, hefty reindeer was waiting for us this time. He was the biggest reindeer I'd ever seen, with his little, stubby horns but huge, marble slab hooves. I recognized him immediately. That's Brutalizer, I whispered to Celia. He's the captain of the Abominable Throwman. I know, Ollie. Everyone watches the reindeer games. He's the toughest reindeer on the team, and the second fastest flyer. I know that too. He was on my draft team last year. Oh yeah, Celia always won a draft league. It's just statistics, she would say, and statistics is basically science. Morning, buds! The voice coming from Brutalizer's translator was kinder than I expected. He always looked so scary on the field, like he could kill you with a mean look. He wasn't making any mean looks at us, just doing the closest thing to smiling a reindeer could do. I'm going to tell you all a story. Brutalizer shrugged his shoulders and looked at the seven of us remaining. I've always been pretty big. Being tough and strong came naturally to me, you know? And since I was already good at it, it was fun to get even tougher and brighter. But then when I tried out for the reindeer games, I got turned away for being too slow. I gasped. Too slow? But he's always so fast. I try to be a fastest flyer, but I convinced myself over and over that it just wasn't going to happen. It didn't come naturally to me, so I gave up. He kicked off the ground and lifted into the sky. He did a barrel roll in one direction, then the other, then sped around in a tight circle. It took me a while to realize that you have to work twice as hard at the stuff you're not already good at, but it's worth it. Now I'm the second fastest flyer in the games, thanks to the serious practice. Every single day. Today. I'm going to show you what my practices are like. Claus scoffed. So we're just going to sit here and watch you practice? Brutalizer laughed. He stomped on the ground with his hoof twice, and behind him, the field came alive. Hoops and steps, and targets and balls, some of them on fire, flew up into the sky and formed a course in the air. You're not going to watch. You're coming with me. A team of elves rushed in and started pulling a saddle, helmet, and goggles on Brutalizer. They passed each of us a set of protective gear too. The reindeer explained while he got suited up. I'm going to do my daily flight training like normal. Your job is to stay on my back no matter what. Everyone falls off, they're out. Anyone gives up and asks me to stop, they're out. Up in the air. Santa has to stay in sync with his reindeer, 
no one knows what's going to happen once you're flying and light speed is very dangerous. Y'all got it? I nodded along everyone else. I saw one of the spinning hoops light with fire. We're going to have to go through that. Up first is all you know. You ready? I gulped. Uh, yes, sir. Brutalizer laughed. Please, serves my father. Hop on. I clambered onto his back and wrapped my hands around the horn of the saddle. I would just like to say, Mr. Brutalizer, that I'm a I'm a very big fan. I paint my dress and face for all of your games. I know. You gave me that cool helmet without my last year's games. You remember that? I had hand metalized a special helmet that would probably wouldn't have protected him very well, but it looked great. Of course I do. I keep it on the wall in my room. Wow. Oh, wow. That's so... And now, I get a train with you and... Let's get going, huh? I nodded, and then I realized he couldn't tell because I was sitting on his back. Yeah, yes, uh, let's go. He trotted over to the edge of the stadium, looked up into the sky, and launched. We were flying faster than I ever flown, even during the sleigh race. The first section of the course seemed to some kind of sprinting challenge. He was bouncing back and forth between two balls floating in the air so quickly I was struggling to not get whiplash. The trick when flying, he yelled over the wind, is to lean into the movements of your reindeer. We've been flying ever since we were born, basically, so we know what we're doing. Even if you're steering, you have to trust our instincts. That won't be a problem, I yelled back. I mostly let Crasher do the work. Not a bad choice. Crasher's good. I bet she'll make it to the games when she gets a little older. He looped through a flaming ring, and I had to push my hat against the saddle to smooth her a little frame. Don't tell her I said that, though. She's already pretty cocky. I took his advice and leaned with his turns. With every bob and weave, I got a little better at predicting where he was gonna go. You're doing great! He yelled as he drove down the ground really fast, a tag of checkpoint flag. Remember, being in charge isn't just about being in control. You have to know when to just trust your team. He rolled around onto his back and flew straight ahead, but I held him with my legs and didn't fall. Seems like you've already got that down, though. We'll see how the others do. The final stretch of the course was a series of spiked balls flying through the air. Brutalizer dove straight into the middle of them without stopping, and I had to duck my head to avoid getting hit by a spike. I started guessing his movements and following his shifts around the spikes before they hit, maybe even helping him dodge better if I wasn't imagining things. We grabbed the flag at the ends of the spikes and then dove back toward them, putting the flag in a holster on the other side, and then the flying course was over. Brutalizer's hooves landed on the ground with a whump, and I made a similar whump when I rolled off his back and fell on the ground. Thank you, I said panting. That was awesome. Celia Pixie, you're next. How are you not already worn out? Celia asked, amazed. That course was crazy. I do it ten times a day. Since you guys are added weight, though, I'll probably only do seven. Celia climbed on his back and they took off. Watching her was even scarier than actually doing it. When I was up there, I was mostly distracted while trying to hold on. From the ground, he could see how high up they were and how fast they were moving. After Celia and Buzz and an Andrea and a Ramp, I was nervous about him, but his rigged bed suit, big red suit, had some kind of feature where it locked in place and seemed to do most of the holding on work for him. After Ramp and Claus, and then finally, Gedzooks. Poor, poor Gedzooks. For someone who spent so much time with birds, you've already thought she'd handle flying better. And almost immediately after they took off, her coat flapped in a weird way, and a few flocks of doves flew out. Pay them no mind, she yelled. Nothing to see here. But the birds were spooked, and they whirled around and tried to land back on Gedzooks. 
She tried to push them away, but they tugged at her sleeves and a whole deck of cards came flying out of her sleeve. The force blew her to one side of Brutalizer's back, where she did her best to hold on. Her top hat slipped off to her head, and a rabbit fell out. She tried to catch the rabbit with her hands and the hand with her foot, but she must have had a secret compartment because a huge cloud of glitter flew out and enveloped them. Coughing, Gadzooks tried not to lose her grip, but in the scramble, she ripped her collar on the back of Brutalizer's antler, and the long rope of multicolored handkerchiefs fell out. The rabbit grabbed onto the handkerchiefs and swung along beside them. My secrets! She yelled as a magic wand sprung out of her sleeve and hit one of the squawking birds. I swore never to reveal these! She was falling, but she whistled, and all her birds flew down and grabbed her clothes, gently gliding her to the ground. Brutalizer finished up the course, and then landed as well. I'm sorry, Getsuks. I went over and gave her a hug. She shrugged. I bamboozled myself on this one, good pal. You didn't spy too many of my secrets, did you? I shook my head. We barely even understood what happened. Your secrets are safe. Splendid. Gadzooks bowed and tipped her hat. Good luck with the rest of the competition. I'll be rooting for you. She reached out to shake my hand. With an eye extended mine, there was a pigeon on it. When I looked up, Gadzooks was gone. And the pigeon cooed. Chapter 17 Day 6 Next Top Nutcracker 5, 6, 7, 8 Frosty clapped his squishy hands and demonstrated the choreography for us. I tripped on my own feet during a grapevine step and had to slow down to get my bearings. Ollie, did you hear me holler stop? Frosty stopped dancing and frowned down at me. The way his snow face rearranged the frown was actually kind of unsettling. His dark, coal eyes pierced right through me. I only paused a moment, sir. Let's try it again. Look alive, people. Alive as you can be. I watched him closely as he repeated the choreography for the Sugar Plum Fairies. Our challenge today was to each do a one-person abridged performance of the Nutcracker, playing all the roles and dancing and all the parts. Everyone was so tired, though, on the sixth day, and it was so early. But Frosty didn't slow down. Frosty wasn't good at taking directions from traffic cops, choreographies, or whoever. So he became a director. He was there to teach us some of the dances and also to judge. I had never met him in person before, but I guess I expected him to be less creepy to look at. He wasn't the snowman like you'd make for fun in your yard. The nanobots or whatever they were making him animate gave him the shape of a regular human person, just pure white and snowy. As soon as that hat was on his head, he started dancing around, and he hadn't stopped dancing since. He dismissed us to practice on our own, and Andrea sleepily stumbled toward me. I had to muster up a lot of positive vibes not to ignore her. I'm sorry we haven't got along. She started practicing one of the Mouse King's clap dance while she was talking, and so did I, as well. Claus over here was convinced convinced me to try and knock you out at a competition. He's very convincing. Did you know he's very smart? She started to tilt over, so I helped her stand back. Yeah, I know, but your tricks in the race still weren't okay. She wiggled her shoulders and sighed. I know it wasn't. You, you promised not to hate me if you become Santa? She sounds so sincere, I thought. She always sounds like she's telling the truth, I thought back. And then she fools you into messing yourself up. I don't think that's what she's doing this time. Whatever, it's your funeral. It's your funeral too. Peek and brittle, I mentally swore. You're right. Of course I don't hate you. I just don't think I can't trust you anymore, you know? She nodded while yawning and also doing the running man. I got that. Can we at least hug? Uh, sure? I was very confused. She gave me a hug and squeezed. Friends forever, she said. I am very uncomfortable. 
Yeah, uh, friends, uh, I guess. Hello, everyone! Maria Duende beamed her bright smile and posed the engines to the field. A few cameras swarmed around her to capture the moment and then her expressions. She had shown up with a surprise. Everybody's parents. Apparently, she thought it would be a good idea to get some footage of them coming to support us when we were at our f most exhausted, so she had a team of camera women flood the stadium alongside all the moms and dads. Can I get on your shoulders, Ollie? Polly asked. Mom shook her head. He's busy, baby. No, it's fine. I hefted her up and set her on my shoulders. Seeing you guys is making me feel better about this long week. I poked Polly's side and she giggled. You have to dance, though. Okay. She pumped her hands in the air and made a very serious kissy face. I meant to bring you some ice cream, Molly, but I left with the scoop instead. My dad helped up an ice cream scoop. He was always doing things like that. Once he left his laptop in the fridge. You know my scattery brain. You'd serve your head on a cone if it weren't attached, Raleigh. Mom wiped the smudge off his overalls. Daddy's name is Raleigh? Polly asked. Does Mommy have a name like ours too? No, honey. Your dad's family does that because they're very, very silly. My name's Elizabeth. Polly looked disappointed. Oh. Maria rushed up with Sayi, her camera woman, in tow. Smile for the cameras! We all turned, smiled, and waved. Maria moved on. We're very proud of you, but it's very early in the morning and mommy hasn't had her coffee. You should go visit Celia's parents too. They want to talk to you. Thanks mom, I will. I passed the struggling Polly back over to her. Dad handed me an ice cream scoop. Just in case it was meant to be. He winked. It's made out of unbreakable alloy. And it's sharp. I use it to cut even the most frozen chunks of ice cream. Unsure what to do, I winked back and tucked it in one of my suit pockets. Thanks, Dad. I waved while they walked away. Celia's parents were fussing over her a few feet away. My suit's fine. Celia was trying to slip away from her mother, who was poking at her big red suit. Ollie made it for me. You're wearing it sloppily, Mrs. Pixie said. It should be tucked in. Actually, my suit is at an optimal, scientifically proven tuckedness precisely where functionality, beauty, and comfort intersect. Always with the science, it's too loose. Her tone made it clear there was no more room for argument. What are you doing, Dad? Mr. Pixie was writing with a pencil on a notepad. I want to remember everything about this moment. Mrs. Pixie was an accountant who liked everything in a certain way, and Mr. Pixie was a poet who liked to throw parties. Celia said that science was the natural balance of the two. Ollie, save me! Celia noticed me watching and waved over. Her parents both turned around to give me hugs. There's our sweet little boy! Mrs. Pixie gave me a kiss on the forehead. Mr. Pixie shook me, shook me by the shoulder slightly. A fantastic job, really. You've done a great job. They like you more than me, Ollie. Celia smiled at me to show she was joking. But Mrs. Pixie apparently didn't realize, and clicked her tongue. You know, that's not true. We just never see him. It's always right out of the house with you two. Off to your science. I feel like you've been more on TV than you've been at home. You don't have to do air quotes when you science, Mom. I'm a serious scientist. Well, how would I know? You never invent anything to help around the house. They had this fight a lot. My attention started wandering while they argued. I saw Claus talking to Mrs. Claus, I guess Santa hasn't come, and I saw Maria Duende toward the back of the dance floor interviewing Andrea, who was practicing the Charleston by herself. I started to back away from the Pixies. I'll be right back, you guys. Science is about way more important stuff than vacuuming, Mom. Who cares about robots if your house is a wreck? They didn't seem like they'd be showing down anytime soon, and Mr. Pixie was just watching them and taking notes, so I headed over to Andrea, who was holding an envelope and reading a letter to the camera. So happy and so proud of you. Your cousin, 
even set up a Wi-Fi. She spelled it like wife I so we could watch you compete on the news. Hi mom! Andrea waved to the camera and laughed in the way people laugh when they're trying not to cry. I waited off to the side until Maria moved on, then awkwardly sidestepped over to Andrea. Your parents couldn't come? I asked. She shrugged. Plane tickets are expensive. They had to use most of our savings to send me here. Farming is hard. Yeah, I bet. I gestured to Ramp, who was flopping around, struggling with the fast geography. He could be your dad if you want. She laughed. More like my grandpa. Your great 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 grandpa. I laughed too, and because we were both exhausted, it felt like it was way funnier than it actually was. We kept looking at each other and staring up again every time we thought it was over. Finally, when we were down to just hiccups, she nudged me. Doesn't he look kind of familiar though? Who? Ramp? Yeah, with the Santa suit and everything. I squinted and cocked my head to the side, watching Ramp's head toss backward and forth. I just saw the toupee, the two big pants, his red face, his long beard. I thought about that time he jumped crazy high in the mail room. I don't think I recognized him from anywhere before the competition. Okay, imagine him like little spectacles, a little father, and then imagine him saying, ho ho ho, she boomed it out. I did. I get what you mean, he kind of looks like Chris Kringle, like in the old paintings. Yeah, totally. Weird, huh? Pretty weird. I looked at her. You really want to win, huh? For your family? She shook her head. I don't know. And I don't think so. Andrea tried and tied her red hair back in a bun while she talked. When I left, my dad said, They're going to go out there, and you're going to do anything it takes to win. You're a clause, and you're going to prove it to it. We deserve to be in that castle just as many of them. And so, I got here and couldn't stop thinking about that. Do anything it takes. So I have been. Speaking of which, she reached behind my back and popped something off my suit. A smiley face button. My mouth fell open. You tricked me again. She nodded. When we hugged earlier, but that's what I mean. I don't want to be Santa. Not if it means I have to act like this forever. She fixed a smiley face to her shirt and handed me a remote control with only one button. I don't understand. I can't look like I quit, but I have to. Use this on me. During the competition, my suit's got loads of electronics in it. The pulse will freeze it up so bad that I won't even be able to move, let alone dance. It'll look like a malfunction, and I'll be disqualified. But your family, and what do your dad say? Please. This is what I want. Remember Sally? I did remember. Finally, I nodded and put the remote control in my jacket. If this is what she wants. Frosty explains that Santa needed to be physically endurance and effortless grace, both of which were best tested with dancing for hours straight. For Act 1, we had to be Clara, the main character, but then also Clara's dad, and Drossel Mayer, who gives her the Nutcracker, and the Nutcracker. Then we had to fight ourselves as the Mouse King. Claus, Celia, and I stuck pretty closely to Frosty's traditional choreography. We didn't change anyone's lives or anything, but I think we put on a pretty good show. Ramp's big red suit did all the work for him. He told us that his tailor had put a full skeleton in the suit. Once it had learned the choreography, it led Ram's body around for a perfect performance. Buzz put his own spin on the choreography and blew everyone out of the water by mixing his ballet in with more modern influences like hip-hop and also some twisty, flowy, artsy moves I didn't know the name of. Andrea actually rewrote the story some in her version. Clara didn't say the Nutcracker after he was injured. In my version, Clara marries the Mouse King, she explains at the intermission, and then she becomes Mouse Queen, kills the king, and takes control of the entire rodent empire. 
In Act 2, she leads an army through the land of the sweets and steals the magic of the sugar plum fairy. Clara lives the rest of her life, ruling both kingdoms with an iron point shoe. Unless... Andrea winked at me. Something were to happen. She winked at me again. Two. Wink. Her. Wink, 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 wink. Celia looked at me for explanation. I stared at the ground. Act two was even more exhausting. We had to play the sweet bearers from all over the world, giving presents to ourselves. Then, be the sugar plum fairy, Clara, and the nutcracker all at once during the last scene. I built an outfit with pieces of all their looks. Clara's dress, the sugar plum fairy's wings, and the nutcracker's silly hat. So that I had to be convincing play all every three roles. Klaus hated every second. He had to dance in front of the crowd. Maybe inspired by Andrea's act one, he changed the script so the Mouse King came back and ruined the party, cutting the act short with one intense fight dance where he dueled himself with two different swords. Rap napped through the whole show, but his form was so good, thanks to his suit, that no one could really complain. Celia added a lot of cool tech to her set. She flew around the stage, fire left from her wings, and a cannon shot actual candies out to the audience. The spectacle made up for her lack of dance experience. Buzz totally destroyed us all again because it was so obvious he was the best dancer on stage. I laughed, I cried, and the entire crowd gave a standing ovation when he did a 720 degree pirouette in the air and landed straight into a double somersault pop and lock salsa kick flip hip shimmy. Then it was Andrea's turn. She as Clara led herself as the late Mouse King's army into battle against herself as the citizens of the Land of Sweets. It was very bloody and swords were flying everywhere. During a quick costume change, she looked at me in the side of the audience and secretly mouthed, now, behind her hand. She mimed pressing a button. I don't know if I can do this. She ran back center stage and threw sabers around. What if she get hurt? I watched her jump and twirl with a rapier. As a knight, she stabbed herself as an innocent townsperson and threw fake blood all over the front row of the audience while making dramatic crying noises. During the distraction, she tapped her wrist in my direction like she was waiting on me. Fine. I pulled the remote out of my jacket and looked at it, and then back at her. I wiggled in my seat at the edge of the audience. I don't want to do this. It feels like cheating. But she asked me to, and she has to lose some time. I held my breath and pushed the button while she juggled butcher knives. Nothing happened. Maybe I had to get closer? I slid out of my seat and tried to move to the front of the stage without attracting attention. Lucky her performance was so interesting and held my breath again. I pushed the button. A visible jaunt of blue energy spread around her costume and froze up. Three, no, four swords were airborne as her suit short-circuited and she fell to the ground on her back. The swords turned and fell to the ground as the audience gasped. A little boy behind me asked his mom if this was part of the show. I covered my eyes with my hands but peeked out through my fingers anyway. The swords stabbed her, stabbed into the ground around her, but none of them hurt her, thankfully. The audience waited for a few minutes to see if it was part of the show, but the music kept going and Andrea just wiggled in her frozen suit. Frosty stopped the show and a team of elves marched on stage with a stretcher. They picked her up and led her off the stage toward where I was standing. As she paused and passed and whispered, Thanks, Holly. You're a good friend. Phew, I thought. I instantly felt so much better. I'm glad I was able to help her. The award ceremony was pretty much unnecessary. Buzz won. He was the only person to win two challenges already. But Andrea was eliminated. As soon as it was over, Celia and I ran as fast as we could back home. Must sleep, Celia yelled. I groaned like a zombie. We just have to make it through one more day. Chapter 18 Day 7 Heat Misser and Snow Missers Around the World in 80 Minutes 
Compared to all the other challenges, doing anything for only 80 minutes sounded like a breeze, even with the crazy Mr. Twins in charge. Head Mr. and Snow Mr. were owl programs with full control over the North Pole's air conditioning and climate cool systems. They were also responsible for maintaining the fog that obscured our location to regular humans. Anybody exploring the area would get lost in it and then blown by seriously strong winds away from the city perimeter. They kept us safe and kept our buildings warm and comfortable. The key to their success was that they build to balance each other. Heat Mister always wanted things hotter and Snow Mister always wanted things colder. Since they were able to move around inside of my any technology connected to the North Pole's network, their flights would sometimes have real-world consequences. Every computer in my neighborhood overheated to the point of catching on fire once because Heat Mister lost a bet 200 out of 300 checkers match. One time, Heat Mister didn't laugh at one of Snow Mister's jokes, and he pouted so hard all the food in the kitchens became frozen food. I had a lot of popsicles that week, and some of those popsicles were hot dogs. When we arrived in the field, we were greeted with an enormous metal dome, taking up the entire non-spa half of the stadium. There were only one door, so all five of us walked inside, and it slid closed on its own. I can't even see my hands, I heard Celia say. She was right. The whole dome was in pitch black. Klaus called out from behind us. Heedy? Snowbro? I heard Bud snort, then put on a fake baby voice. Help me, Snowbro! The darkness is so scary! Shut up. Heedy, where are you? I said shut up. Klaus! Up in the dark sky, a huge sun appeared and started beaming warmth down at us. It had a big white smile and was wearing sunglasses, which I thought were funny. How's my little buddy? Heat Mister's voice was loud and quick, like a crackling fire. You might not recognize me because I'm a hologram, but it's your favorite uncle, Heat Mister. Klaus rolled his eyes, but I could tell he was just smiling a little. I know it's you, Heaty. Favorite uncle, my switchboard. A huge icy moon eclipsed the sun, and a thin smile spread along its craters. The moon was also wearing sunglasses, and it was still funny. Everyone knows I'm Claus's favorite. Stonemaster always sounded a little bored, even when he was freaking out. And you've gotten so tall, Claus, darling. You just saw me last week, Snowbro. Claus was staring at the ground and smirking. I put my hands on my cheeks and opened my mouth in shock at Celia. This is the cutest thing I've ever seen, I mouthed. She stuck out her tongue like she was grossed out by it. Could you give us a floor or something, guys? Claus asked the brothers. It's pretty weird to be standing on nothing. Duh, if Ice Brain here didn't move us so slow, I would have done it ages ago. The sun bumped the moon out of the way and its rays grew bigger and brighter. I could really feel the heat coming off of them then, which I was surprised by. As heat mister lit up the ground, a beautiful green field started growing around us. Suddenly, there was thick, bright grass as far as we could see, with the occasional tree or animal running around it. I knelt down to touch the grass. It felt real. I saw Ram pet the rabbit on his head. Buzz swung on a tree branch. Welcome, Klaus, and the rest of you and the rest of you to our state-of-the-art holo chamber. Snow Mister swooped down to the horizon and blew. A wave of cold washed over us, and the grass shrunk and turned brown. Snow fell from the sky, and the leaves in the trees turned brown and then fell off. Heat Mister frowned at having his field ruined but kept talking. We've got full control of artificial reality here. It's really very impressive. Snow Mister sighed. You don't tell people something's impressive, brother. You just let them be impressed. Oh, so now you're saying I'm a show off. I didn't say that. But you're but that's what you mean. You are so immature. 
The sun and the moon pressed up against each other, and the world around us started shifting in strange ways. The trees grew green leaves, while snow fell on top of them. A tropical storm dumped on us and froze into an ice block as soon as it reached the ground. Guys! Klaus yelled, drawing the brother's attention. Can we get started with the challenge, please? Heatmister sucked the water out of her clothes and hair, leaving us dry again. Of course, little buddy. Let's get going. We should try to explain the rules. Snowmister looked to his right, and a bulleted list appeared in the sky next to him. This challenge will test how you could survive the harshest climates in the world, as Santa must every Christmas. To that end, there are a series of rules. Rule number one. In case of emergency, all contestants should... Heatmister interrupted him with a growl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's simple. Don't die and keep moving. Ready, set, go. Santa clearly said... Heatmister interrupted him with a loud, extended fart sound effect. The floor below us started moving backward, and the whole world around us moved along with it. We all started walking to keep up. I'm first, Heatmister said. Welcome to one of my favorite places on the earth, the desert. Which desert? Celia asked. Doesn't matter. I could feel the moisture being sucked out of the world, and what was left of the grass, the trees melted into growing denses of sand. Soon, we were struggling to keep moving with our feet sloshing through the loose grains. Ah! I groaned as I started and struggled not to fall on my face. It's so hot! Celia made a motion with her hands like she was fanning herself, activating the air conditioning I programmed her in a suit. I shifted my suit to a pair of shorts and a tank top to cool down. Don't forget your hover jets! I reminded Celia. Oh yeah! I was so excited about those when you put them in. She flattened her palms around the floor and powerful jets of air started shooting out of her sleeves and pants. She sprayed sand everywhere but lifted up the ground and didn't have to trot on the hot surface anymore. Nice to have a challenge where we can actually use our suits, Bud said. His shoes turned into little sleds with tiny rockets on black and he skated on the sand. You think you're so tough. Heatmister chuckled above us. Let's see how you fare against my sandworm. The ground rumbled below us, and we saw a cloud of sand being spewed up into the air as something burrowed toward us at extreme speed. Within seconds, an enormous monster burst out of the ground in front of us, covered in scales and with six rows of sharp teeth spinning around inside a circular mouth. It roared in our faces, dove at me, and then froze completely solid. My turn! Snowmister sing songed. The moving sound quickly ushered the frozen worm behind its own way. The sand started leveling out to a huge frozen lake. Celia stayed in the air, and Buzz stayed in his sleds. Klaus's shoes grew blades in the bottom for ice skating, and ramps scooted along on his butt. I focused and elongated my shoes into skis. Celia rubbed her shoulder like she was cold to activate her heating system. My suit grew into a big, fluffy coat. What? But I barely got a turn. The water started melting as Heat Mister got angry, but Snow Mister eclipsed again and froze it back over her, and it got too thin. That's not fair. Those are the rules. Snow Mister flew across the sky, and the lake in front of us lit up in series of squares like a checkboard. Each square had a number inside it, starting with one where we were and gradually escalating in distance. Speaking of rules, some of this ice is safe to pass over, and some is very dangerous. If you would like to stay alive, you must stay away from prime numbers, numbers divisible by 91, numbers that appear in any movie released between October 22, 1991 and November 22, 1992. Any number has the same backward and forward numbers I don't like, my favorite number, any number that, all right, all right, you've tortured them enough. Let's pull you out of the snow's wheel, kids. My turn. Heat mister spread its light, and the ice started melting. Clouds formed above us, and rain started pouring down 
replacing the frozen lake with a vast ocean. A storm whipped up around us with lightning and thunder, while the waves grew and smashed against each other. I saw Celia try to fly, but apparently water was not good for the suit's air jets. I tried to think of what else my suit can do. What could I make? It clicked. I shifted my shoes into big flippers, and my hat expanded around my head and sealed up my neck. The hat's color faded until it was totally see-through. Now that I could breathe and see, I swam deeper into the water to get away from the crazy storm up above. I saw Claus sail by in a comfy-looking submarine. I looked up above and saw the bottom of a surfboard that said Bud's Brownie and the kicking legs of what must have been Ramp clinging to the back of it. Celia made us use oxygen I had built into her hat. A huge stream of bubbles and a muffled slurping sound rose from below. I felt myself being tugged deeper underwater and tried to swim against the current with very little success. Claus's submarine came flying backward toward me and I grabbed onto a tube, jutting off the side. Buzz and Ramp slammed against the top of their surfboard when flying down to the deeps. They held onto their pieces of the submarine too. Claus was banging the glass from the inside and I think he was yelling, get off, but his voice was muffled by the water and metal. I felt myself, I felt something grab my foot and looked down. It was Celia. She climbed up my leg and took the same handhold as me as we were sucked down to the bottom of the ocean. The submarine thunked onto the ground and then the current dragged us toward a giant pit swallowing all the water. Then we were in a tube, pulling us down and in all sorts of directions, ending straight up. The water pushed us higher, higher, and then out of a geyser. I looked at the landscape below us, around us. How pretty! I yelled now that we were out of the water. A beautiful island! Black cracked the ground, water all over, and then, oh, a volcano full of lava! That we are currently heading straight for! The four of us outside kicked off the submarine and tried to fight the direction we were falling. I shook the water out of my suit and pulled my hat off my face while Celia kicked on her hover jets. I and Ramp somehow grabbed hold of her suit and dragged her down, but we would that at least made it on the rim of a volcano. Buzz was using his rocket sled shoes as a poorly balanced upside down steering wheel for this fall and kept having to push his shirt out of his face. The glass front of the submarine popped up and Claus's seat ejected. He flew out of the way of the volcano's mouth and a parachute shot out of his chair to carry him gently to the edge. The five of us collapsed on the ground and groaned. We had barely started complaining when the ground started rumbling. The volcano was erupting! Celia yelled. Can we get a break, please, Heedy? Claus yelled. The sun didn't answer. Snow, bro? The moon didn't answer either. The two circles in the sky were too busy bashing into each other. Bramp was lying on the ground with his eyes closed. What? You kids can't... Uh, take it? Back in my day, we shut up! Claus yelled. You're so terrible pretending to be a kid that it isn't even funny anymore. I am a kid, Ram protested. See, listen. Saturday morning cartoons. Ram spread his arms out wide like the argument was over. Couldn't say that if I was an adult, could I? As a kid, only secret that it is. Celia smirked at Klaus. Looks like he's got you with that one. I nodded. It's nice to see Ram frustrating something else for a change. 100% for sure. A kid, I guess. Klaus took a deep breath and pushed on his forehead with his hands. Okay, look, I hate him and I think I might actually hate all of you a little bit, but the last time they got in a huge fight, it lasted three weeks. The volcano rumbled again. So? Ramp asked. Yeah, so? Celia said. So, since they never got around to tell us what to do in case of emergency, we don't know how to get to the exit. It might just keep rolling random settings and trap us in the stupid dome forever. And I don't know if you figured this out, but... He was interrupted by another, much more urgent rumble from the volcano. 
If you die in a big red suit, you die in real life. Oh, I thought I decided correcting him was no longer important to me, but everyone got so quiet so I had to keep going. I thought maybe maybe you you were going to see if we die in like the simulation. I think we're all pretty sure that the clothes don't make a big difference. Buzz nodded. It's a good point, Ollie. I think maybe Klaus got swept up in the drama at the moment. This is why I said I hated all of you. Can you take something seriously for five seconds, please? Maybe you need to. Like, take stuff a little less seriously, Klaus. Celia raised an eyebrow at him. People might like you more. Ramp snorted. <laughs> Kids like us might call that one a sick burn. I don't care if people call me like that. Right now, I don't want to get third degree burns for an effectively real volcano. All right, I said. I totally forgot about the... At this moment, the volcano chose to erupt. I braced myself to melt. Klaus was right, though. We weren't taking it seriously enough, and now we're all going to be cooked like a bunch of delicious hams. I thought about how hams used to be pigs and felt very sad about the second. I hoped nobody is throwing any pigs in a volcano. No, I don't think that's how it works. You're probably right about that, me. Wait, how do we have so much time to think about this? Are we dead? I nervously opened my eyes and saw pure white all over me. I patted my body and it was still there. The white was moving and very cold. A blizzard? I yelled. The volcano erupted in a blizzard? I have an idea! Celia yelled. I moved through the white through her voice and saw the rest of us contestants doing that too. We need to get to the edge of the dome. It won't let us. Klaus's suit was glowing, and snow was melting as it landed on him. It's going to keep moving the landscape and creating things to keep us from the center. What if someone loses a challenge? Buzz interrupted. What if one group starts moving so the landscape moves with them, and someone stays here? Eventually, it'll have to bump then to the edge of the dome, right? I'm not doing that. Klaus immediately made sure there was no question. No way. Well, luckily I wasn't asking then, jerk. Buzz looked at me as the snow thinned. I can't do it, Ollie. I can't be Santa. What? I yelled. You won two challenges. You can't give up. Actually, I totally can. I thought you wanted to be Santa. Nah. Buzz sat down on the ground, but raised his hand up to give me a fist bump. You gotta win, Ollie. You, or Celia, would be great. I mean it. My eyes filled with tears while I fist bump him. I'll never forget you, Buzz. I'm not dying, Ollie. You'll see me in like 50 minutes, stop. Buzz's snowboard flew out of the volcano and he snatched it up from the air. He ripped the fin off it. Check it out, snowboard! I took it from him. Celia and I got it. Buzz untied his sled shoes and handed it to Ramp. Wait! Where's Klaus? I looked down to the side of the volcano and saw him speeding away on skis. Go! Buzz said. Don't let him get too far ahead! We kicked off and zoomed down the mountain. Before long, we weren't even on the mountain anymore. We were in the middle of a snowy forest where all the trees were on fire. A few seconds later, and we were in a messed up version of a savanna where several confused lions were interacting with polar bears standing on an iceberg. A bunch of mountain goats jumped around the boat sinking in the ocean, and then a rainforest grew in the middle of the city. We passed the moose standing on top of a, mount a moving river with a flaming skull from her head, then stared straight at me and said, Buy low! Sell high! Kerb would have liked that, I thought, and also, this computer is getting very confused. A loud horn blared for several long seconds while we navigated a beach covered in giraffes with only two legs. I bet that's Buzz losing. Celia looked up at the sky. And it should get their attention. She was right. The sun and the moon stopped bashing into each other and rotated their faces towards us. Oh! Snowmaster called out. It looks like Buzz Brownie is out. Really? I figured it would have been the tiny one. Hey! I said because I was the tiny one. Heat Mister zoomed in to look closely at the landscape, and I had to shield my eyes from his rays. 
Oh, yeesh, that's weird. A dolphin with two hairy human legs chirped happily as it ran in the sand. Snow Mystic turned up his nose. If you had let me program the challenge like I wanted to, oh, would you look at the time? Heat Mister interrupted. It's been 80 minutes. Also, no nas. Quit complaining, o'clock. Your point, while immature, is correct. Bud's prowling is eliminated. The challenge is over. I need to get away from you. The moon flew away and blinked out of existence. The sun grew bright red with anger. Oh no, you're not getting away from me that easily. The sun flew over to the moon, probably to make some toasters malfunction somewhere. Around us, the simulation flickered, sputtered, and then disappeared. We fell a few inches onto the real ground and were back in a surprisingly small dome, dimly lit this time. Buzz waved to us from against the wall. The door's over here, guys! Good job, everybody, I said. Celia and I high-fived. Ramp nodded. Klaus ignored us and walked straight past Buzz and out the door. I'm sorry, I said to Buzz, when you made it to him. He bumped me on the top of my head. Don't worry about it. We made it! Celia led us to the real sunlight and immediately fell to the ground. I collapsed next to her. Ramp was already snoring, and he didn't even lie down. Celia laughed. Has he got the right idea? I couldn't keep in a little cheer. We're in the top four! She gave me a thumbs up. Let's celebrate. After a short nap. Maybe a long nap. Honestly, celebrating sounds like a lot of work. A very long nap. I hope it'll be enough, I thought. I have a feeling this wasn't even the hard part. Chapter 19 The main entrance to Claus Castle is through two doors that are at least three times as tall as a human adult and probably eight times as wide. Pushing the very heavy wood requires a whole team of elves all working together and even then, they're fighting against years of the doors being mostly immobile. There are a lot of side entrances, including one right next to the main doors. There really isn't any need to use the doors, except for the ceremony, to make Claus Castle look impressive and regal. So I felt very uncomfortable not helping. Are you sure I can't- No! No, sir. This is our job. We got it. An elf near the center of the right door pushed even harder than he had before, maybe to prove to us that everything was okay. His eyes looked like they were going to pop out of his head. The doors had opened less than an inch. The other door is right over there, Celia pointed out. So it's really no trouble at all. What a wrong dream of it, Miss Pixie. This is an official meeting between Santa Claus and his successor. He's right. Klaus looked up from his cell phone and waved his hand toward the team of elves. That had their fun. Tradition. Makes them feel special. Ramp ran his fingers through his beard. What makes this meeting so official? Why are we here? Celia sat down in the snow. I guess because we're the finalists. One of the four of us is definitely Santa. Klaus huffed. How lucky for the North Pole. An old man. A crybaby, a mad scientist, and a spoiled brat, Ram finished. Boom. And who are you calling an old man? I'm sixteen and three quarters. I'm not a crybaby, I said, tears swelling up in my eyes. And the only person I'm mad at is you. Celia glared at Klaus. So watch it. The door had only opened in two inches now. I decided to help. You don't have to gra gra do that, Mr. Gnome. The elf man looked like if you turned a stick bug into a person, but he never stopped smiling pleasantly, even when he was yelling under the strain. It's really okay, they're about to start fighting and I don't Oh Jesus heavy. Ha I didn't really want to be a part of this fight, you know. The stick man nodded, which made his hat slide off his sweaty head and pop into the snow. I hope you don't mind me saying so, Mr. Gnome, but I think <coughs> you'd make a wonderful Santa. Do you think so? I do. Santa should be someone truly kind, and it's high time an elf is in charge. Well, maybe, but Celia's smarter and good at working plans. 
and Klaus is a natural leader who has trained for this for his whole life, and Ramp... Well, Ramp's not gonna win, right? Even so, you got my support. I felt all warm and fuzzy. Even when Celia and I had been throwing parties and doing charity work before the marathon, no one had been so direct and kind. Even people who liked me seemed to believe Santa was making a mistake changing the tradition. Having someone who worked in the castle say I would be a wonderful meant me a lot. I felt ready to take on the world. Celia walked up and pushed on the other door. Klaus is in. Who made this so heavy? Oh my gosh, I'm in a bad mood. Like always. He's probably nervous. I don't know, but they should be fired from ever making any doors again about seeing Santa. I wonder if they're talked at the all since the conference room. Well, I don't think so. This is good enough. She met the door, and they looked at the crack we made, which was now an opening a couple of feet wide. The team of elves collapsed on the ground, and I took deep breaths to try and calm myself. Claus immediately breezed past us and through the opening, practically dropping, dropping his coat on the floor before he'd even make it through the doors. Ramp slowly hobbled after him, and I followed Celia in after giving the stick man a hug. The entrance to Claus Castle has got to be the most beautiful thing at the North Pole, and there are a lot of really beautiful things at the North Pole. Coming in through the double doors put us right in the center of two lush, red-carpeted staircases mirroring each other in the gentle curves up on the second floor. Below the balcony at the top, a hallway stretched for what felt like forever, a gorgeous red carpet down the center. A whole separate team of elves took our coats. I ran and passed everyone and swung around. Portraits of various sizes hung everywhere with different Santas with their families. Directly above the entrance doors, bigger than all of them, was a portrait of the original Kris Kringle, playing with what looked like and would have been the very first model train. He wasn't in his traditional suit for this portrait either. He looked more like Kris Kringle, the inventor. He had goggles on his forehead like Celia did when she was busy at work. He was wearing overalls with all sorts of tools sticking out of his pockets, but he wasn't using any of them. He was just grinning from ear to ear and pointing at a toy train spewing steam out of its snow smack. This portrait was painted by anyone, you know. Santa appeared in the balcony up above us and smiled and waved. As he descended the stairs, he continued, Chris Kringle invented the machine that drew your portrait exactly like it saw you. He didn't know it then, but he was inventing an early version of something the rest of the world wouldn't have for hundreds of years. A camera. Chris Kringle was an inventor, leader, and lover of toys. Most important, though, he was kind to everyone. He loved the world and everything in it. Santa needs all of these qualities. He wasn't that great, Ramp snapped. I mean, we don't really know. All we have are stories. Stories are either too good to be true. Santa laughed. Well, maybe so. But his legacy, at least, speaks for itself. Yeah, because he threw out everything that didn't work. Ramp looked really angry, and I had no idea why. I remembered what Andrea had said, and glanced between him and the portrait. They did look alike. Wait a second. Celia didn't notice what was going on with Ramp because she was still staring at the portrait. If this was made when Chris Kringle was alive, that can't just be the first model train. That must be the first train. Period. Santa's grin got even wider, and he clapped both hands down on Celia's shoulders. I tried not to feel sad seeing Claus bristle with jealousy. That's exactly right. But he believed in letting the world discover things for themselves when they are ready, a belief we share even today. Can we get on with this? Klaus spoke just a little too loud, and his friend's voice echoed through the castle halls. Everybody already knows this stuff. Why are we even here? Santa looked down the ground for a moment, his smile gone. Well, of course, follow me. The heels of his dress shoes clicked on the ground as he headed into the banister, where he grabbed a small reindeer statue at the top of the rail and twisted it. The left staircase rumbled and folded up, revealing another set of stairs going underground. 
I looked at Celia, but she seemed just as lost as I was. No. Klaus charged forward at his stag, a bundle of furious energy. This isn't theirs. This isn't for them. He spat the word and glared back at us. You've never seen and let me in there before. Klaus, please. I know what I'm doing. I'm out of here. He turned and headed down the center hallway, probably to leave the room. I'll go in there when I'm Santa, and not one second before. I refuse to be part of this. Santa followed him for a few steps. Claus, if you would just- I don't want to hear it. A door slammed, and Santa winced. We all held our breath, while Santa rubbed his tired eyes. I'm sorry about that, you three. Let's continue. He flipped the switch inside the new stairwell, and electric lights, built to look like torches, lit up and flickered all the way down. It was a long way. Down here is where we keep Kris Kringle's legacy safe. Santa led us to the bottom of the stairs and the dead end. In front of the wall was a little snow globe on the north pole displayed on a pedestal. Santa wrapped his fingers around the globe and it glowed with a blue light that moved up and down, scanning his hand. This only recognized someone who has been sworn in as Santa, he said and then winked. So don't get any funny ideas about coming down here by yourself. The blue light died and jingle bells chimed. The stone wall rumbled and lifted, revealing a clean white corridor with indentations along the walls, each holding a different invention. There's a train! Celia pointed, already ahead of us. The hall. In the first big red suit and its original notes on reindeer genetics. Chris Kringle did the science and wrote it down, Ollie. Whoa, I said. I wasn't as excited as she was, but I knew that was the response she wanted to hear. There's nothing better than watching your friends get excited about the things they love. Ramp, however, was standing at the entrance, wringing his hands. His face was sweaty and twisted into an uncomfortable expression. Are you okay? I whispered. I'm fine, he practically growled. Let's keep moving. I understand how you feel, Santa said. I was nervous too, my first time here. It's a lot to take in. We have his notes for every invention we know, except one. If we have these notes, why haven't we used them? Celia asked. I thought we couldn't re replicate anything. We can't. Santa kept walking down the hall and we followed. Everything we have is missing something. Something crucial. Like he went through the cookbook and tore a whole page out of every recipe. But still, with this as a springboard, trust me, we've tried. For hundreds of years. None of our scientists can replicate anything, I said. Until Bertrand? Santa gave me a confused look, which he didn't expect. What do you mean? Celia looked at me wide-eyed. He hasn't told them? How did they not know? Uh, never mind, I just mean that I bet Bertrand could. Oh, could be. Smart kid. He hasn't been talking to us lately. Losing the race got him pretty down. Yikes. Have you, uh, seen the sleigh? He won't show it to us. Why? Double yikes. Uh, no reason. Just, uh, just never mind. We reached the end of the hallway. This time, with the microphone in front of it. Santa cleared his throat and said, Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Jingle bells chimed. A robotic voice said, Santa recognized, Welcome, Matthew Claus. Chris Kringle actually built all this too. Originally was his private workshop. The wall rumbled and slid up again, revealing a simple circular room with various half-finished projects scattered around it. Now it's mine, and one day, it will be one of yours. Santa gestured to the center of the room where the quantum Kringle floated suspended in mid-air by some kind of energy coming from the ceiling and the floor. He gently plucked it in the air and held it out to us. Would you like to touch it? Celia and I stared at the swirling galaxy of snow. We reached out together and rested our hands on it. It felt warm and alive. It vibrated like it was humming. Ram's hands were clenched into the fabric of his shirt, tugging at it 
too hard. He looked like he was having trouble keeping it together. It's okay, Santa judging nudged him. It forward. You're not going to hurt it. Ramp reached one shaky hand out and touched it. Immediately, his body calmed down. Ramp stared deeply into it, and I watched the swirling galaxy reflecting in his eyes. It's beautiful, he said. Santa pulled it away from us and put it into place, but Ramp kept his eyes on it. The quantum kringle is what makes Santa, Santa. This is what makes Christmas possible. Without it, Santa couldn't get all around the world. We couldn't keep inspiring all those kids to make wishes, so we'd have no power. All the elves and humans at North Pole would have to go back to living with everyone else. We wouldn't be able to do this good. We do without this one thing. And it's also the only thing for which Kris Kringle left no notes. Not a single hint on how to make another one. Santa adjusted his tie and tugged his suit jacket. I want to remind you what you're competing for. The job comes with beauty, but also centuries of responsibility and power you need to gentle with. Imagine most havoc the Quantum Kringle could cause if it was used as a weapon. Faster than light trial is dangerous. Do you understand? Celia and I nodded, and Ramp just stared. Good, let's go. Santa led us back to the little workshop and the wall with the microphone close behind us. He led us down the hallway and the wall with the hand scanner close behind us. He held up in the stairs and twisted the reindeer statue, closing the stairs. No one even knew there was a hallway if they weren't looking for it. Celia and I let out a deep breath we had been holding. Ramp stared at the statue. Santa continued. Your next challenge is to prove you can use it. Santa had to travel all around the world, so you have to know the world. All of it. Every continent. Every country. Every street. Every chimney. You have to be able to navigate even if your computer fails. And you have to think on your feet. To the end, we're going to have a quiz competition. So study up. He gave us each a hug. And if any of you decides this is too much for you, now's the time to back out. I want the winner to come with me on my delivery tour this year, so we'll hold the final round on the morning of Christmas Eve. You have until then to decide. I don't mean to argue, but isn't that maybe a bad idea? Celia asked. Everyone will be doing last-minute preparations for that night, and Santa grinned. Sure, but it's dramatic, right? I guess so. He clapped his hands once. Great. Then it's settled. I'll see you then. I've got to talk to my son. The elves at the door hasn't even tried to shut the main doors yet, so he walked straight outside. Ramp powered ahead of us and kept walking, not even stopping to say goodbye. What's up with him? Celia asked. I shrugged. What's ever up with him? When we turned and looked back at Claw's castle, it felt so big up close. Scary big. I grabbed Celia's hand and squeezed. She squeezed back. We could handle it. We could win this thing. I thought about the stick man. You've got my support. My phone buzzed. It was a text message from Mom. Have you seen the news? I texted back. No. You need to go home. Now. Chapter 20 My whole family was crowded around the TV when we got back to my house. Maria Duende had a countdown on NPNN to the unveiling of a breaking news story about Ollie Gnome's shocking secret. I was so sick of countdowns. We're verifying our information currently, but if our source is telling the truth, Ollie Gnome might not be the elf we all thought he was. More on the story after we get a statement from Santa Claus tonight at 7 on the North Pole Nightly News, available only on the North Pole News Network. I don't think I have a shocking secret, 
Do I? I asked. Celia shook her head. No way. I'd know if you have a shocking secret. My mom crossed her arms. That's what we thought. Ollie's an open book. Still, Maria wouldn't make such a big deal out of it if it wasn't something real. Everybody in North Pole is going to be watching this tonight. My dad started cleaning the living room, which he always did when he got nervous. All we do is wait until the end. No one or no use getting all worked up. He handed Polly a plate to take to the kitchen and she stopped on the way to give him a hug. I'm sorry you have a shocking secret. Me too, Polly. I made casserole, my dad said. It has jelly beans in it. You'll feel better after eating. But I didn't feel better after eating. I feel like I was going to throw up. The timer on the TV just kept ticking down to the breaking news and the shocking secret. No matter who wins, no matter what happens in Maria's show, we're partners. Beal? Celia stuck her hand up for me to shake. I reached my hand out and shook it. Beal. It's coming on, Mom said. When Andrea's face was the first thing to appear, I knew I was in trouble. Her eyes were red like she'd been crying and her long hair was messy, but the perfect kind of messy. A lock of bright red kept falling in front of her face, but she acted like she was so emotional she didn't notice. It would have been heartbreaking if it wasn't all a lie. I hate to do this, she said, but I've thought about it for a while and I know I have to talk about it. I lost the next top nutcracker challenge and was kicked out of the Santa trials because Ollie Gnome intentionally sabotaged my Santa suit. No way. That's a serious accusation. Maria was making the face she made when she had to look serious but knew she was nailing a really good story. Can you tell us how? I don't know exactly how it works, but he gave me this button and said it was for good luck. He was lying. The button electrocuted my suit and froze me completely, right when I was in the most danger. This can't be happening. Seriously? Again? Hard to believe. Maria Duente's face was back on screen, looking very serious. We thought so too, until we saw for ourselves. Footage started playing from somebody's phone camera, which clearly showed me leaving my seat and moving closer to the stage. Andrea was throwing her swords around. I pulled out the remote and very clearly looked from it to her and back to it. I pushed the button and her suit immediately sized up. The swords fell all around her. It was only a few seconds of footage because everything happened so fast. Maria made sure to slow it down for clarity and then slow it down even more. And then I played again and then zoom in on the remote control and mark it with a red circle connecting the circle with an arrow to another circle surrounding, Andrea falling like a play-by-play. -play. He didn't know my choreography. Andrea's voice played over the video. He froze my suit, knowing I could get hurt by the swords. She came back on the screen, rubbing tears away from her eyes. Sorry, this is hard to watch again. Oh, it's alright. Maria smiled and handed her a handkerchief. Take your time. I kept this to show you. She pulled the smiley face button out of her pocket and smile smudged by a black mark from the electricity discharge. Andrea, would it surprise you to know that he's used these buttons in the competition before? It wouldn't have surprised me at all. Nothing would at this point. Who knows what he's capable of? Well, we have more footage to show you. Now it was one of Maria's floating cameras that flew around during the race. It showed me climb the leg of Goldie's sleigh and pull the smiley button off my shirt. It showed me shove the button to the crack to the top of the leg and the electric burst that followed. Goldie's sleigh tumbled to the ground. This is so stupid! Celia yelled at the TV. You thought it was just a regular button and she gave it to you! But they don't know that, I thought and curled up tighter on the couch. I tried to remember if any of my conversations with Andrea had been caught on camera, and I couldn't think of any. 
There was no cameras in the stable. There were no cameras when she gave me the first button. Maria Duende had just stopped recording her when we talked about the second button. Even later in the race, Andrea continued, he tried to completely destroy my sleigh after he had already passed me on the track. A video played of me screaming jingle bells like a maniac while flinging the ground marbles at her sleigh. I looked furious and even scary. When the camera cut back to Andrea, she did a cartoonish shiver. I'm lucky I didn't get seriously injured. Very lucky, Maria nodded. We've given all this information to Santa and Mrs. Claus. They're with us now. Liv, from Claus Castle. Hello, Santa. Hello, Maria. The camera split to show Santa and Mrs. Claus looking tired and sad at the desk together on one half of the screen and Maria on the other. How are you feeling? We... Santa choked up and rubbed his eyes. I immediately started sobbing. My parents came and wrapped their arms around both my shoulders. Mrs. Claus rubbed Santa's back and finished the sentence. We're disappointed. Santa and I truly believe this was a good group of kids. We couldn't imagine such direct sabotage would be occurring in a competition meant to build a better Christmas. They hate me. I ruined everything. Have you reviewed the evidence? We have. Mrs. Claus patted Santa, who put his hands down and addressed the camera. Given that this behavior was not directly covered in the rules, Andrea is still out of the competition. Her suit should not should have been prepared for anything, even electric failure. Maria nodded. That seems fair. And Ollie? Santa took a deep breath and let it out with a long sigh. <sighs> Mrs. Claus and I consider his behavior completely against the spirit of both this competition and Christmas. He paused for a long moment. This is hard to say, Maria. I was just this morning welcoming him into my home. I understand, Santa. Maria glanced down to the floor and shook her head. This is difficult for all of us. Santa cleared his throat and looked directly at the camera. At me. I could see the strain and the hurt in his eyes. I did that. I made Santa cry. My whole family was dead silent, even Polly. Celia glared at the screen like she was going to burn a hole through it. It felt like a hundred years before Santa finally spoke again, and I wished it really was. Ollie Gnome is disqualified. Chapter 21 The next few days were like sludge. I felt like I was sick. I couldn't leave the house without being swarmed like cameras and reporters from NPNN, but I didn't want to leave the house anyway. I don't know how many days it was. Maybe it was a whole week. Maybe even two weeks. I would eat food when my dad brought it to me and talk if mom asked me to talk. Polly would bring books and make me read to her. I couldn't bear to think about what everyone was saying about me, so I didn't think at all. Until the doorbell rang. Dad! I yelled from my room. The doorbell rang! Nobody answered. Mom? Nothing. The doorbell rang again. Polly? Still nothing. I guess they'd gone out of lunch without me. When the doorbell rang a third time, I rolled to the floor. I brought the covers down with me, so I was wrapped up like a caterpillar. I inchwormed my way along the floor to the door of my room and nudged it open with my nose. The hallway was wider, so I was able to roll in the bundle all the way down it toward the entryway. When I got to the front door, I lifted my legs up and flicked the lock on the door with my toes. Without waiting for me to even try to open it the rest of the way, Celia burst in and stepped over me, carrying a huge covered tray. Get up, she said, and kept walking to the kitchen. You left the door open, I mumbled, but didn't make any move to fix it. Because you have company. Company? That's what I said. I turned to look at the open door, and Buzz was standing in it with two big boxes of sodas in one arm 
in a box wrapped in colorful Christmas wrapping paper in the other. Oh, hey Ollie. Buzz stepped over me and headed to the kitchen as well. What are you doing on the floor? What are you doing in my house? I responded. He didn't answer, and suddenly, Bertrand was in the doorway. I sat up, didn't unwrap the covers. Bertrand was wearing one of his signature bow ties and smiling really big. Where do I put these? he asked, and held up a basket of cupcakes with one hand. Or this. He held up a very tiny wrapped box on the other. That depends, I answered. On what is he even going on right now? We're in here, Bertrand, Celia called from the kitchen. Marvelous. He squeezed around me and kept walking. Sally was in the doorway now, pizza boxes in one hand and a book in the other. She didn't even look up from the book, just walked past me to the kitchen. Hey, wait, what are you? I stood up and started to follow her. Oh, cool. You're doing like a cocoon thing. That's cool. Cocoons are pretty deep. Kurt was in the doorway now with a box of donuts in a wrapped cylinder. The donuts are actually in this one, he said, shaking the wrapped box. I thought it would be funny. It's totally funny, I said because it was. But, uh, why did you bring donuts? Kurt laughed and walked to the kitchen. In the doorway now was a wrap box that Gadzooks rose out of, carrying a tray of poached eggs and even larger wrap boxes. How did you fit that box in that box? I asked. How did you fit you in that box? Oh, hush. This day's for celebration. She looked me up and down. You're hardly dressed for the occasion. We'll have to fix that. She bumped into me as she walked toward the kitchen. I reached to grab the box from the doorway, but the box was gone. I realized my hands weren't restricted by the blanket, so I looked down. I was wearing a tuxedo. I touched my hair. It was washed and gelled. I coughed and felt something stuck in my throat. I coughed a few more times, stuck my hand in my mouth, and drew out a feather. Got me again, Gatsuks. No one appeared for a few seconds, so I started to close the door. A wrinkly hand stopped it from shutting and pushed it back open. This is how you treat your guests? Ramp grumbled. Slam the door in their faces? Oh, sorry, Ram, I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't carrying anything but started pushing me past me. I heard it was a party. Where's the grub? A party? I said it all surprised, even though I had basically figured that out by now. The door shut this time, and I followed Ram into the kitchen. For what? Food was now piled over on the counters in the kitchen. The dining room table had a bunch of wrapped boxes piled high on it. Don't tell me you forgot. Celia put her hands on her hips and smirked at me. Forgot what? It's December 11th, exactly two weeks before Christmas. She grabbed her covered tray and walked to the center of the room. Kurt, who had apparently brought his guitar, strummed the chord. Everyone sang, Happy wait one second, Kurt interrupted. He plucked up a string and tuned it up a little. Okay, now. He played the chord again. Happy birthday to you. Celia lifted the tall corner of her tray and revealed a cake decorated like Little North Pole. Happy birthday to you. Little toy elves lit the candles and little cars drove around the North Pole streets. Claus Castle lit up and sparkled. Happy birthday, dear Ollie. A little elf who looked just like me shot a little tiny firework and waved. Happy birthday to you. The big one too. Make a wish, Celia said. I leaned over and blew out the candles. I wish for the same thing I ever wished for. I wish for this Christmas to be the best Christmas ever, even though that seems unlikely, especially what, because they seem unlikely. Everybody cheered and I was very embarrassed. I can't believe I forgot my birthday. Before anyone could say anything, something heavy slammed into our back door, rattling the whole house. I glanced around at the other guests, and they all seemed surprised too. Slowly, I crept over to the back door and grabbed the doorknob, and I cracked it open. 
Happy birthday, Ollie. Sorry we're late. It was Crasher, scrambling back to the standing. Behind her, Snoozer, Truther, Rocker, Slammer, Jammer, and all three members of Treason for the Season were gently landing my empty sleigh on the ground in our backyard. We wanted to make sure we brought her. Crasher motioned with her nose at Horse while they unhooked from the sleigh. Happy birth, Horse! Horse whinnied. Jet fuel can't melt birthdays, Truther mumbled as the reindeer walked inside. Thanks, I think. Over the next hour, more and more people rang the doorbell. Luther came in his jacket sewn. Happy birthday, jerk. Chef came and brought his own grill to cook reindeer nuggets for everyone. The stick man and his buddies from the castle door all came. Mom, Dad, and Polly eventually came. It was a huge group, and they were all there to see me. The only people who think you did it are the ones who don't know you, Buzz told me. That's the kind of thing I would do, but not you. Still, I'm sorry that you're down, Buzz. You gave up to let us win. I don't want in charge, Duvis. He flicked my nose and made me laugh. Don't get me wrong. I am very strong and smart and cool, but I didn't want to win. And now I can't. The way I see it, Sally crunched down a nacho and didn't look up from her book titled How to Talk to People at Parties. You and Scylla have always been a team, right? It doesn't matter who wins. That's what I said. Celia hugged my shoulders and handed me some fruit punch. We're partners. Dad's not going to change his mind. Kurt was setting up Treason's instruments for an impromptu show. We tried talking to him, but he's a pretty stubborn dude. But now Celia has to win. Where Trent was hanging out with Horse, who we had disconnected from the sleigh and set on the table. And you can't win without you. Two horses are better than one! We all present presents to participate in your perfect pile practice parties. Gadzooks waved with a pile of gifts. Bertrand laughed. She means this is all stuff to help you study. Buzz grinned and posed. Most of us will be busy preparing for Christmas, but we wanted to help, so we all brought something. I didn't. Ram crunched on some hard candies, because I wasn't actually invited. Sally held up how to talk to people at parties. Do you need to borrow this ramp? Ram's eyes glinted. Cheeky. I loved hearing all my friends laugh. It's gonna be okay, I thought. Chapter 22 You brought two presents each for brothers Mozart and Beethoven. When you arrive at their house, however, there's a new baby we didn't know about. What do you do? Celia thought for a second. Take one present from each other for the baby. They can't stay mad at it. It's a baby. Buzz's presence was a kind of flare gun that could build and shoot fireworks. I fired a tiny one that spelled I'm so impressed in bright green lights. Okay, next one. I flipped to a random page in the giant Santa manual. Sally and Celia had no chance of winning without a copy, so it was her gift. You go into the apartment of a married couple with two kids. They have a stocking up for their dog. What do you put in it? Nothing, it's a dog. I fired a red firework that said, Sorry, dude. It's amazing and beautiful they did and they loved their dog so much. I explained. Put one of your emergency dog treats in the stocking. But what if I ran out? Without those treats, a dog could wake up a whole family. Bring a lot of treats, I guess. Horse, who was still sitting on our dining table room, lit up her eyes. Installation horse plate. A tiny compartment opened in her middle neck, and a flash drive spat out. That was Bertrand's gift, a copy of the entire up-to-date naughty slash nice debate. It's a lot of data, but you might be able to use it for something. He had said at the party, Klaus will have to access it, so it's only fair. It was a day before Christmas Eve, though, and it had taken horse the full two weeks to download everything. So much for that. She could at least update our map, Celia said. I can study her updates tonight. You should get some sleep. I interrupted my own yawn to laugh. No one's sleeping tonight, I said, 
It's the night before, the night before Christmas. Everyone else is at the workshop, even Santa. I'm not going to leave you alone now. We just need to get energized. I push the only button on Kurt's gift, a cube only a few inches tall. Play a fun song. Grandma got run over by a reindeer and started playing, and I felt like I was trapped in a nightmare. A different song. It switched to something else upbeat and dancing. I figured you'd need a good study soundtrack, Kurt had said, so I got you every song. It gets way louder than it actually like it would, too. My phone and Celia's phone buzz at the same time. I checked mine first. It's an email to everybody at the workshop. My voice rose in pitch as I read further down the message, asking if anyone knows where Santa is. Celia was reading now, too. He's missed four inspections, starting two hours ago, last seen at the stable. Mrs. Claus is safe, but she has to stay with the wish generator to make sure it doesn't malfunction tonight since we're using so much power to finish preparations. We have to help. The whole North Pole can't take a break now, even to find them. Celia nodded. I won't be able to focus on studying now anyway. We threw on our coats and shoes and headed outside. I'll start looking in town and checking what's happened at this workshop, she said. You check the stable in Santa Claus Castle, right? Deal? Deal. We took off running in the opposite directions. I pulled out my phone, found Crash in the contacts, and dialed. She answered immediately. Sup, Captain? Are you in the stable? Nope. I'm helping get the big nine ready for tomorrow night. It's boring, you know. But importantly, they don't ask just about anybody to do it. Life or death stuff. Oh, I was just going to ask for help finding Santa, but if you're busy- Are you kidding? That sounds way more fun. I'll be right there. Sorry. You really have- You really don't have to. The phone went dead. Cool. I turned to a corner on the edge of the town and could finally see the whole stable. All four glass towers, even prettier at night, thanks to the lighting shining out of the dome. I paused for a second to admire how beautiful it was, and Crasher slammed into my back. Sorry, Captain, she yelled, not slowing down at all. I was tossed up and over her head, onto her back. I wrapped my arms around her neck, and she lifted us up toward a tower entrance. What's going on? she yelled over the wind. Santa's missing, I yelled back. He had a meeting with Dreamer before he disappeared. Got it. Crasher didn't set me down when we reached the tower like before. She just yelled, Duck! and flew down the spiral stairs at lightning speed. I squeezed my eyes closed so I wouldn't think about how would it hurt if we crashed into one of the walls. We burst through the entrance and Crasher tried to slow down before heading straight away to the clump of trees. I reached my arms up and grabbed the branch pulling myself off her before she tumbled into the trees and flopped onto the tall grass between them. That was amazing, she yelled. I let go and dropped to the ground, right in front of Maria Duende. Hi, Maria, I tried to sound angry. Why are you here, Ollie Gnome? She thrust the microphone in front of my face. I'm trying to find out what happened to Santa. Is that true? Yes. Or are you returning to the scene of the crime? In her excitement, she pushed the microphone too far and crumpled my nose. I stepped back in surprise and she gasped. Seems I have caught you off guard. Weren't expecting to be seen through so quickly. I definitely didn't kidnap Santa, I said, irritated that this was even being suggested. And I didn't sabotage Andre either. Everyone knows that but you. Maria paused and after a moment motioned for CA to turn off her camera. We came here to interview a dreamer, but he won't see me. He likes you, right? He gave you reindeer. Uh, I would say he likes me, but I think I would, I would know how to talk to him. Crasher was finally fully upright and off the ground. We left Maria and walked through the stable, which had a much different feel than it did the last time I'd been there. Fewer reindeer were around. Many were probably at the takeoff zone, helping Santa's team the big nine get ready. The rest were mostly sticking to the ground and talking in hushed tones. 
They watched me as Crasher passed by and whispered things about us. It's already spreading, I thought. They're worried about Christmas. Crasher waited at the entrance to the Dreamer's Grove, and I held my breath as I walked through the tree tunnel. Why did the chicken cross the playground? Dreamer's gentle, regal voice began before I had crossed all the way into the clearing. I looked around. It was hard to spot them with this voice coming from everywhere. Eventually I found them, floating up high, reading a book, nestled between branches on a tree. Dreamer, Santa's missing, and this was to get to the other side. He turned and looked at me in the eyes from the ab way above. His face didn't move at all. Ha! Is that a joke book? I requested one in the last meeting. I hated yours, of course, but I saw the potential. Uh, great. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Yes. He floated down and stared at me with his huge reindeer eyes. Nothing about his expression shifted even a little bit. They were hilarious. For example, what happens when you cross a vampire with a snowman? I knew this one. Frostbite. Dreamer reared back in the air and glared down his nose at me. You interrupted me. Sorry, I mean, what? Frostbite, ha ha ha. Now hurry up and explain why you're here. I don't have all the time to talk to you. All of us? Yes. Complainer was here, then the great gift giver himself, and then Pesterer, the one who is like a fly, always buzzing those cameras in places she doesn't even belong. And now you! Must I entertain every two leg tonight? Complainer? Dreamer shook his antlers and caught a falling ornament fruit in his mouth. Yes, your friends. I believe you gave him that name. So Ramp came to the stable. What did he want? He told me gift giver sent him to borrow three extra reindeer. I gave him the same three he used in the race. I mentioned it to gift giver when he arrived for our formal meeting, and he knew nothing about it. You are such pure, poor communicators. Do you know where he went after he left you? Of course not. So that was it. I bowed, said thank you, and left. I didn't tell Marie about Ramp. I didn't want her to broadcast anything until we all had the facts. I hopped on Crasher's back, and we set off toward Claw's castle. I checked the time on my phone, past midnight. As I was putting it back in my pocket, I got a text from Celia. Ramp's sleigh is gone. It's not in the workshop. He has a reindeer too, I sent back. Santa told us to think about whether we really wanted it. Maybe he is quitting? Maybe. No sign of Santa? Nope. Just now, getting to Klaus Castle. Crasher skid along the snow in front of the main doors, spraying snow all over the stick man who had been snoozing on a stool. Oh no! He looked around, eyes wide. I've been working more shifts lately, and I didn't get much sleep last night, and... It's okay, st- Wait. What's your name? Carl Cobalt. Carl, do you know- the Santa's missing? His hands drifted to his face, and he pushed his features around surprise. What? How long have you been asleep? I, I don't know, I haven't seen anybody, but... He looked at the time on his watch, and his face drained all of its color. A long time? I think the answer is a very long time. Oh no, what have I done? Santa's missing, and it's my fault. It's okay, calm down. I know where we should check. I'll wait, well, I'll wait out here, Captain. Crasher glanced around nervously, in case Santa comes back. I'm not willing to spook castles, you know? I walked to the one of the side doors, and Carl followed. Claw's castle was a lot spookier in the dark. It was old, and the walls were covered with paintings that seemed to move in the shadows. Even the plush carpet felt too squishy and weird to be safe. Ramp! I called. Nobody answered. Santa! Even the kids are out, Carl told me. Bertranis with his mom, Sally's at the workshop, and who knows with the other boys. How long has he been missing? About three hours. Carl nodded. We can't even call an official emergency yet. He could be just working off a sleigh somewhere and thought we knew about it. Or well, maybe. 
I got to the reindeer statue on the staircase and turned it to 90 degrees. The stairs folded up and revealed the other stairs, but the hole was so dark I couldn't see the bottom. Here you go. Carl handed me a big, heavy flashlight that felt like a club. Everybody in the security team got one of these. Thanks. I clicked on it and pointed to the hole. Stone stairs, scurrying spiders, the hand scanner snow globe, and, oh no, curled at the bottom was a body with no suit and a very jolly face. He's asleep, Celia checked his pulse and breath. He's even snoring a little bit. Why haven't you guys turned on the lights yet? Oh, right. Carl sheepishly crossed over the carpet to the door and flicked the switch, lighting the big electric chandelier and several smaller lights around the main hall. With the lights on, Santa was obviously breathing. His body was moving up and down. We shouldn't tell Maria yet. Celia gently shifted Santa into a more comfortable position. Everyone will panic. I'm panicking, I whispered out. What are we going to do at Christmas? Celia smacked Santa's face gently. Santa, wake up. Wake up, Santa. Santa just kept snoring. Hopefully he'll wake up for Christmas. Carl, could you call any security helpers to carry him off his bed? Carl nodded and walked away to say something into a walkie-talkie. Celia and I decided to investigate farther into the secret hallway. The walls were already up when he got here, so someone's been back here, Celia observed. Santa's the only one who can open the doors, though. So did someone follow him in, knock him out, and then drag him all the way down the hallway just to leave him here? That doesn't make sense. Celia walked ahead to the next room and froze in the doorway. The quantum kringle is gone! And this room is a wreck! Everything's been thrown around everywhere! We immediately ran back down the hallway where two secret helpers were lifting Santa up and carrying him toward the master bedroom. So someone took the kringle and Santa's clothes and then left. But they either dragged Santa back to the stairs for no reason, or Santa let them in himself, and they waited to knock him out until they were on their way back out. What if it was Klaus? I asked. I don't want to believe it, but maybe he was worried he wouldn't win. He's been really mad at Santa lately too. Or Andrea. I wouldn't put anything past her at this point. Or anyone else who lost the competition and doesn't think they should have. I put my face in my hands. My head really hurts. It's not going to do any good to keep guessing. I wish there were cameras. Carl gasped and rolled around. There are! Wait, really? Of course there are. I'm sorry I didn't think of it already. Look! He pointed to a corner inside a stairwell where a little metallic glint shone inside the stone. I mean, this is where Santa lives. He's got the best security team in the business. Even the security room has cameras. Carl led us outside and walked us around the back of the castle. He looked around the snow until he found what he was looking for. Fake clay snow, blending it with the real stuff. He pushed down the snow twice, and it rose up, revealing a hatch in the ground. We all jumped down. It was a small room, and not that we were three elves were cramped, standing in together. Lots of monitors were all over the walls, showing live camera feeds of every inch of Claw's castle. Somebody's coming, somebody comes and, and reviews the footage every day, just in case, but we haven't had a real security issue in, well, ever. Only real excitement we get is Kurt sneaking out at night. Carl rotated, uh, rotated us so that he was in front of the large keyboard and he hit a few buttons to pull up the entrance to Claus Castle where Carl was snoozing on the stool. And I'll rewind until we see something. He pressed an arrow key and the video started rewinding. Nothing happened for a while, so much that it was practically a still image until we saw a blip of something exit the castle backward and walk up to Carl. It happened too fast to understand, so he played it more slowly. Carl was awake. A figure totally covered in a hood and cloak walked directly up to him, 
held out a bunch of sticks and shook them in Carl's face. He immediately fell asleep. It wasn't your fault, I say. They put you to sleep. I smiled like I knew him too, but I don't remember that at all. He pushed the button that switched the camera over the main hall. The cloaked person twisted the reindeer statue, opening the stairway. At the bottom of the stairway was the hand recognizing snow globe. He put his hand over it, and it glowed with a blue light. After the scan was complete, the wall rose off the ground. See your frown. Santa said it only recognized Santa's, though. Could it be Santa's dad? The last Santa? I think he's still in California, but maybe. The cloaked person walked down the white hallway to the microphone. He took a deep breath and said something, causing the door to open. He walked through. Wait a second, go back. Carl rerounded a few seconds. Is there a sound? Celia asked. Yeah, let me just... Carl pushed a few buttons and clicked on a speaker. That should do it. Now, you could hear the figure take a deep breath. He yelled in his best booming voice. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Jingle bells chimed. A robotic voice said, Santa, recognize. Welcome, Christopher Kringle. What? I yelled. What? Celia yelled at the same time. What? Carl was also yelling, I think. It was very loud in a tiny room. Maybe we'd heard it wrong. Celia reached over him and rewound a little. The robotic voice said, Welcome, Christopher Kringle. Carl, apparently in shock, pressed rewind over and over. Christopher Kringle, Christopher Kringle, Christopher Kringle. Chris is short for Christopher, I mumbled. Of course it's short for Christopher, Celia shouted. The real issue here is that Chris Kringle has been dead for centuries. I know, I huffed. It was a surprise, is all. Celia tried to pace, but the room was too small, so she just circled in place. Carl clicked for the video feed to keep going. Chris Kringle, I guess, walked into private workshop and went straight for the quantum Kringle. He grabbed it, tossed it between both hands, then lifted it up in the air. The snow galaxy within spun and grew until the snow started pouring out of the Kringle and whipping around the room. The snow created a strong wind that knocked papers onto the floor and tables over sideways. After just a few seconds, the whole room was the wreck. It was the wreck Celia had seen just a few minutes before. Can it do that? Did we know it could do that? Celia shook her head. I've never heard about this. Santa said it was just an old engine. The wind, too, pushed the cloak away from Kris Kringle's body. At first it looked like a normal, thin body shape, like that of an old man. Below the waist, though, were thick, furry legs, with the knee bent the wrong way. At the ground, instead of feet, they ended in cloven hooves with sharp, curved claws. As the snow shrunk and returned to the globe, which had no visible cracks anywhere to be seen, the figure's hood was blown back too, and we saw first tiny pointed horns on the top of a bald head and a long white beard on the face that looked a lot like the Chris Kringle portrait. Ramp! I yelled. It is Ramp! A few seconds later, Ramp was back in the entrance where Santa had just entered to investigate. Ramp waved the bundle of sticks, and this time, a cloud of some kind of sleeping powder was visible as it settled over Santa's face. Santa fell to the ground, and Ramp twisted the Kringle in his fingers. Snow encircled Santa and Ramp, and when it disappeared, Ramp was wearing Santa's big red suit, and Santa was wearing long johns. Other than the little horns and feet, Ramp could have been the Chris Kringle. We have to go. I turned and pushed the hatch open, slipping on the snow as I dragged myself out of the hall on the floors. He took a sleigh, reindeer, and the crinkle. He's leaving. We need to, we need to tell someone, or stop him, or... Celia grabbed, grabbed me and ran after me, which I was glad about because I didn't really know where I was going. There's no way we can catch him now. We need a plan. I nodded and tried to swallow my fear. 
How was Ram also Kris Kringle? Why was he stealing from the Quantum Kringle? Why did no one tell me Chris was actually short for Christopher? What if Christmas is over? I felt like I was going to faint, but I focused and fought through it. I'll call our friends. I pulled out my phone. Which friends? All of them. Everybody. Celia nodded. Tell them to meet us by take-up zone. I'll meet you there. I'm going to work on a plan. But the last trial, I said. You had to be there in a few hours. You need to study and sleep. Celia made a face that said, Come on, dude. It kind of seems like we need to save Christmas, right? Right, you're right. There's, that's way more important. That's for sure save Christmas. Chapter 23 A few hours later, and all my friends were assembled in a hangar near the takeoff zone. It was like my birthday party, except Ramp wasn't there, and no one was happy. It was nothing like my birthday party, but it calmed me down to think about it, okay? Thunder rumbled outside, because of course, it was a stormy situation. Celia arrived last, wearing her Santa suit like the rest of us who had them. Did everyone bring what Ollie and I asked for? The group collectively turned from our long conference table and nodded. Great. Carl, tell them what you told me. Carl stood up and clicked the button on a remote. A big TV someone had wheeled in, clicked on, and started playing a regular human news story somewhere in America. The headline read, Santa Prank, Slay Spotted Flying Through the Air Above Local Neighborhood. About an hour ago, Ramp was spotted in Belleville, California. He clicked the remote, and the news changed to a different station in America. A few minutes later, this ha aired in Huntington, West Virginia. Evil Santa interrupts annual comedy gathering. He quickly clicks through several more. He's already been to Warsaw in Poland, to Kabul in Afghanistan, to Trondheim in Norway, to Abjua in Nigeria. He doesn't seem to be following any particular pattern, and the humans are starting to put it together that something is wrong. I wasn't sure what he was doing, but then I saw this interview. He clicked again. A little girl about Polly's age was crying on a German news station. Subtitles translated for us. I wrote a letter to Santa asking for my goldfish to be able to talk. Santa came back and used magic, and now my fish only says mean things. The little girl lifted a goldfish bowl up in front of the camera. A big bubble floated out of the fish's mouth, and when it popped at the top of the water, it said, Your favorite movie is actually not very good. Another bubble popped. Those shoes? With that scarf? I'm not even wearing a scarf, the girl cried. Horse whinnied. Horse reference with wish database. Ramp is targeting areas with recent powerful wishes. Exactly, Bertrand nodded. And look at the headline. Krampus griefed an N. Krampus? I frowned. I thought it was a myth. Kurt laughed. Yeah, and a lot of the world thinks we're a myth. Not for long, though. He's using the quantum kringle in broad daylight some places. Sai tapped their fingernails nervously on the table. There are going to be a lot of questions. I have one. Why is he doing this? Buzz wasn't even sitting down. He was anxious. He'd even brought his axe and had it resting over his broad shoulders. I thought he was just some harmless old dude trying to be the next Santa. I know why. Everyone turned and looked at Bertrand. Well, I don't know why, why, but I get what he's trying to do. He adjusted his bow tie and looked at the table, obviously uncomfortable with everyone staring at him. The wish generator only works because those kids were making wishes. If he convinces enough people that Santa is going to ruin their wishes, and they tell their friends, and those friends tell their friends, no one wishes at all. I put my head in my hands. And if the wish generator doesn't work, then it's not just this Christmas that we be ruined. We use too much energy for the traditional sources like fossil fuels. The North Pole would have to be shut down. Our inventions wouldn't work. We'd all have to move back into the real world. The reindeer shivered uncomfortably. Crasher flattened her ears. The stable takes care of us with that energy. We'd have to get them back, being the wild animals. I don't think I can do that. Well, luckily, I've got some good news. 
Celia taped some buttons on her laptop and changed the TV screen to a map of the world with a bright red dot zipping through it. Pausing for a moment before taking off again, he took a sleigh I made, which means we can track it. How do you catch that old foggy, though? Frank and her brothers were standing in the corner like they weren't sure whether to trust us yet. Nothing's as fast as a Kringle. I actually have an idea, Celia grinned. I was jealous she could find something to be excited about. We hadn't even started, and I already felt like we'd lost. The red dot on the screen was zipping all over the place. How we were supposed to compete with that. Bertrand, Celia continued. Did you bring your wish engine? Yeah, but you saw it work in the race. There's no way we could reach the light speed on our own. You won't be on your own. Buzz started smiling as he figured out Celia's plan. We could get everybody in the North Pole wishing. Bertrand seemed less convinced. I could work with my mom to see if we could transmit some wishes to you. But still, I don't know how fast we could get. The Kringle goes faster than light without breaking a sweat. For now, we should focus on trying to stop Ram from being or doing any more damage to Santa's reputation. Celia was already grabbing Bertrand's engine and hooking it to the sleigh. I think we should chase after him, fix when he breaks, and deliver presents as we go. You want to deliver presents on Christmas Eve? During the day? Sally crossed her arms and leaned back in the chair. Are you sure that's a good idea? I don't think I have a choice. I starting, I was starting to get pumped up too. The more I understood. He's already pulled us into the spotlight. We have to make the best of it. And this will be quite a laborious activity, for we are good pals but not trained Santas. Godzooks, who had been watching quietly with owls on either shoulder, finally chimed in. More time is an exemplary idea. Great! Celia stood at the head of the table in her big red suit, looking like she belonged and charged. It was awesome. Carl and Bertrand had to stay behind as a port, which leaves me, Ollie, Kurt, Sally, the triplets, Gazooks, and Buzz. The big nine only work with Santa. Rocker looked around at the older reindeer. I think I speak for all of us that when I say we'd be happy to help. Slammer, Jammer, and Treason for the Season all nodded silently. Snoozer snored in an affirmative way, and Truther flicked her tinfoil hat with her ears while darting her eyes around the room nervously, which I guess was as close to agreement as she would get. We'll be the little nine, Crasher snorted. I'll take the lead, like before. Slammer didn't argue, and all of us seemed to agree. Great. Celia gestured to the sleighs, which were already connected. I built a replacement say to connect Ollie's so it'll all fit. It looks like we're ready to go. Not quite yet. My face turned red the voice. The whole room turned and looked at me behind the hangar entrance. But I already knew who it was. Andrea walked over to the table, putting her red hair in a knot on top of her head and sticking her Santa hat over it. I want to help. Lightning struck and thunder rumbled. The whole table looked at me. I still couldn't make eye contact with her. She sighed. For real this time. I promise. There was another long silent pause while I thought about all the different things I wanted to say. I settled on. Cool. 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 That's cool, except I think it probably isn't because it seemed like it was for real every time. And all those times you were lying, which was pretty not cool. So it is probably safer for us to assume that this isn't cool either. Probably not even a little, if that makes sense. Maybe not at all. I'm thinking most likely not at all. All he means no. Celia stared Andrea down. Why would he trust you? I only lied about Ollie because Klaus promised a home for my family at the North Pole. If the North Pole shuts down, None of it matters. And if Celia isn't even going to a trial, Klaus wins by default. Buzz shrugged. Makes sense. Myra spat on the ground. Well, it doesn't sound fair to me. We're the ones trying to save Christmas out here while he's ignoring all our phone calls. Bertrand shook his head. We didn't know Ramp was evil. What if she's trying to ruin Christmas too? She's telling the truth about dealing with Klaus. Sally looked at me apologetically. 
He was bragging about it the other day. Celia and I would have to help you, I said quietly, and we wouldn't have made you do anything. Well, now I know. Andrea looked at her watch. Clock's ticking, though. I vote no. Celia looked at me. But you get one and a half votes. It didn't take long for me to decide. You can come. But everyone here heard you admit you lied. So after we save Christmas, you have to tell everyone else. Deal. Can you get a move on now? All of us split from the conference table and prepared for the day. Sally took the harpoon gun from her sleigh and attached it to ours. Buzz fit his giant wheels onto it in case we had the traverse more difficult terrain. I called Carl and told him to spread the word, and the rest of us went to gather toys from the workshop's warehouse. Mom said to let you use the bag. Bertrand explained while we headed down to the basement levels of the workshop. It's down here with the toys. The door opened, and Bertrand led me to an unassuming cloth bag hanging on a peg on a wall. It looks old, but it's tough. It goes around your shoulder like this. He wrapped its roby cord around one of my shoulders, so the bag rested against my hip. I squeezed it, and felt like there was nothing inside it at all. Bertrand took a huge dollhouse, one of the haunted ones, I made one myself, and pushed it into the bag, which opened wider. Than it would look like. He changed it closed, and it still felt like there was nothing in it. He reached his hand inside and said, Dollhouse, and showed me that he could pull the dollhouse back out. I've always wondered how it works, I said as everyone who came with us started grabbing toys and loading them into the bag. Is it like some kind of dimensional portal with a rudimentary? All I can hear is, you ask to find it? Bertrand paused and looked at me surprised. I thought Celia was the science one. I had science toys too. I know stuff. Celia just knows more stuff and learns it faster. I'm more about making things fun and pretty. Well, you're right. The bag was one of Chris Kringle's inventions, so we don't totally understand it, but that's the best I've come up with too. You can be general, as you would want it, and smart. Also, don't be afraid to ask it for things we didn't put in there. You never know what you haven't gotten left behind. The triplets Kurt and Gudsuk started making it a game, throwing huge toys at me to catch in the bag. It never got any heavier, even when loaded with thousands of presents. Amazing. It was slow going on our own though, and a bunch of elves who worked in the warehouses helped us fill it just like they would have for Santa. We're trying to split with us to meet Mrs. Claus at the Wish Generator. Back at the hangar, we all piled to the sleigh, and Celia hit a few buttons to start the engine powering up. Bertrand spoke on our sweet tooth headsets. All right, Carl's got a crowd of North Pole residents gathering outside to start making wishes. Make sure your personal gravity field is on, otherwise you could all get knocked out by the G-force. I'm locking on the portable generator. You should receive the burst of energy starting now. The sleigh sputtered and jostled, but the engine didn't kick all the way on. One second, Mom's checking my math. Bertrand covered the microphone with his hand, but we could still hear his muffled voice. I'm telling you, I looked at it. All the numbers are exactly perfect. Oh, you're right, I did miss that. Thanks, Mom. His hand moved away from the microphone. Okay, get ready. It should already work. Now. The sleigh sped forward so fast the reindeer team had trouble keeping up. Thunder rumbled, and we would have been drenched if the personal gravity field didn't have the added benefit of deflecting the droplets. Celia checked the map. Looks like he's in San Jose, Costa Rica. We'll head there first. I didn't know what light speed looked like, but this definitely wasn't it. We were flying fast, so fast, it was hard to focus on the ground. But I could still comprehend what was going on. Where's the music? Kurt leaned over and pushed his music box, which he had installed into the dashboard. I've got the perfect song for this. The box started playing, play this song while you're saving Christmas, one of LDB's biggest hits from his first album. It was okay, but his new album was better. We arrived at the house on the outskirts of San Jose 
just in time to see a crackle of light and vanishing snow in the space where Ramp was. A girl was crying from atop a huge pile of books in her yard. Our onboard computer translated her Spanish so I could understand what she was saying. I wished for new books, and Santa gave me 200 copies of this boring book called The Fountainhead. Horse recognized. Sofia Villalobos present. An illustrated history of monster trucks. That wasn't Santa. That was a bad guy. I reached into the bag and handed her the book. Don't ever stop making wishes. She stopped crying and hugged it. Thank you, little Santa. My favorite is when the grave digger crushes on the competition on Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. She had a very good scary announcer voice. I opened the bag and scooped all the copies of the fountainhead into it, then hopped back onto the sleigh. Now what? Do we deliver the presents here? I believe I may be of assistance. Gadzooks flourished the plastic wand and whistled. Within moments, a huge flock of all different kinds of birds was flapping above us. Kindly throw them in presents, Ollie. I stuck my hand in the bag and said, Sanusa presents. One by one, they appeared in my hand, and one by one, I flung them onto the crowd of birds. One or several would catch each present and then fly off the address horse called out. Celia said, Could that work while we're flying, Gadzooks? Of course, my dear friend, she answered. There are birds to help us everywhere. Ramp, I mean, Krampus, is moving so fast. It looks like he's in Atlanta, Georgia. Celia kicked on the engine, and we took off again. I held the bag upside down off the side of the sleigh and yelled, Presents below us! As we flew north into the United States, presents steamed out of the bag and were caught by birds to be dropped down the right chimney or left on the right porches. It must have looked very strange to normal humans, getting their presents not just early, but from birds. I tried not to worry about it, or worry about all the attention we were going to get when we made the stops. Right now, we just had to catch up the ramp. The rest can come later. This time Celia stopped us several floors up by an apartment building. Ramp was already gone, but I could see a teenage boy inside staring at a video of an old computer and looking petrified. I knocked on the window, and he opened the door. Who are you? We're Santa. Uh, sort of. That man with the big horns said he was Santa. Big horns? What? Well, he lied. What did he do? I wrote a letter Santa. I didn't even really know for sure there was one Santa, and asked to be famous. That guy with the horns came in and did something to my computer. Now this video of me farting in public is everywhere. Kurt snorted. That's awesome. It's not awesome. It's all about perspectives, bro. Kurt reached into the bag and said, Laptop. He pulled out a new fancy laptop and handed it to the teenager. Farts are funny. There's sound editing software on this. Auto tune your toots into a song or something. And don't take yourself so seriously. The teenager took the laptop and started at Kurt. Uh, thanks. I guess you're right. No prob. Kurt winked and turned back to Celia. We're done here. Near London, there was a boy with a star-shaped scar on his forehead sitting on a street where every house looked like every other house. I wanted to get away from my evil aunt and uncle, so I wished for a letter for a magical school. Santa gave me this. The boy showed us a very polite rejection letter from a nearby boarding school for sorcerers. Oh, I went to that school. I was spelledictorian. Gadzook stepped off the sleigh. I'm going to make some calls to be sure he gets there. Don't worry, the birds will keep helping distribute presents. Stop that mean old Krampus for me. Toodaloo! Thank you, the boy yelled as we lifted off. Try not to get expelled! I yelled back and giggled. The triplets flicked me in the head. In Seoul, a girl wished for a statue of herself in the city, and Ramp had created a giant marble version of her picking her nose. We shot the harpoon gun Sally had added to the sleigh into the statue and pulled it to the ground, where it crumbled safely onto a street we evacuated. I scooped the rubble up with the bag. I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. 
but Tran said to us over our headsets. More people are making wishes, but we still don't have enough power to catch up. Carl chimed in. The public are staring at us. Some people thought at first it was a certainly constructed prank, but too much is happening for this to be still believable. He's doing more damage than you guys can fix right now, but he doesn't represent Santa alone. In Johannesburg, a kid wished for their family to stop moving because they had switched schools three times in two years. Graham froze them on ice, and we left the triplets behind with blow dryers to thaw them out. In Portland, a three-year-old girl wished to be a firefighter when she grew up and suddenly found herself trying to drive a fire truck down the road in the middle of a huge fire that sprung up out of nowhere in the city. Buzz stayed behind with an arsenal of heavy-duty water guns he pulled from the bag. When we arrived in Tokyo, we saw a bed rocketing in the sky. Celia slowed us down and Crasher steered us to it. On top was a boy clinging for dear life to his pillow and screaming. He wouldn't move to grab my hand, so Sally grabbed my leg and Kurt grabbed Sally's leg and I jumped onto the bed. I held onto the boy and his pillow and Kurt dragged us back onto the sleigh. The bed continued up into the upper atmosphere and I watched the four rockets on each leg sputter out as it got farther and farther away. What did you wish for? I asked breathless. The screen translated his Japanese. I wanted to go to space. In Sydney, a girl wished to sing at Opera House one day and suddenly found herself with a gig that night and no plan on what to do. Kurt stayed behind to help her plan her set list. In Cairo, a boy had wished for new video games and Ramp had turned all the video games he already had into one pong. He said, back in my day, this is the only video game we had and we liked it. I just want to catch some monsters. We gave him some new ones. Sally got him a laptop too and stayed behind to teach him how to make his own video games. I scooped up all the copies of Pong. In Miami, an adult woman had wished for less paperwork in her job so she could spend more time on vacation with her kids. Instead, her entire hotel room was filled with stacks of paperwork. I'll take this one. The boy with the beige sweater stepped off of our sleigh and into the woman's hotel room. I'm pretty good at this kind of stuff. Thanks for letting me come on your adventure for a while, guys. It's been great. He pointed at me. Especially thanks for you, texting me and inviting me, best friend. I had a lot of questions, like, when did I invite him? When did he get here? How would his name be in my phone when I don't even know it? How can we be friends when I don't even know who he is? But I just said, Ah uh, yeah, totally. Thanks for coming. We'll come back and get you later. I was also pleasantly surprised with Florida. It wasn't nearly as bad as I had imagined. Hey guys, Bertrand sounded freaked out over the headsets. Something crazy is going on in the White House. What's the White House? I asked. Like an igloo? Andrea looked at me like I was crazy. Are you serious? That's where the President of the United States lives. Is a president like a king? I asked. Celia nodded. Yeah, I think it's like a king. Andrea pointed as the sleigh slowed to a stop above a rogue's garden. That's the White House. It's just a big White House. She threw her arms in the air, exasperated. Exactly! At least 200 kids were in a gated yard in front of the White House, handcuffed and surrounded by policemen. They all wished to live in the White House, Bertrand told us, so Krampus just dropped them off. Now they're all arrested for breaking in. Let me handle this. Andrea cracked her neck and her knuckles. I can talk anyone out of anything. Thanks, Andrea. I smiled at her. She smiled back and said, Go get the old guy and left Celia and I alone on a sleigh. How are we doing on power? Celia asked while steering us away. We hadn't even been going faster enough to see Krampus. Bertrand took a second to respond. I still don't think we're going to be able to break past light speed. You've got a lot of power and Carl is doing a great job 
getting more people to make wishes. Stop chasing me! A terrifying growl came up from behind us. Before I could even turn around to see what it was, something slammed into our sleigh and disappeared in a puff of sparks. A second later, something slammed into us from the other side. The sleigh teetered over the ocean and a little alarm beeped up on the console. It's Krampus! Celia yelled. He's dropping in and out of light speed to attack us! I pulled out the only weapon I had to defend myself with, the firework gun Buzz gave us to help study. I shot the next time we were hit, but the firework sailed lazily out over the water and exploded. I'm so impressed, the firework said sarcastically. We got bumped again and I fired again. Sorry, dude. Frustrated, I fired a shot off to the side when nothing was happening. Instead of flying out of the water, it bounced on a bubble the force field protecting Ramp's terrifying black and red sleigh. For just a brief second, I could see him, and something was very, very wrong. His horns had grown huge and curved backward, adding several feet to his height, which had also grown considerably. His body had grown hairy and huge, and his feet ended in hooves as big as my face. On top of it all was still an awkwardly overstuffed Santa suit with the last hat skewered by one of the horns. And then, he was gone again. The force field! Celia turned to me and grinned. The way I built the sleigh! When the force field is on, the engine can't run! Each individual hit will only stop him for one second. But if you can pelt him with lots of stuff at once, he won't be able to speed up at all. The next time we saw him, though, he was charging us directly from the front. Pull up! I yelled. Pull all the way up! Oh my gosh! Crasher veered up, and the other reindeer followed. I turned the bag upside down and yelled, The Fountainheads! A bunch of copies of the Fountainhead tumbled down onto Ramp's sleigh, activated his force field, and then tumbled down into the ocean. Statue rubble! A ridiculous amount of marble came pouring out of the bag, buying us even more time. What do we do now? I asked while pouring the rubble, and Celia kept pace with the momentum Krampus was still moving with. I don't know, Celia yelled over the splashing rocks. I didn't really expect us to get to that point. Even in all the craziness, my head kept going back to one question. Why was Ramp doing this? I needed to know the answer, and I needed to know what to do. I'll see you in a little bit, I hope, I yelled, and then I yelled, Pongs, and leapt off our sleigh, while several copies of Pong kept Ram's force field going. I cathunked onto the bubble and started sliding off, but the sleigh must not register people as weapons because it popped and I was able to grab hold of one of Ram's horns before his sleigh sped back up to break light speed. Get off! Get off of there! Ramp growled. Ouch! I was trying to pull my body in closer to the sleigh, but kept accidentally kicking Ramp in the face in the process. Sorry! I yelled. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I can't seem to keep my body from floating and- Shut up! Ramp raised up the Kringle, and the magic snow expanded from it and wrapped around me. I saw pure white, and then- I was tied with rope to the back of Ramp's sleigh. Instead of disappearing, like it had in Santa's workshop, though the snow glitched, the snowflakes twitched and tumbled in the air like they couldn't settle on where they were supposed to be. A few of them touched Ramp, and he winced as his horns grew taller and his fur grew coarser. His tongue lolled out at least six inches past his lips. I can't believe this, he lisped around his tongue. This could have been so simple, but you and Celia had to go and run it, huh? I didn't even know it was going to be beautiful. All around was a sea of color, every color I'd ever seen, and some I hadn't. It flowed and shifted around itself, like someone was mixing paint very slowly. How can you be mad when you could see this? Shut up! He was staring intently at his center console. 
When I heard over all the way to one side in my ropes, I could see little snippets of text scrolling quickly up the screen. Wishes, I thought. He's picking which wishes to ruin. It's not working, you know. I tried to quietly dringle and wriggle my hand back into my suit to look for something in the pockets I could use to escape. People know you're not Santa. They're still making wishes. You can't fix everything, and you can't thank me forever. You can't do this forever. Yes, I can. What a strange thing to say. How old are you, Ramp? I know you're not sixteen. I don't know, he mumbled. I stopped counting centuries ago. Centuries? Ramp didn't answer. He dropped out of light speed in front of a window. Inside, a girl with very short brown hair and a flowery blue dress was tapping her foot impatiently. Are you the evil Santa? she asked. I'm more of a chaotic neutral. Well, I've been waiting all day for you to show up. What? I narrowed my eyes to the girl. I won't waste your time. I know a lot of name nerds with a lot of dumb wishes. I can give you a list, and you can go goof him up. It'll be really funny. Now Ramp narrowed his eyes. Give me the list. Seriously? I squirmed in the ropes, loosening them just a little. I slipped my arm up my sleeve and dug around in the pockets. Quiet, Ollie. Ramp took the list from the girl and glanced over it. He raised the quantum kringle, which glowed and poured snow into the girl's room. When the snow returned to the globe, after the strange, glitchy wriggling, her room was completely bare. What? What did you do? The girl screamed. Where's all my stuff? I split it between the people on the list. Ramp threw the list down at her feet. You better hope they're kind enough to give it back. He twisted the kringle and we shot back into the tunnel of color. That was pretty cool of you, I said. My hand finally found something, the ice cream scoop. My dad had said it was indestructible and sharp. Maybe it would cut through the ropes. I started wriggling my hand out, standing up to that bully. I told her, I'm not evil. Evil is for the young. You're acting pretty evil. You don't even know what evil really looks like. I'm looking at a scary goat monster flying around the world, ruining children's wishes. Bramp let out a slow, rumbling growl. It's complicated. I can handle it. I'm twelve now. A loud screech whipped through the air and I clutched my ears. Ramp whipped around and I got a look at his bright red eyes with scary horizontal pupils. What? How? He gasped. How what? I wriggled against the ropes but couldn't turn all the way around. I finally slipped my arm back through my sleeve and started slowly sawing on the rope with the ice cream scoop. I'm coming, Ollie! Celia's voice. They did it. She made it past light speed. Ramp slammed onto the brakes, dropping us out of the light speed somewhere with lots of trees. He nudged his reindeer. Their skin was black, and something was strange, but I couldn't see very well from the sleigh floor, and rotated the sleigh. He took off in another direction, and we were back in the tunnel. Why are you staying in light speed so long? I asked, still sawing at the rope. Can't you go around the world like seven times in a second? I'm trying to throw her off the trail. Another screeching noise as Celia broke into the light sped tunnel, this time right next to us. Ollie, come on! Let's go! Crasher and the others were all wearing their goggles, visibly uncomfortable with the speed. Most reindeer trained for years to be in the big nine. It must have been really difficult the first time. One of the ropes snapped and I kept sawing at the other two. Ramp dropped out of the slight speed, but Celia mirrored him and appeared right beside us in time to catch up before Ramp shot us away at a different angle. I'm trying! Another rope broke. One more. Ramp bumped Celia with the sigh of a sleigh and she dropped out of sight for just a second before appearing back at us. Go away! Ramp yelled. Leave me alone! I snapped the final rope. 
I stood up and started moving towards Celia's sleigh, but Ram pulled out his bundle of sticks and aimed it at her face. Poof! A yellow powder popped out of her berries at the end of the sticks and surrounded Celia's face, but she held her breath. She slammed into Ram's sleigh this time, and we wobbled uncertainly. How was Celia tracking me? Ram grabbed me by the collar with one hand and lifted me onto the ground. Tell me, or I'll throw you off the sleigh. Your sleigh? I said, because I really, really didn't want to die. She built it, remember? It has a GPS that can track you anywhere on Earth. I see. He jerked the sleigh sharply upward and Celia disappeared from view. Then we'll go somewhere that he can't track us. What do you mean? I asked. Ram kept his focus on his computer and steering. He didn't answer. Where can't she track us? He still didn't answer, so I sat back down on the sleigh and sighed. Jumping off would be incredibly dangerous, even if I knew where we were. Which I didn't. And what trip could make or take whole minutes at light speed? Something like ten minutes later, the sleigh landed gently on dusty red ground specked with white. Ramp immediately jumped out of the sleigh and took several big jumps toward a small wooden hut in the distance, kicking up a cloud of red dust as he went. I stepped out of the sleigh and looked around. On all sides, and as far up as I could see, white swirly snow mixed with red dust. I caught some snow in the air, but it didn't milk. It was fake snow, like in snow globes, but bigger. I could make out the patterns in individual snowflakes. It spun and whirled in a predictable pattern too. The snow would come close to the ground in a white circle, and then zoom into the middle, shoot up to the top, and expand back out into the circle. The edge of the circle was nearby, the opposite way from ramp, and I walked over to expect it. I found the glass wall gently sloping up and back toward the center where the snow met. A snow globe. Sort of. It was like the top half of a snow globe had been stuck over the ground. When I got back to the sleigh, I inspected Ramp's reindeer. All of them had black fur, coarser than it should be. Their antlers were sharper than normal, curved in angry ways, and there were so many of them because each reindeer had three heads. I leapt backward when I realized, and the closest one just stared at me. He didn't have nine, though, so he made nine. Do you, uh, do you all know where we are? They didn't say anything. They didn't even really acknowledge me except the stare. None of them moved. Uh, okay, good talk. I backed away from the three-headed reindeer slowly, but they didn't move an inch. Eventually, I turned around and walked through the red dust toward the same hut Ramp was now standing on top of. His hooves were perched right on the very pointiest part of the roof, and he held himself with such perfect balance that he looked much lighter than he should have. He still looked terrifying. He was definitely a crazy monster, but he was a crazy monster who wasn't moving in a scary way. He cradled the quantum kringle in one hand, and it glowed with a soft blue light. There was a rusty metal ladder against the back of the hut, so I climbed up it and sat down on the roof next to him. That's Earth. Ramp lifted his finger and pointed up past the swirling snow in the sky. The sun was setting off to one side, and I could just barely make out a blue spot all the way near the other horizon. Oh, I said, like it was a totally casual and normal thing for someone to tell me. Like it was 100% not a crazy, scary, big deal that I guess we were in space or whatever. Cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. He slid his legs down the roof and sat down next to me. Chris Kringle made it. Your list is gone. I looked at his mouth, and his tongue was shrinking back down to the normal size. His horns looked just a little smaller too, and his fur just a little shorter. He didn't offer an explanation. Are you okay, Ramp? My name is Krampus. 
And also, no. Krampus flicked his eyes to me and scowled, then flicked his eyes back to the sky. The computer said you were Chris Kringle, and you looked kind of like him. I'm not Chris Kringle, he growled. But he made me. Made you? My question hung in the air for a moment. Krampus looked down at the dusty red ground, then back at the sky. He took a deep breath. Chris Kringle didn't build the Quantum Kringle, Ollie. He found it. He found it, and he used it to make all other conventions. He used it to build everything. The North Pole, the workshop, Christmas as you call it. It was made all by this thing. Krampus threw the Kringle to the ground, where it bounced harmlessly in the red dust and rolled to a stop. He didn't trust anyone else with it, not even his son. So he made me a perfect copy of a perfect man. You can see how that turned out. He gestured to his horns. I got these and the legs, so I wasn't what he hoped for. I wasn't perfect. He tried to teach me anyway, tried to turn me into a Santa worthy of his legacy, but every mistake I made was another reason I wasn't right. I was broken. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't really have a rule book on what to do when someone told you they were a disappointing clone of the creator of Christmas, so I just reached over and patted his furry leg a few times. He scowled at me again. So we lied. He left me on an island alone with no map and no way out and told no one else I ever existed. Chris Kringle, the man your whole city worships, didn't know I couldn't die. I didn't even know yet. He probably thought I would. He lied about me. He lied about his inventions. And now this disgusting holiday celebrates them. That's why the plans for his inventions aren't complete, I realized. He didn't even know how to make them. Not really. I could freak out about all ridiculous, insane things that ever happened to me later. For now, I just wanted to make sure I understood everything. And you hate Christmas because you think it's about him. It is about him. Santa parades around that same hideous outfit to this day. The same thing we're both wearing. He gestured between the two of us. Hideous? Really? I made a pouty face at him. I thought I looked adorable. Krampus laughed, and his horns and hair receded even further. His eyes were clearing up too, and he looked like the frail old man I met before the first trial. I went on. That's not what Christmas is about, though. I took my hat off and scratched an itch of my hair. Chris Kringle was just one of a lot of Santas. And even Christmas isn't even about Santa, you know? Or it's not supposed to be. It's about... Mm, I thought for a second. It's about like... When two people help another person run farther than he could have run on his own. It's like... When you're competing with your friend. And everybody's trying to win, but... They're also having fun, and you don't mind sharing your popcorn balls for the competition. I tug at the fur ball at the end of my hat. Because looking people in the eye is hard when you're telling the truth, and also because I didn't know I knew what to say until I said it. It's like when everybody's tired from the com from competing for a whole week so they can lean on each other to keep each other going. Or when all your friends come to your birthday party, or when those same friends all dress up in the same outfit and try to save the world. He sniffled and started tearing up. You didn't really get a real Christmas, I guess, since your gene dad invented it and then didn't really give you a chance to celebrate it. But that's the kind of stuff that's about. It's about everybody getting together and doing something kind and also doing something fun. Now the tears were definitely coming down to his face and I glanced up at Krampus to see if he was crying too. He wasn't, but his frown seemed softer than normal. He cleared his throat and spoke softly. Then why do we need Santa? Why do we need the North Pole? We don't, I guess. I dried my eyes with my sleeve. 
but it's a place where a lot of people live. And what we do makes a lot of people happy. We give people a reason to get in the same room and open presents and run and race and dance and save the world. Mostly with toys, but the same thing, I think. I took a deep breath and nodded. I'm right, I thought. I didn't know for sure I would be right when I started talking, but now I think I am. Chris Kringle sounds like he did some stuff wrong, some big stuff, but he also used the quantum Kringle to do really beautiful things, like this, Christmas on Mars. I looked at Krampus for his time, a serious look. He might not have been a good person, but he made a good thing. Christmas isn't perfect yet, but Santa thought it could be better. Now I think so too. If you keep trying to ruin it though, we might never find out. We sat in silence again, this time for a long time. Fake snow danced around the red dirt, mirroring the colors of our outfits. How'd you get so smart when you were just a kid? Krampus asked. I'm not a kid anymore. I reminded him. I'm twelve. He laughed again. I'd never heard him laugh this much before. I'm not sure I'd even seen him smile. It made him look even more like Kris Kringle, which made me feel bad again, so I scooted over and gave him a big hug. Fine. Krampus wrapped one arm around me and lifted up to a standing position, leaving me clinging to his side. He jumped to the ground and grabbed the quantum Kringle then jumped back to the sleigh in front of the bounds. Hey, this is a- uh, Whoa! He tossed me down on the sleigh and twisted the kringle. The reindeer tilted up and shot out of the sky. Within a moment, we are back in the colorful tunnel. Wait, what are you doing? Because if you're going to try to ruin Christmas again, I really think we should tr try to talk and for a little longer. I said fine. Meaning, us try- I'll stop trying to ruin Christmas, he grumbled, and waggled his fingers into the air quotes. I was getting hungry anyway. Chapter 24 We rode back to Earth in silence. When Krampus slowed us out of the tunnel, we were sliding to a stop in front of Claus Castle. My headset chirped. Ollie, you're back! Bertrand sounded surprised. Where did you go? Space, I said, like it was everyday A-OK -okay thing to say and not something really amazing and also kind of a brag. Where is everybody? Celia picked everyone up and brought them back here to get their sleighs and split their remaining gifts. There are still a lot of presents to distribute and not a lot of time left in Christmas Eve. Not that those rules really matter anymore, I guess. Usually. Santa tries to follow the night across the world, but Krampus kind of threw that out the window. The side door creaked, and Santa stumbled out, rubbing his eyes and yawning. Ollie Gnome, he boomed, smiling and spreading his arms wide. My kids explained everything. I'm so, so sorry for the mix-up. He lifted me off the ground into a very tight hug. That's okay, sir. I struggled to breathe. You didn't know. Well, I suspected. You always seemed like the trustworthy type. Thanks. I pointed my thumb back toward the sleigh. I should maybe introduce you to Krampus. He's kind of your grandpa or something. Santa gasped. What happened to this reindeer? Krampus glanced over at them. Oh, uh, sorry about that. He raised up the Kringle and released the snow which wrapped around the reindeer and returned them to normal. Oh. My. Gosh. We went to space. The newly single-handed leader of the three unhooked from the sleigh and bounded around excited. I mean, we went as disgusting monster versions of ourselves and we were trapped in our bodies unable to speak or move of our free will, but we were trapped and our bodies unable to speak or move for our own free will on Mars. Uh, there she goes again. The other two reindeer both rolled their eyes. Stargazers never going to shut up about this. The third reindeer turned on Krampus and lifted onto his hind legs, jabbing a hoof on Krampus's chest. 
You're lucky we're reasonable reindeer who get that you are going to through some messed up stuff, cause that was way not cool, bro. You are right. Krampus nodded and scratched his beard. It was way not cool. I apologize. He handed the quantum crinkle to Santa. Santa clapped his arm around Krampus's shoulder and Krampus scowled. Seems like we've got a lot to talk about it. The air cracked and sizzled and Celia dropped out of nothingness onto the ground in front of us. All nine of her reindeer immediately unhitched and collapsed to the ground, groaning in relief. Ollie! She yelled, pushing her goggles up on her forehead and run over to me for a hug. I was so worried. I did like... She looked up at the sky and made the scrunched up face she used for mental calculations. 400 laps around the world or something looking for you. And it only took like a minute. You only looked for me for one minute? Well, I wasn't going to waste my time when there was work to do. She gave me another hug squeeze. I trusted you to fi figure it out. I brought my voice down to a whisper. I actually don't think I really did anything, but I totally went to space. Celia slapped both of her own cheeks with her hands and gasped. What? I want to go to space. You have to show me where you went right now. She started climbing back onto our sleigh. Yes! Stargazer yelled and did a flip in the air. I am so pumped to go back to space with full control of my body and mind. Now wait a minute, Santa interjected. There will be plenty of time to go to space after we get everything sorted. I agree, I agreed. Plus, I haven't eaten or slept in almost an entire day and that's not a good idea because I'm a growing boy. We're all growing boys, Celia yelled, frustrated. Why can't we go grow in space? A flock of sleighs interrupted us by flying up and landing in the snow around us. All our friends were returning together from their parts of the world. The presents are all done! Sally led the group over to us. We didn't have time to fix all the weird things Krampus did around the world, and there are still going to be a lot of questions from... Well, everyone, but at least we did what you can set out to do. So, you could say you saved Christmas? Santa beamed big at all of us with all of his bright white teeth. That's kind of a simplistic way to put it, Dad. I don't even know right now if Christmas is going to be the same thing anymore. There's so much to talk about. She was cut short by Santa scooping her into another big hug. That's when it hit me. We did it. Christmas happened. The North Pole was going to be fine. Different, maybe. Better, maybe. Kids were opening their bird-delivered presents all over the world. Parents were taking a break from their worries to buy last-minute batteries and pretend to lose at board games. Snow fell and Grandma smiled and bells jingled and everybody ate too much. We'd given people a reason to get in the room to run and race and dance and save the world. With toys, mostly. But that's the way it should be. Reporters were really, really concerned about the cool evil Santa thing, but we'd worry about that later. In this moment, Santa was happy. We were happy. Everything felt right and good and 100% Christmassy. The group around us got a little bigger as the North Pole realized we were home. We were home. A few elves brought their trumpets and played. A couple of others popped confetti into our faces. Somebody started singing, deck the halls, and a little kid, who should have been in bed, asked for my autograph. I'm so proud that all of you saved Christmas. Santa spun Sally around while she laughed. Celia and I did a complicated series of high fives. I just can't contain it. Yeah, thanks for that. Claus walked out of the Claus castle and leaned against the, snow wo the stone wall. I was the only one who even showed up for the challenge. I won. Those were the rules. Celia made eye contact with me and heaved a sigh that puffed up her cheeks. Her look said, Sheesh, not this again. I dragged my face down with both hands, 
making my eyes look scary and weird. I stuck out my tongue and wiggled it as if I was saying, Bleh. Celia snorted but covered her mouth so as to not interrupt the moment. Things changed, son. I was unconscious. The trial couldn't have happened anyway. Fine. Then let's do the trial right now. I'm ready. Celia hasn't slept in almost two days, I thought. Plus, she saved the world. That's not fair. Cause, no. Santa raised his voice just a little, and it sent a shiver down my spine. Celia and Ollie saw a crisis, and they dealt with it. You didn't even help, Klaus. You put yourself before everything, and that proves to me that you're not ready. I was following the rules, he argued. You said that if we didn't show up, we'd be disqualified, which wouldn't have mattered if no one had showed up, I pointed out. Klaus glared at me with an anger I'd never seen from anyone before. They didn't even ask me to help. Klaus was tearing up now, and his face was bright red. Yeah, we did. Kirk crossed his arms. Ollie called you just like he called us. And then Sally and I both left messages on your phone. My uh, phone was off because I was uh, studying. He texted me back and said, I don't care, leave me alone. Sally held up her phone. It was an auto response text. That's such a lie, Buzz yelled. I don't care anymore, I thought. I just need to take a nap. Santa clapped his hands loudly, silencing everyone. I've made my decision, Ollie. Celia, your bravery is the only reason we're even able to have this conversation. One of you is Santa. Celia, I said. Ollie, Celia said at the exact same time. We looked at each other and frowned. It should obviously be you, we both said. No, you, we argued. Don't argue with me, we chided each other. And then we both laughed. Klaus clenched and unclenched his fists and breathed heavy out of his nose. I'm leaving, he said forcefully, almost a yell. There was no doubt he meant it. If you do this, Dad, I'm leaving, and I'm not coming back. Santa swallowed, but didn't look at Claus. He took a deep breath. I don't think it's fair for me to decide which. You two work it out. We'll make the announcement when you're ready. Claus screamed something that didn't sound like words. He ran inside and slammed the door. Santa winced. Go get some rest. Santa started walking to the door to fall after Claus. You can explain everything after. The door shut and the rest of us collectively yawned. Do you think Claus is going to leave? I asked. I hope so, Buzz said. What a jerk. I didn't hope so. I glanced at Krampus who sighed. I know how he feels. He scratched the base of one of his horns. But Santa made the right call. Wait, why is he here? Andrea whirled on Krampus. Wasn't this all his fault? Yes. Krampus retorted, and don't talk to your elders that way. Celia spread their hands out and made shushing noises. Everybody waited for her to say something, but she didn't, and everybody understood. Silently, we drifted away. Celia and I hugged and agreed to meet up to take a nap. Krampus awkwardly bounced from hoof to hoof like he wasn't sure what to do. I took his hand and led him through the sleepy town to my house. We looked ridiculous, a grumpy old man and a sleepy elf covered in red dirt and snow walking down the street in ragged big red suits. I am sorry, he mumbled as we crunched through snow. I nodded and squeezed his hand. I know. The very last day of the year was a lot like Midlast. But on this particular December 31st, as we waited for Santa's big speech, nothing felt normal. Everyone at the North Pole crammed into the Peppermint Square, just like they always did on December 31st. Klaus Castle also looked like it always did on December 31st, its balcony decorated with bright, colorful flags and a candy-stripped carpet just for the occasion. There was only one big difference this year. Celia and I were backstage. Celia was pretty sure this was a huge problem. What if they hate me? Celia panicked to her best friend, me. What if this is a really bad idea? 
You're just being paranoid, I told her, and adjusted the collar on her big red suit. Think about it like another game. We're making the best move. This isn't a game, Ollie. This is serious Christmas business. Celia flapped her hands in the air and took deep breaths. Trumpets sounded out the balcony, and Celia's eyes widened. What if I fall asleep at the computer and switch all the naughty and nice kids? She asked me. What if my beard gets stuck in a door? What if I put every nice kid on the naughty list and my beard gets stuck in a door? I looked at her like her noggin was full of eggnog. You probably won't grow a beard, I explained. I don't think it comes with a job. You're just nervous because it's your first speech. It's a good idea. Krampus crossed his arms and frowned at us supportedly. So quit your whining. Celia and I turned around and looked at all our friends, all dressed in their big red suits and just as nervous as we were. Buzz, Gadzooks, Kurt and Sally, Bertrand and Krampus, Andrea and Carl, and I could have sworn there was someone else. I looked around the room and didn't see anyone though. Oh well, Klaus had really disappeared and no one knew where he was. We heard the tail end of Santa Claus's speech. And now, I'm proud to introduce to you my successor in just a few years' time, Santa Pixie. The doors to the balcony opened, and our friends paraded out in front of us and took their positions along the edge of the balcony. Celia and I squeezed hands for support one last time, then I walked out alone, waving, and took my place next to a center podium with steps in front of it so Celia could see over the top. Celia came out of the doors, and the whole North Pole cheered. Even the elves and Clauses, who had supported Claus before knew her plan was what had saved Christmas, so they joined in too. It was the loudest cheer I'd ever heard, and trust me, I'd heard a lot of Christmas cheers. Celia cleared her throat and adjusted the papers with our planned speech on the podium. She wiped some sweat from her brow and glanced down at me. I smiled up at her, which wasn't new. She's always been taller. Santa is a name I never even imagined I would have. None of us did. She swallowed heavily. I tried to project positive vibes by focusing really hard on good, confident things like unicorns and dragons. My parents, like probably a lot of yours, told me since I was a baby that I could grow up to be anything I wanted. That wasn't really true, though, until Santa Claus decided to institute the Santa Trials and give us all the opportunity to become something we thought we weren't born to do. I saw her mom out in the front of the crowd crying. Her dad was crying too, and so were both my parents. Come on, guys, I thought, and then I realized that I was also crying. Santa Matthew Claus has given us the chance to change Christmas for the better. He told us that it would be a tough job, that sometimes it was too much for one person. We knew we'd have to be everything Kris Kringle was. An inventor, a leader, a lover of toys. Kind to everyone. Never made a bad decision. Never got angry. Never had any trouble. Everything worked out pretty and perfectly for him his whole entire life. She grinned at the crowd. She was finding her groove. If that sounds impossible, it should. It was. Chris Kringle made mistakes. Just like all of us. Mistakes that we're still learning from today. I glanced over at Krampus, who was scowling out of the audience next to Bertrand. Bertrand patted him on the back, which he had to reach up really high to do. It was adorable. The group of kids and one old man that you see on stage today decided that it is too much for one person. Christmas would be over if it weren't for everybody here. We'd all be moving out of the North Pole if every single person you see hadn't stepped up to save the day. Because of that, I have a few announcements to make. This was the fun part. I stood up straighter and saw that everyone else was doing the same. 
After the events of Christmas Eve, the world has a lot of questions. While I am trained to be Santa, Andrea Claus will be preparing to become the leader of my new world relations team. Celia narrowed her eyes at the paper. I nudged her. With the help from Maria Duende, Andrea whipped out a sign that said, Breaking news, Santa Pixie is the greatest. The crowd, even Maria Duende, clapped and cheered. For the same reason, more people from the outside world will be trying to find us and visit the North Pole. This could be an amazing opportunity, but it could also put us to danger. That's why Buzz Brownie and Carl Kobold will take charge of the secret helpers and form our new North Pole defense team. Buzz stepped forward and flexed with Carl, standing on his bicep, posing. Two secret helpers he had brought him, brought with him crouched on either side and made finger guns to complete the picture. The crowd laughed. As some of you know, Bertrand Claus has finally replicated one of Kris Kringle's original inventions. Because of his breakthrough, and because of Krampus Claus's unique knowledge and experience with the Quantum Kringle and Kris Kringle himself, the two of them will now work together to head our research and development team. Bertrand twirled his bow tie, and little fireworks flew from it and into the air, spelling out, Let's do some science. Krampus did some lazy jazz hands. Kurt and Sally will become head of the workshop. Kurt will help us make a plan to keep older kids and teenagers interested in Christmas, and Sally will have final say before me on all toy-related matters. Sally waved with a few fingers, and then used those same fingers to flip the page in her book. Kurt did a riff on an air guitar, but real noise blasted out over the crowd. I was surprised enough that I jumped, which the crowd saw and laughed. Gadzooks will remain in charge of birds, and will continue to help us understand the things that science can't explain. Gadzooks threw her top out top hat out over the crowd and Dove streamed out of it, dropping a piece of candy to everyone in the audience who didn't cheer because it was butterscotch and butterscotch is so good that they all ate theirs immediately. We also have a friend in charge of finance and espionage, but it seems like he might not have been able to make it out today. I'm here! The boy in the beige sweater waved from the far end of the balcony, and I've been thinking of calling my job Spinance. I still don't know who he is, I thought, or how he got here without him noticing him. But that is a very good pun. I really appreciate the opportunity, he continued. You guys are really just the best friends I could ask for. Alright, enough of this, Krampus grumbled. Kid, what is your name? The boy in the beige sweater blinked. Uh, it's... Uh... He grinned and shrugged. I guess I've forgotten. Whoops! Oh my actual gosh. Finally, Celia continued, Ollie Gnome will be my second Santa and will be in charge of the council made up of all those people to advise me in the decisions I make going forwards. She grinned at me and I jumped up and down and waved at the crowd. He will make sure we always keep the spirit of Christmas in our hearts and minds while we make our decisions. Celia pulled me up to the stairs of the podium so we could say the last part together. We have a wish. We wish for a new Christmas. A better Christmas. I hope all of you will support us in making it come true. Celia and I pulled goggles out of our pockets and popped them on. Now if you'll excuse us. Right on cue, Crasher led our team of reindeer in pulling our brand new build for everybody's sleigh up in front of the balcony. Celia and I jumped on together, and then the rest of our friends jumped on us. Even Santa jumped in. Celia checked and clicked some buttons. How's the engine, Matrand? Engine's good! Quantum Kringle installed and ready for action. You ready, little nine? Crasher snorted. 
Ready as I'll ever be, Captain. Krampus, you put in the coordinates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He rolled his eyes. Let's get this over with. Wait. Let me get the cameras ready. I turned on a handheld camera and pointed it down as the crowd as we adjusted and flew over them. We waved and they waved back. Okay, it's ready. We'll be right back, guys, I yelled. We need some tunes, Kurt exclaimed. He clicked his music box and put on something exciting with a good build. You want to do the thing? Santa asked us. Asked us. Celia and I looked at him. The thing? Yeah, you know, he winked. The thing. We can? You can. Celia and I cleared our throats. On Crasher, on Rocker, on Slammer and Jammer, on Snoozer, on Truther, on Treason and Season. And Stargazer, Stargazer yelled. I wasn't going to miss this one. Then, over the rush of the engine, the crowd and their roar, even Krampus himself couldn't manage to snore. They all heard us exclaim, with a grin on our face, Merry Christmas to all, now we're going to space.